Block 1 Zephyr Road in Audiobook Presence Audiobook Title Resume of a Reincarnated Girl Ch. 49-145 by Karasawa Kazuki Note This channel is for fan of a web novel or light novels reader. Also that we could support the also we could support the author, artist, translator, editor and publisher so that they can provide us more of these awesome stories, so let's help them. Join my discord, link below. Also visit my other YouTube channel share, like and subscribe. Prologue, school entrance ceremony grumblings of a certain teacher, previous, chapter list, next. Tensai Shu Ono Ryrikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com Author Notes It is no longer a first-person perspective from the protagonist so please be careful. Even if you skim through this, I believe it would not be too much of a trouble. Speaking of which, it would be great if I could submit the first chapter for the volume. I will be in your care. I have been a teacher at the Royal Castell School for seven years now. Today is the freshman school entrance ceremony but this year again, there were very few mage freshmen. Year by year, the number of mages have gradually thinned down. I wonder how many people are there who feel a sense of crisis because of this. If we let the situation be, this society which relies on magic would probably collapse. Nevertheless, not only did the king not enact any special policy to prevent this collapse, even now, the king handles his governmental affairs in the same way. It is not that the current king is incompetent, I suppose he is simply just afraid that he would, with his very own hands, destroy the social order that kept its tranquility for over hundreds of years by the same system. Dreading the very thought of destroying the values that are still being taught today, the king is unable to deem it an option to destroy these values. Now that I think of it, the previous king's sense of crisis was greater than others. Still, he was an idiot. He thought that if the problem was that there were few mages, all he had to do was to have more children. He went ahead to keep many concubines, and without much thought, left many seeds behind. Still, in the end, only four of them had the ability to become mages. Just for four mages, he had many children without an aptitude for magic and who were also part of royalty. Furthermore, the previous king who lacked forethought made most of his children marry into influential aristocrats. Therefore, there were many aristocratic children now who were fellow cousins, nephews, niece, uncle and aunties to the king. This generation's children would likely dispute over their marriage relationships. Marriage between cousins is acceptable but marriage between kin with close blood relationships would basically be frowned upon silently. Freshman representative, Katharina Guinassus, step forward. The principal who also holds the chairmanship, Baldinger, called out the name of the student representative to give a speech. She shifted her focus onto the principal and likewise, the principal glued her hopeful eyes on Katharina. Katharina Guinassus. The daughter of Guinassus Earl, the prince's son was among the freshmen of this year and it would have been a sounder choice to have picked him as the representative to give the speech. The Guinassus domain was a neighboring land separated from this country by mountains and demonic forests. It was an affluent land which had a port where trading can be safely conducted, unlike the other territories which face difficulties due to the declining number of mages. The Guinassus domain were able to decrease their reliance on magic while maintaining an abundance of resources so it was not a big blow to them. In recent times, their strength has grown significantly. In this case, it would have been better to pick a royal mage from the family which has been conferred the title of prince, but there was barely any aristocrat who dared resist the Guinassus Earl. Originally, comparing just their peerage ranks, the title of prince was higher, but the Earl which controls territory was stronger in terms of power relations, not to mention that the Guinassus family were a special lot too. Miss Katharina who was the center of attention of the other aristocrats stepped up on the stage upon being called. She enrolled as a mage. From managing his territory peacefully to having a mage successor, it can be said that the Guinassus Earl has nothing to fret about. As the freshman representative, Miss Katharina started to recite from memory, about the joys and aspirations of being a freshman. Silver hair in a vertical winding hairstyle, 
golden eyes, strong willed eyes with large brows pointing upwards. Tn, check out the table of contents for a picture that contains her. During the speech, she widened her smile on her pretty face, while looking down at the other students with a trace of ridicule. Though that may all just be my imagination. A stereotypical example of a mage, no rather, the epitome of an aristocrat. Looking down on people who cannot use magic, looking down on all things that are inferior to herself. That must have been how she had lived her life. This is a common thing for other aristocrats and mages. In her case, she is in fact stronger than these others and since others are mostly beneath her, she became hard to deal with. Looking at the principal and chairperson Baldinger who incidentally has graying hair, it was patently clear that he was disappointed. Principal Baldinger is the third prince of the previous king. However, because he was not a mage, at age 15, his name was removed from the royal family register and he became known as Baldinger the Merchant Earl. He was tasked with managing the school but, since everything to do with education is under the jurisdiction of the king, he was simply a nominal supervisor. Nevertheless, he was a man with a nimble head so somehow, he is in a quiet struggle to dispossess rights regarding management of the school from the king. It seems that he wants to reform the structure of the school, which has mages at its center and in doing so, spur society to change as well. From the foolish looking smile he makes every day, you will not be to tell that he is such an ambitious man. At the very least, if the principal was part of the talented mages that lived with the king or someone else with the same ability as the principal was with the current king. Perhaps this society could be preserved slightly longer. I wonder if the principal is expecting anything from Miss Katharina who is now presenting her speech. Without a doubt, he must have been scheming to obtain a young power with authority, so that he could make a personal request to the king and if luck is on his side, he might able to gain the full rights to manage the school. However, seeing that it was evident that she had been already tainted by the colors of aristocracy, her shoulders drooped. To the very end, the problematic Miss Katharina did not let go of her haughty smile as she ended her address. She went down the stage glamorously. As Miss Katharina returned to her seat, the principal also managed to recover herself to call out the name of the next student representative. It was compulsory for majors to be enrolled, so they did not do written tests, but for the other students, they absolutely must pass their entrance examinations to enter the school. The entrance exam was an ordinary written exam on refinement and culture. The second student to be called was a non-mage student and was the top scorer in the entrance exams. Continuing, from the category of normal entrance examinations, freshman representative, New Ruby Fallen, step forward. Among the freshmen, a commotion ensued. Your Ruby Fallen became rather famous prior to the school entrance ceremony. She was from the cursed, magic forsaken land of Ruby Fallen, which for some reason or another did not produce any mages. There was a rumor spreading that there was this mysterious girl who appeared from nowhere and had an unknown background, yet she was adopted. Sometimes, a non aristocratic parent might give birth to a mage, and in that scenario, it is common for the territorial lord to adopt that mage but for a non-mage to have be specially adopted, and to add on, to have her take the school examinations too. All these were anomalies. The school entrance written examinations were generally difficult for someone who has not been learning properly from young and so, even for this year, there were probably many aristocratic children who failed even though they had started their education from young. The school is managed with the funds from the national budget. Hence, the tuition fees and examinations fees were all free but there were expenses to be spent and effort put in in the journey to reach the capital and living in the capital before the announcement of the results. Add in the possibility of failing and you have the considerations one should make before taking the examination. It was normal for children who show no promise to not take the examinations at all. And yet, a horsebone of a child came from nowhere to challenge the examinations. Furthermore, she became the top scorer. Tn. Japanese idiom to describe a person with doubtful origin in a derogatory manner from the start. The land of Ruby Fallen was subject to numerous controversies but I hear that the surrounding aristocrats have become quite sensitive to the puzzling actions that have taken place this time. Paying no heed to the din the students were making, she went up on stage after her name, 
New Ruby Fallen was called Dot she greeted everyone with simplicity and smiled with an odd sense of composure one would not expect from a ten-year-old child. Like Miss Katharina, she started talking about the hopes and delights of entering school. Her strong yellowish blonde hair went all the way down to her chest area and the tips of her hair curled around. She had a small nose thin lips and strong eyes with hazel-colored pupils. I could see that she has the characteristics of a new Zui face but all I could focus on was her erect back and the way her chin draws back in perfect balance to the raised corners of her mouth, completed with her every movement in refinement. Breathtaking, tn, yu Zui means thin, yu Zui face is used to refer to a person with facial features lacking in definition. Meanings of Yu Zui face can vary depending on the person. It could be having a small nose, single eyelid or having white skin, etc. Despite being the mysterious freshman and the buzz topic for everyone, that aura of hers was dot dot most students entering through normal entrance examinations have little self-esteem. That can be understood from how they grew up being compared to mages by their family and relatives dot in general. The normal students hold some psychological entanglements with regards to mages, and most would be bound by this entanglement becoming submissive to mages. Also, there are students who isolate themselves in their own shells. However, the non-mage girl who was standing on stage now emitted no such self-deprecation or any sort of gloomy emotion. Yuruby Fallen finished her speech and descended from the stage. When she was going up on stage, the students were still talking among themselves but now, it became still as death. The students could sense it too, that she was releasing a strange aura. And then, I started to weigh my thoughts about her, on whether I should welcome her or be vigilant against her. Opening speech by our present student's representative, third year student, Henry Castagas Fomtel, stepped forward. After the principal called out his name, the auditorium started a big ruckus than earlier. White skin, light blonde hair, and pale purple eyes. His straight hair went down all the way under his chest, typical of a mage. A young nobleman who has inherited the good looks and features of the royalty. He was studying in this school and is the most famous student. Also, he was the son of the previous king, in other words, little brother from another mother, and was a stellar mage. The current king has unfortunately been unable to have a child with the capabilities to be a mage. For that reason, it is said that Henry would be the king in the next term. His superb ability to handle magic was rarely seen in the present age. In addition, he has no flaws and his conduct could not be criticized whatsoever. He does not hold any contempt for people who cannot use magic and has a gentle nature. Thus, he was the student that Principal Borujinia had the greatest expectations for. That was why the fourth and fifth year students were ignored in the selection for a representative to do this address. Principal Borujinia was pinning his hopes in the possibility that he holds doubt about the current magic supremacy ideology and governance, and might be able to rouse the king to bring change. He has that kind of influencing power. Furthermore, if he were unable to persuade the king, he was a man that was a candidate for the king in the next term too. No points lost for winning him over. Yet, as of present, it has not been going as smoothly as the principal had calculated, and to this day, not only has he not gained his approval, he has not been able to actively engage in intricate discussions with him. It seems. I suppose the reason for this is that there were many people who wished to become closer to him to use him. He was being vigilant. Moreover, if he appealed to him directly, there was a chance that Prince Henry might be opposed to his ideas and he could be dismissed from the role of principal because of that. Besides, to keep a close watch on the happenings at school, the king has placed a mage, who is under his close influence, as the vice principal. It was not that the king has any suspicion on the principal, it was purely just that the current king, or more like, the kings up to now fundamentally do not trust anyone except for mages, even if it was a brother from a different mother as long as they were not mages. They found no worth in putting any faith in them. Anyways, from the very start, Principal Borujinia did not consider forcibly convincing Prince Henry. He thinks from the point of view of an educator. Therefore, he prefers that Prince Henry realize for himself through his time at school. And he placed his hopes that the capable prince would be able to gain this insight himself. And for me, 
I am a teacher who can only cling on to that the very same hope. That is because I am the only man in this society from now on who harbors such fears. Taking no notice of both the principal and my expecting gaze, the prince, who was adept at magic, finished his speech and stepped down from the stage with an unperturbed expression. Freshman Arc 1 Heart Pumping School Entrance Ceremony, Previous, Chapter List, Next, Tensaishu Ono Ryarikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com Giving a speech is tiring, my shoulders stiffened from all the tension. Furthermore, the venue was somewhat like a concert hall so I got excessively nervous. I had been worried that my voice will not be loud enough for this larger place but it seems like the wind spirits sand did a good job and made my voice get through. Wind spirits are really handy. Also, it felt like the all important speech went down successfully. Much satisfied. Several days ago, I had been with Kuoka Arsen, spending time to discover the best angle to bring out my maximum beauty. It was worth the time. Thank you, Kuoka Arsen. Thanks to you, my debut as a student was a huge success. Supposed to be. My uniform was sufficiently cute too. Rather than calling it a uniform, it was just a normal fashion attire to me. Indigo blue sleeved long dress. The collar was white and there was a silk ribbon under my chest area. For the aristocrats in this world, wearing silk or wool clothes is their fundamentals, so this uniform was without exception, made with expensive materials. These clothes would fetch a very good price, and yet, each time a student promotes an academic level, they are given three attires for free, as one would expect from the generosity of the royal school. Male students wore a white shirt navy blue vest and pants, they have a jacket too but it seems that instead, the grey robe is worn by the majority of the people, many prefer to put on clothes that give off the appearance of a mage, it must be because the school was meant for mages I guess. Tools are needed when certain magic is used, hence, mages typically wear robes that have many pockets to store various things. As for the female uniform, the long skirt has several pockets. A fair bit of things can be placed inside too. Thus, even if the girls did not wear the robe, it would probably be fine. And most importantly, the robe was uncool so the ladies couldn't bear it. Even after the end of the school entrance ceremony, there was an orientation to get us freshmen accustomed to the school so we could not leave the auditorium yet. We are now taking a small break. The first half of the orientation would be on explaining about the library. I pretended to be listening elegantly but I could not contain the excitement in my heart. In this country, the library can only be found in the capital's campus. It was the only library in this country. The library was a place where only students and aristocrats can enter. In order to emphasize its value, the library was built on ground that had an elevation of 50 meters. And, not far from the library was the castle where the king lived. It was a building that was built on land another extra 100 meters higher. Incidentally, the ground elevation of the capital was naturally about 50 meters higher. In this world, the greatness and awesomeness of one could be expressed through height. Since I was a student, I can enter such an awesome library. To enter school, I had studied, but the contents of my study materials were, how shall I put it, all of it was fishy, especially on things related to history. They were beyond the levels of dubious. Still, if I could visit the library, I am looking forward to learning more things in greater detail. Absent mindedly, I looked around the surroundings and realized that the ladies and gentlemen freshmen have already made their own cliques. Likely they were fellow acquaintances from the same hometown. Unfortunately, I came to the capital separately from the other children who hail from Ruby Fallen. Thus, I essentially recognize nobody. For starters, we were supposed to make a quick provincial tour around the agricultural lands, finish up the proceedings to be adopted under a territorial lord, and begin heading towards the capital while studying at relaxed pace. However, thanks to the Tigasaku cult, our plans were substantially derailed. Tigasaku the missionary went around announcing during our farmland tour, the divine messenger has arrived. Besides providing support for their agricultural activities, he went on to give speeches to the farmers, I told him countless of times that, stop, 
I am not a messenger from the heavens. I am the same as everyone, a human. My repeated insistence on this was misunderstood as, oh, kind words from Usama. Usama is claiming that she is the same as us humans. Just like how there are no differences between all things born in this world. Like that, he exposed me to the world like a criminal. Anything I say would transform into kind words and so, I gave up trying to stop him and waited for the end of his speech which carried a mood that had a crucifix stuck to it. O oh, untainted peasants, I pray eternally that you do not get conned by the Tagasaka cult. With all his speeches, our journey to the capital was delayed and we could not synchronize our departure timing with the other children. This being my very first school life in this life, it was a somewhat dispiriting scenario. That's cause I want to make some friends, if possible, girls too. When I was with Alec Boss and the gang, I often hear them talking about their time as students. Stories such as when Boss and friends were peeping at the girls' washroom and Bashu San messed up angering their teacher or when Gay Isan attempted to train his muscles by removing his chair and doing squats on an air chair while trembling throughout the day's lessons. Somehow, hearing them reminiscing together about their times together, I get extremely envious of them. I too want to have friends like that whom I can talk together with about the old times. Still, there should be freshmen who have gotten drunk in love with my splendid speech earlier. They should be gathering by my side during the short break. I just need to maintain my graceful smile while waiting on my seat. It should be an easy job. While hiding my restlessness, I waited at my seat and for some reason, I could hear footsteps rushing in my direction. They finally came, huh? I stayed alert with a posed look. You. Eh? Not a girl's voice? He is. Dot dot oh. Isn't this Alan Sama? Long time no see I stood up instinctively. Alan has grown taller. Since we are already on this topic, I will let you know that my height has not changed much but I feel that I have become more adult-like compared to last time. His black hair was at the length of a bobbed hair cut originally but now, it has grown to his shoulders and was tied together as one ponytail. Nostalgic pea green pupils. I start to remember Kane Bout Charmer, Irene San and Claude San. I smiled and called out Alan's name. For some reason, he stopped on the spot and he became dazed. The next moment, his face became stern looking. You dot dot why sending us just that letter? You, seriously? Why? Alan glared at me while shouting loudly. His face was flushed red, and he looked like he was about to cry. A. Hey, are you going to cry? Why? Are you angry? I had thought we might be making a very touching embrace and had stiffened my outstretched arms for a second. Dot, calm down, Mr. Allen. Whoa, whoa. Dot, I had mentioned in the letter, didn't I? Didn't I send a letter addressed to Irene San when I became an adopted daughter of Ruby Fallen? I became apologetic that they might be worrying and searching for me, so I decided to write to them about my survival, that I had been adopted by Ruby Fallen, and to inform that I am going to school. Was my letter so clumsily written I wonder dot dot compared to writing anything at all, and forming them was better choice though dot hey. Mr. Allen's abrupt shouts are attracting the scrutinizing stares from the other freshmen nearby. Alan Sama, please, calm down. Let's go somewhere else. I grabbed Alan's sleeve without waiting for his reaction and brought him out of the auditorium turning right at the corner and moving to a place under the shadow of a pillar where it seems that nobody would walk by. Alan Sama, um dot dot have you calmed down? I said and peered into his eyes. Unlike before, he looked like he was in bewilderment, and his eyes opened wide in surprise. Still, he looked like he was about to cry. The letter I wrote dot dot did I do something disrespectful? If it was disrespectful on my part. I sincerely apologize. No dot dot that's not it. Despite his face being flushed with anger earlier, he was now looking down and making a showbon face dot what is going on, Mr. Allen dot aren't you being too emotionally unstable? However, a nostalgic angel's voice descended upon the confused me. You, Allen. See Kane Sama. Showing himself at the most critical juncture, the followist Kane Sama. Impressive. His follow technique remains unchanged after all these years. In fact, considering his timing earlier, dot dot he has improved further. Kane Sama Center smiled in my direction and opened his arms while calling me 
knew. I jumped into his chest and gave him a reunion hug. He has grown amazingly taller. I fit snugly into K Nanai's armor's chest. He had muscles in that area, and the area which I buried my head into was firm. His reddish brown hair has gotten shorter and his childishness has faded away. He has become a somewhat masculine young man. Mew, you have grown and become increasingly beautiful at that. Ah, I'm glad you are safe. Thankfully, I have worried you. Kane Sama has not changed. No, it seems like you have grown to be more and more like a man. I am very glad to have met you again. Huh? That thing on your wrist. Is it the ornament that I made for you last time? Kane Sama looked at the good luck bracelet that was on my wrist and was delighted. It was the good luck bracelet that I had received from Kane Sama before I departed from the rainforest mansion. To prevent it from getting damaged, I had conscientiously taken care of it, but either way, I had been living in the mountains, so it was damaged to some extent, and right now, it would not be strange for it to break any time soon. Yes, I intended to take good care of it, but it has torn slightly. It is all right, it is something that can be broken any time anyway. This time, when I return home, I will make another one for you. Kane Sama revealed his sparkling white teeth while saying dot as expected of an Ikeman. He has dazzling white teeth. While having these impressions, Alan became more and more Shobon. Omega comma as Kane Sama and I were embracing one another. Dot ah, crap. Is he worried that his Anachan will be taken away? Kane Sama noticed my concerned glance at Alan and broke our embrace. He opened his arms to Alan instead. Alan too, congratulations on entering the school. Yep, with a nod. Alan gave his brother a light hug with a dampened spirit. D don't be so demoralized. My fault, sorry for hugging Anasama first. Alan, have you cooled down? Haven't you got something to say to you? Have you said it properly? Kane Sama told his little brother with a sweet looking gaze. Alan reacted with a sudden moment of realization and faced me with trepidation. A, why are you looking at me with those eyes? A face like how a small animal would make when facing its predator. I won't bite though. Mew, earlier, I was in the wrong for that outburst. I had been lost in thoughts, and was in a disarray. I was astonished at Alan's apology and responded to him by telling him it was okay. Once again, Alan started to look down in demoralization. And, after hesitating for a short moment, Alan opened his mouth again. Also, sorry, I could not help you then. Seriously, I wanted to apologize at the start. I could not help because I was powerless. You must have had a hard time alone, yet I could not do anything. I might have caused you to be helpless then. I have always wanted to apologize for that. My body stiffened on hearing Alan repentance, or more like confession. That is. How should I put it? You have been worried for me, right? Question mark standing in front of me was Alan who looked gloomy. Was he angry at me because he was so worried? To think that he had been so worried for me. And I had a choice to go back to Alan and the other members of the rainforest too. The option I had chosen for myself was not to go back. The path which I had picked. It isn't so that I have regrets for it now, but, I had forgotten that I would cause others to feel sad for me. It was just that I thought I was just a passing memory to Alan and the others, that was how I imagined it, perhaps, I was under that kind of impression. Nonetheless, I am sorry Alan, the one that should be sorry is me. It is I who should feel that way. Sorry. I have made you worried, it is all fine now. I said and awkwardly opened my arms and gave Alan a hug. I could feel that Alan was crying. He was sniffling. I am really sorry, Alan. I'm glad. I was a helper for the entrance ceremony and was at the auditorium when I heard from Henry Sama that my little brother had raised his voice, so I rushed out and it worth the effort. I must return soon. The explanation session would begin shortly, so you two return to the auditorium too. He nodded with satisfaction seeing as we have reconciled. Alan and I broke off our embrace and we sent Kane Sama off. I glanced at Alan who was next to me, and it looked like he had stopped crying but for some reason, he looked as though his spirit was broken. Alan Sama, shall we head back to the auditorium? 
to the dispirited Alan. I did not know what I should be saying to him and it was indeed true that our recess was ending so I had suggested that we return to the auditorium. I turned at the curve and was about to enter the auditorium when I felt that Alan was not following me from behind. I turned back to look. There were no signs of Alan appearing from the corner. To check on Alan, I went back to the corner and heard someone sobbing. I paused myself before the turn, if only I could be like Kane and Izama. I had shouted at you despite not having any such intentions. And I was planning to apologize first and then tell her that I would protect her and that she'd be relieved too. I am the worst. Why am I so uncool? I want to grow up faster. Alan was talking to himself. He must be unconsciously muttering to himself since he said so in a very soft voice. In that instant, I wanted to say something, but I realized that those must be words that he did not want anyone to hear, so I acted as though I heard nothing and went back quietly to the auditorium. TSRV 2C2 Freshman Arc 2 Stalking Boy Alan. MCP Alert. Hope you all enjoy this chapter. Smile also. Thank you Tracy for donating again. Previous. Chapter list. Next. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisha was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com The school entrance ceremony and orientation ended without a hitch and the next day's lessons began. The very first lesson was magic history lesson. It appears that magic history lesson would be conducted every day for one period. Every day, for that one period, from the first years to the fifth years, almost everyone will be gathered at the auditorium to take the magic history lesson. Incidentally, there are no fixed seating arrangements so everyone is free to pick their own seats. After the end of this lesson, Year 3s and above would attend their own subject lessons so they would move separately to their own classrooms. For now, the magic history lesson was, rather than an actual history lesson of this country, was more about learning the greatness of the current great mages. Simply put, it was lesson where mages would be patting themselves on the back, calling one another, Suki E. -E. It gave me the creeps. Various thoughts flitted through my head, but for now, I need to use the toilet. The lesson is about to begin, so I need to hurry. I stood up and Alan, who had set up encampment beside me, Turn to look at me. Where are you going? I am going to pick flowers. I chuckled as I gave my response in a ladylike manner but it did not seem to get through to Alan. Why are you going to pick flowers at this time? Lessons are starting soon. He replied with a serious look. The washroom. I am going to the washroom. That was definitely unacceptable for a lady I thought as I replied with indignation but Alan did not notice one bit and nodded. Ah. I got it. For some reason, he stood up too. Dot, and while I walked off, Alan followed me too. Dot, t this guy is following me. As expected, he did not follow me all the way inside the female's toilet but after I took care of my business, wiped my hands with a handkerchief and came out of the toilet, Alan suddenly appeared and declared proudly, good, let's go back. He was waiting nearby? No way. This kid is terrifying. Since our reunion at the school entrance ceremony, Alan has been concerned for me beyond the point of necessity. Even this morning, when I was leaving the dormitory for school, Alan was waiting outside with linked arms. I have no idea when he came but as though it was natural for me to appear from the dorm, he said, let's go, and it became such that we went to the auditorium together. It was the front of the girls' dormitory, so it was natural that the percentage of girls was high. I could feel all their painful stares. Oh no, oh no. Could he be her boyfriend, such a cute couple, you fufu. -fu. The warm stares from the upperclassmen and Nisama hinted at that dot after following me to the auditorium, Alan did not leave me alone, not even for one second dot we were allowed to freely to choose our seats but Alan called out to me as though it was normal. Let's sit over here and we sat next to one another. It was true that I have not made any friends and that sitting together made me happy but somehow, the gaze from Alan was painful. It could be said that he was monitoring me or guarding me or something. In addition, there was that incident during the school entrance ceremony, and I could not grasp the sense of distance between us. Alan's was looking at me as though I was a frightened little animal. And now, the current Mr. Alan was waiting for me before the girl's toilet. 
A. Alan Sama, it is okay not to follow me at times like this. I timidly told Alan but he did not seem to be have a listening ear and pompously replied, Mu is in a dangerous position so there is no helping about that. Let's go back quickly. Alan started to walk off. Is there actually any danger in going to the toilet? Don't tell me that there is something like a toilet hanger Kosan monster in this world, an anecdote that was about a cute child being brought into another world. Still, the real problem is not Hangako San but the current Alan San, who was scarier. Later, we had lunch together as I continued to be frightened by Alan Sama who has been acting weird. Thankfully, Kane Sama came for lunch too and I was saved by the somewhat soothing of the atmosphere. After getting involved in this and that, the fourth period lesson ended. Only the first and second year mages have to attend their magic lesson on the fifth period. Therefore, from the fifth period onwards, Mr. Allen who was a mage had to go separate ways with me. Allen stood up to prepare to move but before that, he took fleeting glances at me while having a half-baked expression on him. Do not worry, Alan boy, I am fine. So please go for your lessons quickly. That was what I told him with my eyes. Nevertheless, it did not get through. Mew, I need to go but are you fine being alone? He asked to confirm it. Yes, I am totally fine. In fact, I am more worried for you. I am alright. Rather than that, Alan. You need to go now or you will be late. Please hurry. I said as I pushed him on his back, half trying to drive him out. Alan looked back and told me with a solemn expression. Well then, you can rest a shot as soon as the lesson end. I will come back. So please wait here. After the fifth period ends, I would be going back to my dorm though. Also, I have plans too. Today, I was going to leave the campus and have a meal with Ku Oka Arsen. Ah. I have plans after school so I can't do that, I will be returning to the girls dorm now. I replied and pushed Alan into the mage crowd. I immediately dashed back to my seat and covered my head. No way, what should I do, Alan is too scary. Besides Alan acting all weird, school life went on peacefully. It was my first time living in a dormitory but my preparations for a new life was perfect and the moving was smooth. Well. That was because I hardly have any luggage. I lived alone in a room that had a size of eight tummy mats. The room mainly had a desk and a bed. The toilet and shower room were communal. For food, there was a cafeteria in the campus, so eating can be done there. Also, there were people who chose to eat outside the campus after having obtained approval. For me, I often go outside to have dinner, though not daily, rather than calling it eating out. It was actually eating at Kuoka Arsen House who had moved into the capital. At first, I have been worried for Kuoka Arsen who went to look for a job in the capital. She marched into the capital, searching for an Okama bar but she could not find anything like it in the city. If she continued being unable to find an Okama bar, Kuoka Arsen would be left adrift in the streets. Those were my thoughts as I despaired but it appears that Kuoka Arsen had already decided to start a business in her own trade, a drug store. She had set up her store without problems successfully. And now, she is living in the capital in her home come working area. Hence, my days consisted of whenever lessons end and I obtain the exit permit, either commuting back and forth to Kuoka Arsen's place or not. That was how my one month went. But recently, the pursuer had been trying harder to get in my way. The pursuer I am talking about is Alan, a premier stalking boy he is. Alan was essentially, never more than a few steps away from me. No matter where I go, he would definitely follow. Excuse me. Following a lady like that? Aren't you just a stalker? I came down to that conclusion but because of me, I had worried him and I felt somewhat indebted. And due to that. I was unable to confront him about it for the month. Nevertheless, the fifth period was always a special class for mages hence. We were separated then, and I would usually return to the dorm after that, hence it was only up to the fourth period that the tailing spirit would follow me. Therefore, one way or another, I could leave the campus for now but recently, it feels like he had noticed me leaving the campus, and started to follow me more persistently. Today, after school. When I was about to visit Kuoka Arsen's place, and was right about to step out of the campus, at the front of the gate, a boy that looked like Alan came into sight. 
he was lying in wait with a dazzling stance. H huh? Has the magic lesson already ended? That's too early though. Was it because I had been delayed for too long while renewing the exit permit? Dot dot question mark secretly, in an attempt to evade detection, I tiptoed to the gate when, oi, knew. Someone called out to me. I who had been tiptoeing, immediately raised my back and turned round and beamed at Alan. Well, Alan Sama, how do you do? How was your day? Somehow, your smile looks rigid. You didn't try to ignore me after spotting me, right? To his sharp interrogation, I could only deny vehemently. Impossible, impossible, that is impossible, and laughed in a Lady Sama like manner, oh oh ho, oh, to get my way through. Then that is fine, but if you are going outside, I'm sure I told you before that I am going together with you today. You will let me go with you. Finally, it has come to this, huh? Alan's exit permit dangled from a string around his neck. His setup was flawless. There will not be anything awesome even if you follow me. It will only be boring for you. Because I'm just having a meal at the person from Ruby Fallen who is taking care of me. It's not like I am following you because it is interesting. It might be bright now but won't it become darker later when you are coming back? If Mew is alone, it will be dangerous. I am tagging along too. Coo, if you say it like that, then there is nothing I can retort with. No way I can flip the table on him when he is stalking as he was worried for me. It will be fine. Public safety in these parts is good and the person from Ruby Fallen would escort me back. Additionally, if I suddenly brought Alan Sama with me, that person would be shocked. I have been freeloading a Truby Fallen. I don't wish to further trouble them. If you feel so ashamed, why don't you come back to Rainforest? No, no, it is not that I feel ashamed. I am treated very kindly. As I said so and so, I started to think that I am already at my limits in trying to shake off Alan. Probably, if it was Ku Oka Arsene, she would not find a friend or two bothersome, and in fact, happily welcomed them. However, I would not like that. I did not want him to meet too often with Ku Oka Arsene. I mean, it is rare for me to have family time, and the way I act when I am with my family and when I am with my henchmen is somewhat different. Also, Ku Oka Arsene said that she would want to sample my boyfriends too. Alan is absolutely not my boyfriend, but despite appearances, he does have a fairly well-looking face. He is a child so for now. I believe that Ku Oka Arsene would not move her fingers on him but I still have to take precautions. Alan boy, I am thinking for you when I try to dissuade you from going with me. I wish I could voice that argument. Nevertheless, no matter how I convince him otherwise, I did not seem to be able to throw him off from his hot pursuit with a heavy, imposing stance. Whatever, I am going to. Alan boy said as he grabbed my right arm and walked out. Him, nothing more can be done. Guess I have to bring him to Ku Oka Arsene's place then. Dot dot if anything happens. Don't blame me. Don't look for me when you get eaten. TSRV 2C3. Freshman Arc 3 imagining that I would cry when I am left alone. Here we go again. Previous. Chapter list. Next. Tensai Shu Ono Rikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com Opening the door of the small drug store that Kuoka Asuna was running, I found her in the midst of serving a customer. So far as it goes, this is a service industry so Kuoka Asuna stopped her wiggling like how she always does and wore a white shirt with beige pants like clothes a man would wear. Her hair was tied to the back and her appearance was immaculate. In truth, when we entered the capital or when we were renting the room, there were people who took a visibly hostile attitude towards her and eat tone. I was tremendously indignant at their behavior towards Kuoka Arsene. In my fit of resentment, I wanted to carry out my revenge by secretly applying grease on those odious jerks but Kuoka Arsene found out midway and I had to give up on the revenge. Still, due to that, for her normal day-to-day -day life, Ku Oka Arsene hit her and he style the best she could. With that, the first impression of how she gives to others does not give away the fact that she is an Ani but sometimes she negligently reverts to her usual Ani tone. However, as a receptionist, she does not engage in that kind of conversation which would reveal that much thus, for the time being, 
she is doing fine. I gave a bow to the customer in the store and went into the inner room with Alan. Is this a drugstore? The person at the store is Wu's caretaker, is he your attendant? As soon as we entered the room, Alan Boy showered me with questions in succession. I was thinking in my mind, now, now, just wait because I am going to pour some tea now, so please, please wait. As I prepared the tea, I was thinking of how I should reply him. I have a feeling that explaining everything in detail would lead to many other dilemmas later so I am going with it lightly. And so, I presented the tea to Alan and the furrow on his brow which has been there for some time relaxed. It has been such a long time since I received tea poured by you. R. True, when I was a maid, I had been serving tea every day. Perhaps after reminiscing about the past, Alan had regained his spirit somewhat and looked happy. The Alan Bout charmer from that time was immensely sweet. Always calling me boss here and boss there, following me around like poop following a goldfish. Now, he has not changed much from being goldfish feces but, he has become a mere stalker. Ah, how appalling. W what? I have never called you as boss obviously, don't say that. Oh, it has been a long time since I've seen Alan's fury. Everything about his cheeky face is nostalgic. Ara, but isn't Alan my henchman? Wah, don't get too conceited, it was temporary. It was only temporary that I became a henchman. I was no longer a henchman soon after due to the problem of ability. What is that problem of ability anyways? What ability are you talking about? That's my first time hearing it. However, nothing much has changed since you are still following me from behind all the time. You are unable to change your disposition of being a henchman huh? Totally not. Right now, it is more like I am the boss while Wu is the henchman. Huh. Well, fine by me if the pretend play of boss henchman system no longer exists. But. I cannot accept overturning of the entire seniority relationship. I have been feeling guilty about making him worried so I have been keeping quiet for some time now. But, this much I cannot allow. In the first place, you have been worried for me so you have become a stalker dot dot in spite of being a henchman and being worried for your boss. You are ten years too early. Just as my emotions ran wild and I was about to let loose the pepper bombs that I had stocked in my skirt. The door to the room opened. New Chan, what's up? Are you with a friend today? Ku Oka asked and opened the door and asked. Ku Oka. Kusan, how's business? Let's see, business would die down soon, so I guess I would be closing even though it is still early. Additionally, Ryu brought back a friend for the first time too. Ku Oka asked and spoke while concealing her any tone. It was probably since I had unconsciously switched to calling her Kusan. Still, I had already explained to Alan that she was someone like an attendant and she also spoke like a man so I was somewhat relieved. Yes, he is. I believe I have mentioned before though, Alan Sama from the Rainforest Earl family. Pleased to meet you, I am Alan from the Rainforest Earl family. I am good friends with Miss Wu. Alan bowed excessively politely, his salutations were slightly stiff. Probably due to his lack of experience. His movements were clumsy too. You are an aristocrat so please be diligent and practice greeting others. Ku Oka asked and told him them it is okay not to humble himself that much and returned the greeting while smiling warmly. Nice to meet you, I am Kuki. I came to the capital from Ruby Fallen with you, please continue to take care of you from hereafter. Ku Oka asked and said in an eloquent male-like conduct. Thankfully, after seeing Alan, she did not suddenly grab him and eat him. Phew, maybe Alan couldn't qualify for the preliminaries. He was a kid after all. Mew, I would be preparing dinner from here on. It won't be anything impressive but it is okay for Alan Cunt to have dinner here. Ku Oka Arson suggested. Alan thanked him without reserve thus, Alan would be joining us for dinner. At times like this, one should appear hesitant and restrained, Mr. Alan. That is the way of the Japanese. Well, Alan wasn't a Japanese though. Um, I'll help too. I exclaimed and got off from my seat but Ku Oka Arson shook her head and stopped me. Since your friend is here today, it is fine. I am just about to be done anyways. She said, and headed towards the door. Alan, who was next to me, 
observed Ku Oka Asn as he went for the door while pressing his fingers on his chin. He doesn't seem like a bad person. He commented loftily and nodded. Who do you think you are? He is an extremely good person. He took great care of me so please refrain from using such disrespectful words. That'll depend on how he acts, yeah. Who are you to say that? Alan was certainly Alan. The nebulous tinge of the shitty brat feeling had been dearly missed. Like you know, a leopard cannot change its spots. When I reunited with Alan at the school entrance ceremony, Alan made a showbon Omega comma face out of the blue and looked like he was in the slumps. It seems like he was bothered by the fact that I had been abducted by the bandits and was worried for me. In my time with Boss and the rest, it was likely that Alan had imagined me to be a fragile girl, and the me without him by my side, was always alone and crying. That is why, when I am not by his side for even a moment, he becomes anxious and that connects with his stalking activities. With that kind of notion, my relationship with Alan has become somewhat awkward since our reunion. I had the weak of point of feeling guilty towards him and so, I totally could not treat him the same way as before. Still, right now, it feels like I have returned in time. Yes, my rationality is sound. Alan was indeed a healthy brat and I can stay relieved, as his position is that of my henchman. Though he had babbled some nonsense about him not being a henchman but rather, he being the boss. Hey, Alan Sama, why don't we have another duel right now? Just as how as it was like before dot dot the loser becomes the henchman. Eh? But, you're a girl aren't you dot dot not to mention that I have practicing my swordsmanship and I can use magic too. There is no way you can match up to me. Yearning for the old times, I made that proposal enthusiastically, yet this brat nonchalantly rejected it. What did you just say? Is your brain okay? That was the kind of feeling he gave off while rebuffing me. His eyes were telling me that there was no way that I'll be a match for him. Even though he was just Alan. How impudent. This one over here was raised in the mountains you know. Or more precisely, he was only treating me like a girl now and putting on airs that he was a gentleman who won't raise his hand on girls but hey, didn't you pick a fight with me when I was a little five-year-old girl? Damn, I cannot allow this. Honestly, I suggested this duel mainly just for the kicks but I feel that I cannot allow Alan to continue throwing his weight around. I have to show Alan his rightful henchman position. Ara, no way, could Alan Sama be afraid of losing to me? What are you saying? After finally meeting you dot dot like, somewhat, I could get good vibes but, it is definitely a no. With great dismay, Alan looked at me with his A's colored in shock. So, Sue, vexing, and what did he mean by good vibes? Say it clearly. R, oh no, not like that. I need to calm down. The other party is Alan. I need to compose myself. There should be countless of methods to cleverly get through this deadlock. You are just saying that because you are afraid aren't you? I can understand. Since you were defeated with a swift attack, when I was five. After losing, you were on the cusp of breaking into tears too. I was totally and not crying. Nice. He had taken the bait. Easy. Now just one more push. Ara, is that so? But from the impression I got from my memory, Alan was always a wimpy boy that was half crying. There is no way that is true. What is wrong with me in your memory? That being so, with a duel, please do show me a strong Alan Sama. If you have truly gotten strong enough to beat me, I would even be your henchman too. That said, Alan was taken slightly aback and muttered to himself, henchman. He casted his eyes down for a moment and then, shifted his eyes to meet mine. Hey, if you became my henchman, wouldn't you promise never to go outside when I am not around? Alan asked seriously. Oh, oh, from the orders he would give me if I become a henchman was, kind of like, it can be seen that he is a very restrictive guy. The future of Alan Boy was exceedingly worrying. I am greatly apologetic if the reason that he ended being so restrictive was because he had been traumatized due to the bandits abducting me. That's so. Isn't it dot dot I may not fulfill that promise, but I will try to the best of my abilities. I replied vaguely, and it appeared to not be a problem as Alan linked his arms and nodded as he appeared to be in thought, and now I shall pass this gravely decision.
That was how he gestured. Next, he opened his mouth. All right. I got it. This duel I accept. Okie dokie. Fufu. How nostalgic. The venue and time would be decided by me so I shall let you know some time later. I plan on using the courtyard of the campus. Is that acceptable? I grinned and made the final confirmation with him. Alan proudly acknowledged it by saying that it does not matter. All right, looks like I will be busy making the preparations soon. I feel bad for Alan but I will show no mercy. It would be good if I could convey that I'll be fine even without you worrying for me. I think I'll have to crush the very concept of you would cry when she is left alone that has been lingering in Alan's mind. TSRV2C4, Freshman Arc 4 Oh yeah, I don't have any female friends. Sorry for getting this out late. My motivation kinda wore thin after chugging through work in the day. Could hardly push myself to work on this when I came back at night. Lost quite a bit of momentum on translating and I think it will take some time for me to get back to my previous speed. Previous. Chapter list. Next. Tensai Shu Ono Ryrikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com You, I heard? That you are dueling with Alan this time? Kane Sama wore a concerned expression while asking me. This happened when the entire school cohort was present at the auditorium, before the magic history lesson started. The normal Kane Sama would usually be with Henry Sama and it was rare for him to come find me. Henry Sama was the upperclassman representative who did a speech at the school entrance ceremony. Henry Sama was the gentleman acting with glittery nobility when he gave his speech during the entrance ceremony as the representative for the upperclassmen. Even though he might be a handsome guy from royalty and was a mage, he committed the crime of overshadowing my beautiful speech, and so, he rubs me in the wrong way. The same handsome Kane Sama was often seen together with Henry Sama showing that they were close friends. They became eye candy for the girls around them. That was the same Kane Sama who came to find me regarding the duel. Kane Sama, how do you do? Yes, as you say, Alan and I are going to have a duel. We have not decided on the day but could you as like before, be our judge please? Kane Sama seemed to brood over my request. Mew, it's best not to do it. Alan has since, trained his body diligently, and polished his magic skills. You will only get yourself injured. He spoke with worry and sat on the seat to my left calmly. As per usual, Alan had set up camp on my right. Towards Kane Sama's arrival, Alan flinched slightly and opened his mouth. See, Kane and Izama, I am not going to injure her at all. Oh, so you are actually afraid of getting me injured? How kind of you, boy. Sorry but I did not plan to show any mercy so please do not hold a grudge. See, from what Alan said, I would be fine. I missed those times and wanted to just have some fun, please do not treat it as a big deal. I sent a perfect smile to Kane Sama. Kane Sama tilted his head slightly in frustration, but in the end, he gave his approval. I got it. Alan, you is a girl so please do not hurt her, I shall also accept being the judge. In fact, I hope that you two do not duel without my presence, remember to call me before dueling. Kane Sama softly reminded us while agreeing to be our judge. As I have mentioned, I have not fixed a day for the duel and so, I avoided revealing the exact date. For a definite win, I have to make elaborate preparations and the environment has to carefully considered as well. Dash the preparations for the duel went smoothly. All that was left is to wait for the right opportunity. As ever, just like goldfish's feces, or should I say, Proudly as goldfish's feces, Mr. Allen followed me everywhere. As I made him wait for me, I realized that there was one big problem. My first objective, the make female friends plan has not inched forward one bit at all. It has already been a month and I expected to have a swarm of friends by now. Why? I ransacked my mind for the possible reasons and the only imaginable candidate was Allen. I was always accompanied by my child and there were no opportunities for others to talk to me I suppose. However, as much as I hate to admit it, Alan had shrewdly found himself a male friend, a spirit user, Ritzkun. Even now, Ritzkun was seating next to Alan, a sweet looking boy with bright brown trimmed hair. 
During the magic lesson for mages in the fifth period, the rest of the regular students would attend a lesson to learn the greatness of the mages who have been cordial towards non-mages, and so, Alan and I went our separate ways. During that magic lesson, the cheeky Alan managed to get himself a friend. Compared to me who have been hankering for a friend to this extent, Alan managed to beat me to it despite being a stalker. I wonder if it is because of something I lack, even though I possess such elegance. The first period's lesson ended and the only people left in the auditorium were the first years. I looked around gently but what I got were just the, shit, our eyes met. Reaction from the other students. What is it? What is with everyone? There isn't a myth that says that staring at my eyes would cause them to turn into stone, right? Like, I wish this was just my hallucination but, were the other students really vigilant against me? Or in other words, I could feel fear in their eyes, but I don't remember doing anything that warrants that kind of reaction. Could it be that I am too beautiful? Indeed. I devoted myself to improving my image with Kuoka Arsene's guidance but even for my hair. It was just norm oil that gave it some gloss though. I didn't think that my gorgeousness was so captivating that it got to the level of scary. In my opinion, there were more beautiful people in our surroundings too, maybe they were misled by how I behaved or something. After the first period ended, Kane Sama gave a bright smile and said, Ciao. Before leaving the auditorium, Kane Sama belonged to the Knights faculty and was a fourth year student. He moved to the training grounds together with the other seniors who were in the Knights course. I would have to make my decision for my course when I become a third year student. There are four different kinds of courses, the Knights course, Cleric course, Merchant course and the Magic course. It was compulsory for people who can use magic to take the magic course but the others are able to make their own choices. I have yet to come down to a decision. Since I have already acquired healing techniques from Kuoka Arsene, I do not feel like taking the cleric course. I want to join the magic course but I can't. Therefore, the only remaining choices were the knight's course and the merchant course. The merchanting course was about brushing up on arithmetic skills and it seems that the first year and second in the course would all be on learning the fundamentals. Throughout the course, no specific skill would be taught to the levels of mastery but it feels that it was an internship for the real life, learning the ways of a cook, a seamstress and all other kinds of practical skills, that was where its charms lie. Kawimayu Aniki picked up the skill of making coins in this course and from it learn to make a dagger in the process. However, it was mainly about learning the fundamentals and nothing but the fundamentals so it was, you know, kinda. In contrast, there is the knight's course, and I kinda feel that building up the physical body was better. One's muscles could never betray oneself. As the name suggests, sword techniques would be taught in the knight's course. Sometimes, horse riding skills, Weapon maintenance skills or even dissecting animals skills would be learned but, the course was technically, all about building physical strength. It was a course filled with muscle heads. Kuoka Arsene prefers muscle heads so she suggested that I join the knight's course. I still have two years to choose so I still had lots of time to consider. In these two years, we would be learning the basics, such as arithmetics, writing, reading, history and geography. These were all nearly part of the scope of the entrance examinations but the mages did not have to take the examination to enter the school and hence, in order to ensure the field was leveled, the school introduced this form of general education. There were spots of illiterate children among the mages, though it was still rare. Just a while ago, during magic history lesson, there was a student that had been selected by the teacher to read the text in the textbook but the female student was not able to read it fluently and had been nervous throughout. She was a cute student by the name of Charlotte, a freshman, just like me. Coincidentally, she was from a pioneering settlement in the Guayanassist region. She was not born from a family of aristocrats and thus, when she was proven to be a mage, she could only pick up the basics of reading words before enrolling in school. Hence, she entered school without studying extensively. As such, there were rumors that said she got in through connections. TN, not sure what it really means, exact sentence. Since we shared the same roots, 
I set my sights on making her my friend. She had olive brown hair that was tied into two pigtails, had black pupils and further compounded by her Japanese-like outfit. I could sense a deep affinity with her. My hair was blonde in color though. I wonder if I should try to talk to her, maybe we could be friends. Be but, I am nervous. Would saying something like that from the start be okay? Excuse me, I would like to be your friend. That would come across as amazingly sudden I guess. If you are willing, would you like me to coach you in your studies? Saying that would obviously make me sound too arrogant. A ra, Charlotte San. You have once again lost face during lesson time, how embarrassing that you can't even read words adequately. Could you stop doing that? You will make everyone think that this year's batch of students are all idiots. Just as I was worried endlessly, Katrina Guinassis from the top most influential clique among the current first years, brushed me aside and spoke directly to Miss Charlotte. An eye-catching beauty with silver winding hair, she spoke with such intensity. The Guinassis region that is currently governed by her family was a region known for its affluence and power. The Ruby Fallen Territory was next to it and could be called its neighbor. I want to get along with her as well. Nevertheless, hold up, Miss Katrina. The child you spoke to was the very person that I had wanted to talk to. She was the very person who I had wanted to talk to after I had practiced in my head, the very person who I hallucinated talking to practice after practice. Such a low move to snatch her like that. Tensai Shu Ono Rai Rikisha V2C5, Freshman Arc 5 I am right behind you now. Gonna have some free time now cause my leave was approved so I am gonna go full steam on TLing for now. Tune in for more soon. D also my thanks to Rigoberto for donating smile. Previous. Chapter list. Next. Tensai Shu Ono Rai Rikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com em. I am sorry Miss Charlotte shifted her eyes down in fear and apologized. Seeing her apologize, the girl standing beside Miss Katrina knitted her brows. Charlotte San, you did not even look at Katrina Sama when she was talking, that's so rude. Her mole under her left eye. Her wavy pale brown hair, her shapely nose coupled with her bewitching voice accentuated her appeal. If I remember correctly, that attractive girl was Miss Sarum. She was also from the Guinassus territory just like Miss Katrina and Miss Charlotte. She was the daughter of a knight earl and isn't a mage, just a normal student like me. In the one in ten thousand chance that I become friends with Miss Charlotte, if it is possible. I want to become closer to her during the fifth period when we are in a different classroom. I sent an intense glance to her stealthily. That will do, Sarum San. It seems like she still has problem with the language, saying anything to her at this point is just futile. It is uncertain if she actually understands what we are saying. And then, Miss Katrina went on and on with her harsh words on Miss Charlotte. Recently, Miss Katrina has been preoccupied with Miss Charlotte. She spoke at length with her during break time. I wonder what her aim was. I think if she wanted to be her friend, she could have treated her more kindly but that's coming from me who is stuck at level 1 in making friends. Perhaps, being that aggressive was the way to go. As I pondered, my intense laser eyes were still being transmitted to them and finally, Miss Serum caught sight of me. Kaya. Miss Serum flinched for some unknown reason and while holding on to Miss Katrina's arm, she seemed to be whispering to her. Next, Miss Katrina looked at me. Kaya. Our eyes met one another. Her clique was at the top of the hierarchy among the freshmen. Since I made eye contact at her who has such exceptional people relations skills, maybe a friend invitation would come right now. As I continued to harbor expectations. Miss Katrina made a stoic expression and hand in hand with Miss Sarum. They walked to seats further away from me. Why? While the reality that I did not even qualify for the preliminaries was hammering down in my head, I faced downwards and engaged in a staring contest with the desk. Weird. It's weird that my friend making skills were unbelievably low. Adding up my previous lifespan, I easily exceed 20 years of age and yet I have yet to figure the way to make female friends. Even when I was at Garagari village, when I was before girls, 
I became stiff and frozen. It appears that I somehow had become a precocious girl, and got cold feet. As I sighed, I looked at Alan who was seating beside me. He was happily chatting with Ritzkun. Even Alan had been able to make a friend and as for me. However, Alan can be considered my friend, right? He is more of a stalker rather than a friend or more like, he is totally a stalker but, strictly speaking, he can be seen as my friend. Still, I think treating friends as sloppily like how Alan does is not good. They are girls after all. I mean, up until now, to me, I have varied my way of interacting with people depending if they are of lower rank, Alan, or of higher rank, Kane Sama, Ku Oka Arsene, Boss, Irene San and other adults. But if it was someone of equal standing, I am unclear on how to behave and act. How does everybody make friends so easily I wonder? I regret dearly on neglecting relations with friends in my previous life. Don't dwell so deeply into it, if you want some friends then just say so, it's you chance bad habit to worry endlessly to yourself and making assumptions. Why are you indecisive about it half to classes? I had managed to shake off Alan. Currently, I am having dinner as a family without any outsiders and opening my heart to Kuoka Arsene about my predicament. She ruthlessly replied to the cowardly me. But, I am not sure if it is okay to just talk to them like that I said while losing my nerve. Kuoka Arsene let out a huge sigh. Anything is okay. Did you even try to properly greet them? Also, you could compliment their hairstyle or just talk about anything that comes to mind. Greetings ha dot dot speaking of which, the only acquaintances I have are Alan and Kane Sama B but, I don't know if I my greeting would sound strange and when I hesitate like that, I miss my timing to greet them. Says me who continued to find excuses. If I really must say, so far, I have only been passively trying to make friends and it seems impossible to make any friends at this rate so I began to seriously consider Kuoka Arsene's advice to start a conversation with others. I will try to talk to them this time. Still, it is very bizarre, that it is not proceeding as per planned. Under normal circumstances, most of the girls should be charmed by me and would form infinitely long queues from my seat, waiting for their turn. That should have happened. I was all ready to deal with them one by one, and judge them each with grace and refinement. That was the plan. R, Mu Chan, what made you think like that? I mean, I took great care of my hair and made it dazzling and all. Upon seeing it, the other girls should all be flocking to me and asking me how I did it, as though they were ants pleading for sweets. Also, I am smart so they should also be asking me for help in studies, swarming me just like how the flies do too. W. -a, you look down on girls who attend school. In fact, you casually made a fool of them with all those similes. Where have I gone wrong with your upbringing? Ku Oka Arsene grieved like the painting. The scream. He he. I was joking. I will try harder. Thank you for hearing me out, Ku Oka Arsene. I said and laughed embarrassingly. Ku Oka Arsene was like, this child really. And stroked my head. Well. That wasn't completely a lie, but I had expected that with my potential, even if I stayed passive, I should have been able to make many friends. Ehi. I think it won't do any good to say too much but Wu Chan entered school through special circumstances, and it could be that the other children are cautious of you. I believe once they know that Wu Chan is a wonderful child, they would naturally make friends with you, so please, try to talk to them okay? I nodded with a great amount of effort, and enjoyed the rest of the dinner time with Kuoka Arsen slowly. After being satisfied with dinner time, the sun had already set and it was about time to return to the dorm, time to prepare for going back. I really wished we were living together. It was now a problem of time before I could visit the library and not be able to go to Kuoka Arsen's place during then. I shuddered as I held this thought while opening the door at the entrance way. R. Mew, going back now? Let's go together. From the dimly lit and gloomy outside, the stalking boy Alan was on standby. I quietly shut the door. What was that? An illusion. I saw something like Alan but how could it be? I I am possible. If it wasn't figure of Alan outside the door, then don't tell me. Mary San, a monster that was said to appear and vanish sporadically in my previous world. 
there was a chance that Mary San was delivering a letter which says, I am right at the front of your house now, to the mailbox. Still, Mary San, using a letter won't bring out that kind of realism you know. What is it, Yu Chan? Just as soon as I opened the door, I shut the door. Ku Oka Arsen questioned my irrational actions. Oh outside, there is a Mary San. I muttered immediately after, from the door in question, donk donk knocking sounds came. No way, creepy. Leaving the jittering me by the side, Ku Oka Arsen placed her hand on the doorknob and opened it. Ara, you are from before. You must be Alan Kun. Am I right? She was assuming an any tone for the first half but quickly changed back to a male style while confirming the person at the door. Hello, I am here to pick you up. Alan responded braggingly. Darn, a Alan stalking level is dangerously high. Had I been followed? Was he waiting outside the whole time? Involuntarily, I thought about Mary San who was most renowned in the stalking realm for a fleeting moment. Rather than bothering about making friends and all, I need take care of this guy as soon as possible. I have a feeling that it would get too dangerous later. No, wait. It has already gotten that dangerous. TSRV 2C6. Freshman Arc 6 Duel and Reconciliation. Really nothing much to say. Here you go. Previous. Chapter list. Next. Tensai Shu Ono Ryrikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com the next morning, after waking up and opening up the window, a comforting breeze blew in. A breeze that blew away all encounters with yesterday's dangerous stalker. Great, a good weather, let's settle it today, the duel. I kept all sorts of secret weapons inside my uniform skirt and crammed my leather shoulder bag full with other tools too. While it's morning, let's settle the duel today. I shouted with a lively spirit. The fifth period ended, and we met up at a rear garden found in the inner parts of the campus. There were a total of three of us, the duelists Alan and I, and the judge, Kane Sama. From here on, a divine duel shall begin. And so, this time too, the person to have his butt fall to the ground or fall to his knees would lose, is that agreeable? Also, is it accurate for me to say that any tools and equipment can be used, yes? I said to reaffirm the settings for the duel and explain the rules too. Alan nodded in assent. If Alan has any required items, please get them ready as well. Alan looked on at my bag that was blatantly packed full with things, and made a slight frown while nodding. From the pocket of his robe, he took out a fist-sized crystal. Kimagatame Haranononidit Wakanatsumu Wagakuramotni Yukihafaratsatsu As he sung his chants, the crystal that he was holding on to transformed into a shield. Ho ho! A shield, huh? He must have had put some thought into it. Really? He must been really considerate if he were to not bring out any sword-like weapons or the like here. Well, I'm not going easy on him though and did another check on the contents inside my bag. For now, I shall change the position of some of the tools. All right, now it is perfect. And now, it looks like my preparations are also completed. Can we begin? I said, after securing an upwind position in the garden. Alan seemed to conscious of his reason for defeat when he was five. He stole looks at me here and there and took up position relatively far from me. A gap of roughly 10 meters opened between us. After confirming that we are both fully prepared, Kane Sama said, Start! while signaling with the wave of his hand. As soon as the signal was given, I grabbed the pepper bombs from my bag and flung them towards Alan. The secret weapon I had wanted to use during the battle against Ryuki San, a cylinder made from baked soil and packed with fine pepper powder. Bearing in mind that a distance of 10 meters was child's play in the face of my throwing skills, I aimed and threw them at Alan without rest. Just in case I did not manage to hit his head, I continued to throw them with all I had. Nevertheless, Alan seemed to have foresaw that I would throw something at him and used the shield he had prepared beforehand to block whatever I threw at him. The pepper bombs merely struck his shield and did not hit Alan directly. Shattered pieces of clay scattered everywhere in front of him. Next, a cloud of sand-like powder danced in the air. Alan grinned, 
appearing to have lowered his guard as he thought he had defended against everything. Just as he was about to chant again, I instantly thought, ah, it is over and relaxed my hand that was in my bag. Alan who had an elated expression a second ago shut his eyes and yelled, my eyes, my eyes, goo, goo, koal cowering over. Waiting after the pepper powder cloud dispersed, I went to where Alan was and pushed him down while he was squatting. A success in getting him to fall on his butt. Alan's face reddened and looked to be in pain so I gave him water and eye medication to gargle in his throat and wash his eye. Behind me was Kane Sama who was worried for Alan who was in distress suddenly. Hey Alan, what in the world? The pepper powder that I had thrown when inhaled deeply, would cause throat pain. Also, it had gotten into his eyes I believe. It was because this place is in a downwind position. I had considered the possibility where Alan dodges the pepper bombs and moves away but as soon as they struck his shield and fell. I did not have to pull any other tricks since my very first move had him checkmated. Having this match decided so quickly made all my preparations unnecessary. There were several other mini traps laid, such as a pit where being stepped upon would cause a snake to jump out or a call drop hidden among the weeds, not to mention the various other things in my bag that I have kept up my sleeve. Still, ending it this early was a fairly good outcome. After washing up his eye with the eye medication that I had concocted for treating the effects of the pepper bomb, Alan could somewhat open his eye. It was painful to watch his tears fall from his reddened eyes. Sorry, Alan. That was childish. Pepper bombs are dangerous huh? Please be good and copy what I did. I patted Alan on his back and made him drink medicine to help with the inflammation. Alan Sama, are you alright? Can you speak? I spoke as such but was met with vacant eyes from Alan as he looked downwards, again, I lost right? He spoke in a hoarse voice but hearing him say something was reassuring. Trying to beat your boss him. You are still ten years early. Is that so? You is really awesome, said Alan as he hanged his head in despondency. R. Alan is feeling more dejected than I had expected. Wasn't this not a better outcome than allowing an unfettered boy's pride be on display like how a cricket chirps? Yet, I had to prevent his stalking activities, or more like it. I could no longer ignore his actions. I am glad that Alan Sama has always been concerned with me, but please, have a little more faith in me. I am, after all, Alan Sama's boss. You don't have to still, ahem, protect me every day, but I am uneasy about it. Still. I dot dot know I cannot always keep watch beside you. You don't have to be uneasy about it either. Especially so since this is the capital and the security here is superb. It's not like I am going to be kidnapped or the like. Also, I can look after myself. I replied and glared intensely at Alan who had been listlessly hanging his head down. I got it that, if it is you, no matter what happens, you would be fine that you would be able to solve your problems alone. I got it in my head already, just like how you managed to live on well after being kidnapped by the bandits, even being adopted by an earl too. At this point, Alan held his tongue back. Somehow, he seemed like it was difficult for him to continue and he started mumbling. Later, he again opened his mouth while facing downwards. He lost the vigor he had a moment ago, and was dispirited yet again. When I heard that you had been kidnapped by the bandits, I thought I was the only one who could save you. I was sure you was waiting for my rescue and practiced tirelessly for that, and that was when we got news that you were safe. Still, I never once believed that you was okay until I saw you in person. I was convinced that you would be in despair, all worn out, waiting for my rescue. In the end, the actual you became prettier and was not actually waiting for my help at all. I did not know what to do after that. Once again, he held back his tongue abruptly, stopping to look at me. Earlier, his eyes became moist in order to expel the pepper but it has gotten even wetter now. Ah, it must be my fault. I made someone worried for me because all I focused on was how to stop my suffering and was selfishly thinking only about myself. I wanted to apologize and was about to open my mouth but Alan stopped my lips with his hand. Wrong. I am the worst. You being in good health should have been of the greatest priority and yet, I became spiteful when I saw you in the pink of health. That was when I became aware. You can be angry at me, you. I was always, 
hoping and expecting for a depressed and worn out you, and, that was the you which I wanted to save in a cool way. I'm the worst huh? In the end, all I think about is myself. He said as he brought the hand that was on my lips down. Finally, large beads of tears fell from his eyes. T that is not true. Weren't you angry at me when we reunited? Wasn't that because you were genuinely concerned for me? In fact, I should be the worst since I made you worried. Anyways, having some of these corrupt thoughts should be okay shouldn't it? I wanted to lift the spirits of Alan whose spirits seemed to have fallen to the depths of hell and called out to him but Alan did not meet my eyes. Now that I think about it, I had been the same when I watched over you in school. Maybe I had wanted to prove that my hopeless self was non-existent by showing more concern to you. Nope, I am sure that is the case. All of this, was for my own sake. Stop thinking so deeply into it. Hearing everything from you. I still do not think at all that Alan is the worst in the first place. What is that you are saying? That you reflected and understood on your own that, in the end, you were overly self-centric, isn't that great? Also, what's wrong with being narcissistic? Well, I cannot really say I can commend you on your stalking activities but, isn't it natural for everyone to hold such guilty feelings? As my words quickly lost their strength. Alan revealed a vague smile. Still, that wasn't a smile of a person who forgave himself. Please, I beg of you, please forgive yourself. If you don't, I, I would. And next, I had a sudden realization. Throughout, I have not mentioned a word for Alan. I have come this far, with my cuteness. I did not convey anything at all to him. I veiled my vulgar emotions of embarrassment and shame, and all I did was demonstrate my strength and flashiness. Who was I trying to pretend to be? Having corrupt thoughts should be okay, what is that you are saying? Isn't it natural for everyone to hold such guilty feelings? The things that I said to Alan were all the words which I had wanted to direct to myself. Moreover, I raised my voice in an attempt to win over my powerlessness. Alan was really incredible, gazing at me even those eyes were the ones which wanted to look away, and then being able to express everything he wanted to say. Whereas for me, all I did was ready myself and blabber about all those nonsense. I was the one at wrong, I was the one that was being self-centered. Alan Sama, and the feelings of the rest, I did not contemplate them at all. I had placed my emotions at the forefront. Dot dot that I would hurt someone, I never considered them at all. In addition, I buried my egoistic self, and acted all innocently, imagining naively that we can get along well like that. I was the one who cared about no one but myself. If Alan Sama is saying that he is the worst, I should be the one that is the worst. I confessed all in one breath and tried to maintain eye contact with Alan but my vision grew blurry and my eyes could not focus. All of a sudden, someone from behind ran straight and collided with my back. Timidly, I moved over and noticed that that was Kane Sama. Ah, I had carelessly forgotten about his existence. Kane Sama face turned red, tears bursting forth from his eyes while he embraced both Alan and I. Oh right. These two are brothers. The way their faces are hinged with red were very similar, my mind drifted to the trivialities. Alan, you, I dot dot no. When I was not around, both of you have grown so honestly. Thank you, thank you. Out of nowhere, Kane Sama broke into tears as he expressed his magnificent gratitude, he proceeded to face both of us and hug us. Alan and Ryu, it is all right. Just as I have previously said, the thing known as human progress into adulthood through mutually hurting one another. Each and every time we hurt ourselves and hurt others, if we stood still and stopped advancing, we would not be able to grow at all. The two of you are good kids, I can guarantee that. Now, wipe off your tears on my chest, and reconcile with one another. Kane Sama voiced out as tears streamed down from his cheeks. Be before that. Kane Sama offered us himself for us to dry our tears with our tears and, additionally, our mucus all over him, won't that lay waste to the Eichmann? Was Kane Sama always like that? I was probably too tense earlier but being confused by my first time seeing Kane Sama being emotional, I had become more relaxed and could not help but find the sweet Kane Sama, face filled with tears and mucus, amusing.
I feel bad for Kane Sama but, I seem to have accidentally let out a, bufu uh, giggle. However, breaking into laughter here would definitely be seen as being unable to read the mood so I stifled the laugh as much as I could. At the same time, I tried to take a glimpse at Alan, who was being embraced by Kane Sama. Alan was looking up at Kane Sama with a flabbergast to look. Our eyes met in the midst of it. Something is telling me inside my chest, that Alan is equally as refreshed and clear-headed like how I am right now. By verbalizing my confession, I might have been trying to seek out forgiveness. Releasing the cap over my sinful self and inferior self, I was able to apologize and cleanse myself by doing so. At the very end, even that might have been an act of selfishness to reinvigorate myself. Still, I am glad I was able to say it. Mew, even you had regrets and cried as I did. Dot dot it looks like I am not the only kid here. Though Kane Sama was bawling his eyes out, I was still able to clearly hear Alan's voice due to the small distance between us. That was obvious. Even I am a human. Because I remember my previous life, I imagined that I was somewhat of an adult already but perhaps, I died in my previous life not knowing anything at all. I had never felt this feeling before in my previous life. Alan and I both narrowed our eyes and laughed. By narrowing our eyes, more tears fell from our eyes but right next to us was the chest that had been loaned to us for wiping. No worries there. And that was how we were able to reconcile with one another. TSRV2C7, Freshman Arc 7A lesson where only praises are sung for mages. Enjoy smile sorry it's a short chapter so I might work on chapter 8 pretty soon. Previous. Chapter list. Next, Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisha was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com A splendid morning, did it represent a morning of aspirations? Yesterday's misgivings with Alan melted away as I stepped out of the dormitory all buoyant and cheerfully. The same as always, Alan had planted himself near the dormitory. Shouldn't the stalking have stopped? A Alan Sama. How do you do? I was sure I told you that I did not need an escort. Surely waiting for you here is okay, you didn't tell me to not do this anyways. He said, and walked to my side nonchalantly. After reconciling our differences and tidying up things yesterday, I was sure we made clear that I was the boss and he was the henchman. My things were my things whereas his stuff were also mine too. Whatever I said was absolute, these were the teachings I had conveyed. Maybe as my underling, welcoming the boss was a natural course of action? It's not like I will always be leaving at the same time, so it is best not to wait for me in front of the girl's dorm. The other elder sisters will be casting weird looks at you too. I got it. That was immediate response from him but did he really get it? Speaking of which, Mew, are you still using the dagger I gave you back then? R, Alan's dagger is it? It was an essential component for the flourishing of the wild boar fats extraction business. Wait up. It should be in my room. There were sword lessons in the knight's course anyways so it wasn't like it was an offense to bring a sword into the dorm. Among the seniors who were in the knights, some of them carried swords around with them. As a basic rule, carrying swords is forbidden but if permission has been obtained, it was considered okay under the school rules. Still. There were hardly any ladies who were fond of carrying swords around them in school. I too had left my dagger in my room. The exception was that I had concealed Kawamayuanaki's dagger underneath my skirt, in case of any emergencies. I did not obtain permission for it but I had made sure to never let it be found out so it should all right. That being said, having the god-killing sword found on me would be a very vexing affair for me so it was my personal secret that I carried it around in the school campus. I was afraid of leaving it out of sight and thus, preferred to have it right next to my skin while I was moving around. I have improved on my making skills. I will try to make something else this time. Alan made a smile as he suggested. I responded with, is that so? And gave a vague smile. A sword that would crumble under magic? Alan innocent smile surely did not contain any other intentions though. But we learned that during magic history lesson 2. When the world was attacked by evil monsters, 
the noble magicians created holy swords with their magic, and ordinary humans who were granted these swords acquired hero-like strength. With their newfound powers, they were able to mow down the evil monsters. It was mainly about the magicians trusting humans and leaving their backs to them while the people swore their allegiance to the magicians. In the later stages of the tale, when they were subjugating the last boss, their holy swords apparently broke, and once again, the noble magicians bestowed them with power. It was interesting that it was like an exhilarating adventurer's story as the heroes crushed the evil monsters with a holy sword, renewed, like tension enveloping them. And from this adventurer's tale, came the birth of mages creating swords and bestowing them to humans as a token of trust. However, isn't it strange that those swords can be erased by magic here? Yeah? Whenever the mages feel like it, they could remove the existence of the sword here? Yeah? Receiving such a sword, how can this be called a story of trust? The first period and fifth period class was magic history every day. It was a lesson about praising the mages from start to end, and since I hold memories from my past life, it felt completely about brainwashing us to me to the other children. It was a lesson to hear about fun stories and was rather popular among them. From the beginning, when I heard from Kawamayu Anaki that these swords can be erased by magic, my reaction was that mages were crazy scary and I don't want to get involved with them. In any case, I want to learn about the real history of this world, what path this world has trodden on, how the people who live in this world feel about it, and where this world is headed for. You? What are you in a daze for? We have already reached the auditorium. Shall we sit over there for today? What? I wasn't in a daze right now. I am thinking of something really complex and important, and in a stylish way to boot. TCH. I clicked my tongue being unable to put up with it and as I turned away to ignore Alan, Miss Charlotte appeared in corner of my eye, a spirit user of commoner origins, was she reviewing vocabulary? She seemed to be sinking her teeth at the desk with all her might, alone too. Alan Sama, I am planning to sit somewhere else, so following me here is good enough, well then, farewell. Turning away from Alan who seemed to be in a fit and ignoring him. I went towards where Miss Charlotte was. I walked near to her seat and she lifted her face at me with surprise. How do you do, Miss Charlotte? May I have this seat beside you? Ah, why yes, why you may, do so. Miss Charlotte gladly gave her consent while stuttering. I was en nervous, I could feel my heart beating everywhere as I sat down while maintaining my elegance. Alan chased me from behind and asked someone else in a complaining manner, is this seat taken? Hence, Alan shrewdly secured the seat behind me. Hey, I thought I banned stalking activities, wasn't the words of the boss absolute. Once this lesson is over, I would definitely need to roast him thoroughly. Accidentally, my eyes flitted over to Miss Charlotte's direction and as I have seen earlier, she was indeed intensely reading from the textbook and learning words from it a studious worker eh? Miss Charlotte, feel free to ask me anything if you have any doubts about anything. I presented a smile trying to convey my kind intentions as far as possible. Miss Charlotte replied with an equally brilliant smile back at me, or, oh, so cute. Yes, thank you very much. Um, there is something I wish to quickly clarify. Miss Charlotte started to ask the questions that she wasn't able to ask when she was studying alone. I was considering what else can be done if we reached the limits of our conversation, since it was basically all about study but in the end, after we paused from our conversation, there was no sense of awkwardness at all. The morning lessons were over, and it was finally the noon break that everyone was on everyone's mind. We talked quite a bit before noon break so that technically means that Miss Charlotte and I are friends now right? Comma as I was in great excitement. I couldn't stop my rough breathing as I spoke to Miss Charlotte. Miss Charlotte, it is the afternoon break time, if it is okay with you, want to go together? I asked in an extraordinary smile but Miss Charlotte, wore an extremely despondent expression. Sorry, you Sama. I have other plans for noon time, Katrina Sama is calling for me. W what you say, you have an appointment made before ma'am. What is that? Does that mean all the fun we had till now, 
was all for naught. Were you playing with me? Somehow or another, I suppressed the rumbles inside me. I see, that is unfortunate. Let's have a meal together next time then. It's not like I really wanted so dash. I am actually perfectly fine. I tried to give such an impression by reacting as such. And so, I went for lunch with Mr. Allen who was behind me. Uck. Still, no way I lose. TSRV2C8. Freshman Arcade Fury of Allen. Thank you Tracy for the donation. I should be working on our Abrus Records chapter next smile. Previous. Chapter list. Next. Tensaishu Ono Ryarikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com It became such that I had lunch at the cafeteria with Alan as well as Ritzkun. For now, I tried knocking the words into Alan, telling him to stop stalking me but he didn't seem to understand and lightly replied, Un, all right all right. I still worry. Hey, Mew. You don't have to use Sama when addressing me. Call me as you like. Alan started speaking proudly again even after taking a tongue lashing from his boss. <laughs> Who is this henchman? Change please. Which reminds me, I still have the habit of including Sama from the days of being a maid. Furthermore, this was essentially an aristocratic school so most of the girls and boys here do not pay any attention when being addressed with Sama. However, Fellow children who were on good terms with one another often dropped that way of calling, and preferred to address one another by nicknames instead. He must be longing for that I suppose. Ah, I see. I understand. If anything is fine then brat should be okay right? No way. Why do you have to use such a nasty name? Alan vetoed it with full force. Eh? I can't? Really? Then, how about henchmen? No. Such a demanding henchman. Ha, that leaves me with no choice, then will Alan kiddo do? You obviously won't need that kiddo, just don't drop the honorifics when referring to me, you got that? What's with that, if you wanted me to do that, you should said so from the very start, and you did tell me to call you whatever I wanted to. Okay, okay. Alan, is that fine? W why do you sound so reluctant? Alan complaining actually looks quite amusing. Just as I prepared my reply to Alan, Ritzkun spoke up. Somehow, it feels like both of you have changed. Something happened yesterday. The innocent and naive Ritzkun was unusually sharp today. Yes, yesterday there was a big reconciliation event. Ah, yesterday. Alan murmured softly and sent a meaningful look in my direction. Yesterday, Mew and I ascended up the stairs of adulthood. Ak, ak. I choked on my potato soup. What kind of metaphor are you using? Are you doing that on purpose? Just look at Ritzkun. His face has gone all red. Please do not use such a weird way of describing things. We simply had a fight and we made up after that. W what? Was that it? I misunderstood because of Alan's abstract explanation. Having managed to clear the misunderstanding for the young innocent boy, I heaved a sigh of relief. Playing with a young boy with a pure heart like that isn't good, Alan. However, the Alan in question did not seem to understand as he tilted his head. Weird misunderstanding? What misunderstanding? Eh? Do I have to spell it out? Or are you really do this on purpose? Are you the type to gain satisfaction in making cute children say disgusting stuff? I, I also do not understand. I just heard some things from my elder brother. The young innocent boy's face went all red again as he blurted out in a panic. No, let's stop here. Please stop going further into this topic. Ritzkun, stay. Alan understood less and less of what Ritzkun was talking about, but appeared to be more and more interested. From the way Alan was acting, I guess he wasn't trying to sexually harass me intentionally, he really has no idea. Speaking of which, I heard from Oka Asama that there was this education for males in order to become adults, is that it? Oi, what is wrong with you today? So you are able to read the atmosphere today huh? If we continue expanding on this topic, I am afraid this would be forever be marked in black for Alan one day. I think it was called sexual education. In the past, Ryu was designated to help me with that education but Ryu disappeared and Oka Asama became troubled. Was yesterday's turn of events considered sexual education? Am I right? 
Alan flashed his all-proud grin as he looked at me. I see, so you really want to make this black history happen. I got it. Wrong. Sexual education is a completely different thing. Later, it isn't such a good thing to continue discussion about this. You will feel embarrassed about it one day. Look, Ritzkan already looks like a boiled octopus. Embarrassment? Why? But, it was true that yesterday's events, if it wasn't you and I, we wouldn't have been able to overcome it. When you disappeared and Claude Ajayzama went in search for you, he went to buy another woman from a human employment agency and Oka Asama said that the job would be left to her. Is that it? Oh, more realities about Claude Sand that I do not want to hear about. In this country, the so-called human employment agency was a place where humans were traded for cash. In short, a slave firm. Hearing about this slave trading business did irk me but the ethics in this world and my previous world weren't the same. People in this world do not get upset on matters like this. This kind of business was completely natural in big cities like the royal capital. It wasn't the kind of illegal store where the owners can be incriminated for it, it was an entirely legal business. I see, did they come to the capital thinking that I might have been sold to such a place by the bandit head honcho? Despite having been cared for by Claude San and causing him to worry for me, upon hearing that he bought a woman, I frankly hope that he forgives me for not saying sorry. I know for a fact that he visited such places to find me but despite knowing so, I hope he doesn't get angry at the narrow-minded me. B by the way, how old is the woman that Claude San bought? This was important, it would shed light on his paedophilia. If I remember correctly, they were 14, 17 and 23 years old. I hear they are helping Claude Ogerson with work. What? There were more than one of them. And here I thought there was only one. TN. Note that in Japanese plurality has to be inferred by the listener unless they are mentioned like now, Mr. Claude, while he didn't buy children, he still chose young women. I will definitely not be needed in such an unbelievable harem. <laughs> but since there weren't any children with him, should I feel happy that he was healthy, comma, dot, 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 wait. There was this 14 year old so doesn't that make him hopeless? She would still be considered a minor by this world's standards. Is that so? Well, when the time comes, someone from that bunch will be responsible for your education, so let's put an end to this discussion. I said so to put an end to this topic. I see, Alan Bratz, Brat graduation is being prepared huh, so what about Kane Sama? Almost complete? R, no no, I cannot think deeply into this. If I think like this for even a moment, I will be left behind. I even said I wanted to put an end to this discussion. I need to forget. Which reminds me. I remember reading from a book in the previous world, that gorillas raised in isolations in places like zoos were unable to copulate. That wild gorillas observe other adult gorillas copulating and learn that. Oh, so that's how you leave behind descendants. That's before they become able to copulate themselves. It seems that animals that developed some sense of reasoning no longer have a natural instinct for making children. I pray that this day would not be registered as one of his darkest past when he finally learns about that in the future. No, I want to know more. What kind of education is that? Does you know? What? You are still clinging on to that. Didn't I end the discussion on a high note? Alan Bratt was currently all excited, waiting for my explanation. S should I say it? Comma it is one of the rituals to become a man. A aren't I already a man? Is there a way to become a woman? I tried to use an indirect way to explain it but Alan really startled me with him considering the possibility of becoming a woman. I feel like hitting him. Was it so that a man can become more manly? I don't really get it. If it was an education to become a man, then shouldn't it be left to the hands of a man among mans rather than you? A man among mans? No. Well, if Alan thinks that is better then I won't stop him from thinking so. I don't really understand it myself too but, it seems like the kind of education that is often left to females to teach men, it is simply, from the perspective of a man, in some way, an awakening in a whole new world. And with that, the discussion is over. Say another word of this and I'll hit you. Seeing as I have taken offense with it, Alan Bratt frowned slightly but soon became satisfied and nodded. In other words, 
You doesn't know either right? If that was so, you should have said so earlier. He said while laughing. T this guy. Well, he was right that I didn't know about the intricacies though. Glaring spitefully at Alan's triumphant look, I let his spirits get into his head while snatching at his baked sweets which were his favorites. Munch, munch. Alan froze in despair as he watched me bite away at his sweets. From the side, Ritzkan commented that it was Alan's fault earlier. TSRV 2C9, Freshman Arc 9 Hiko Chan, translating a 2K words chapter actually feels easy now. Perspective changed after going one level up. Previous. Chapter list. Next. Tensai Shu Ono Rikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com Afternoon break time was ending soon so before lessons started again, I headed for the girls' toilet. It seems like Alan has finally changed his stalker ways and did not follow me this time. Phew. The boss is relieved. From the bottom of her heart. It has been a long time since I could use the toilet while feeling this relieved. After using the toilet, I heard a girl's voice from outside. Furthermore, it felt a voice of inescapable destiny. Opening the door that connected to the outside, I saw that a group of girls gathering. In the center of the group was Miss Charlotte and Miss Katrina. Hey, when was Charlotte San allowed to follow us to class? I feel so ashamed and embarrassed that someone like you came from the same Guinness territory. Miss Katrina said that to her, while covering her forehead with her left hand, and looked as if she would faint in disgrace right away. Ah, how troubling it must be for you, Katrina Sama. The followers of Miss Katrina chimed in, in a high-pitched voice, while glaring at Miss Charlotte. Eh, hey, what was going on? Was this some kind of a mini theater? S should I stop them? Charlotte Sama, Katrina Sama, how have you two been? There is an unsettling atmosphere though. I smiled as I called out to the group of girls. Instantly, they faced my way with a thump. Sensation. R, scary, more scary than I imagined. You are, Ruby Fallens. The young ladies, who were her followers, reaffirmed what they knew about me and lowered their voices as through they were intimidated, they were perplexed at my intervention. What is that reaction? For some reason they were frightened by someone but I am the one who was being frightened. You are Ruby Fallen's Usama right? We were having an important discussion with Charlotte San just a moment ago, it has nothing to do with you. Miss Katrina replied with an unseemly smile as she tried to tame the fears of her followers. This important discussion you are having, is it related to our lessons? If she is having difficulties keeping up, I can offer my help to Charlotte Sama. I chatted with her in the morning, and with her enthusiasm, I am sure that if you give her some time, she would not be disappointing and embarrassing you, Katrina Sama. I offered my brilliant suggestion but Miss Katrina face became grim as she frowned. You? What is your objective? A. I don't have any ulterior motive. I am not planning to use this teaching as an excuse to make a friend, you know? I don't really have something outrageous like an objective. It looked like both Miss Katrina and Miss Charlotte were having some difficulties so I thought I might be able to help resolve the misunderstandings. I grinned as I replied, but Miss Katrina folded her arms and gave a scrutinizing glare at me from head to toe. I see, as the rumors claim of your genius. I am sure that you will do well as expected, I am looking forward to it. Miss Katrina said, nimbly turned her skirt around and walked off with her followers. Her followers gave a stare that seemed to say, ha, huh, we will let you go today but there will not be a next time. Ha, huh, is this school really a school for aristocrats? It isn't a school for the Yakuza right? As I panicked in my mind, Miss Katrina stopped midway and looked over her shoulder. However. It would good for you to think carefully about the mages that show kindness to you. Even if it was said that you are some daughter of an earl's family, we all know that you are some fake horsebone of an aristocrat, with such a suspicious status and getting involved with some dirty darkness spirit user. I hope you don't regret it. She left those words of caution before shuffling along with the rest of her followers. It looked just like a group of soldiers marching. Dash Miss Katrina is a very harsh person so whenever she sees a hopeless child like me, she would get very irritated. Furthermore, 
I am still a long way from being a proper mage. Miss Charlotte said with a feminine smile. It was the lunch break now and currently, I was having lunch with Miss Charlotte and talking about what happened yesterday with Miss Katrina. Sitting next to you were Alan and Ritz Khan as they looked on with great interest. Eh, you, you picked a fight with Miss Katrina yesterday, wasn't she from the Guinassus territory? She is quite a formidable foe but you naturally won right? Her side are all girls so I wouldn't be able to bring out more my strengths but, if it is just a diversion you need. Alan was in high spirits as he discussed his plans to deal with disputes. As usual, Alan was fond of tackling conflicts. Certainly, when I was a maid, he would start to work on disputes whenever there was an opportunity to do so. Still, I am not in the mood. At times like this, the most I could do was to ignore him and continue to look straight at Miss Charlotte instead of him. I see, indeed, Miss Katrina is a person with a strong will. Well, still, it will be alright, for now, I think I would accompany you until things become better, I am sure Charlotte Sama would be good in no time with your studiousness. I smiled pleasantly to her and she returned it back with a smile, her white cheeks blushed, or, oh, so cute. I thought that Rusama would be a difficult person to approach, there was this boy from an earl's family following you all the time and you are so good at your studies too, you seem full of mysteries and totally give off a different vibe from the compared. Something tugged at my heart when she mentioned about a boy following me, it was not like I wanted him to be around me all the time, he did all by himself as a stalker. Full of mysteries? Who? Me. If I remember correctly, yesterday, Miss Katrina said, we all know that you are some fake horsebone of an aristocrat. Something along those lines so it is quite well known that I was adopted ha, huh? it was likely that the horsebone portion contributed to the mysterious factor. Hey, you, were you listening to me? Alan who had been ignored this whole time wildly butted into the conversation. I know that you said some crap about a conflict but there is no way we are taking part in a factional war. However, because he was ignored for a set amount of time, he transformed from cheeky Alan to an indignant Alan. Ritzkun, who was beside him, looked very calm but the support at his level wouldn't be enough to handle Alan. I have to forcefully say a few words as the boss. Alan, be quiet. We are not going to be part of a confrontation. Why, this is important isn't it? Are you chicken? So what are we going to about bringing the big arm coffin? TN. Actual text. I also don't know what it means, Alan. What did I say about the words from your boss? Wah, I am thinking for you. What about the words from your boss? They are absolute. If you can at least understand that, it would be enough. I took a glance at Alan who has calmed down and nodded with satisfaction. That was when I noticed someone I knew very well near the dining table. Ah ha ha, mew. As expected of you. I heard Alan's voice and though I might have to come and take a look but it seems like there was no need for that. It was the followist Kane Sama. He came to stop Alan from going berserk. Too amazing. I wonder if he has some kind of a sensor or something. After Kane Sama finished making his greetings to us with sparkling eyes, the person next to him began talking. Kane, this is the little brother you always boast about? Or more like my nephew huh? Yes, my younger brother, Alan, is indeed Henry's nephew. The person who came along with Kane Sama was the shimmering young noble, Prince Henry. Speaking of which, Alan and Kane Sama's father was part royalty. He was the same as Prince Henry and was a child of the previous king. Which means, Henry Sama would be their uncle isn't it? His faint blondish hair rested all the way to his back, his amethyst eyes and the rest of his features gave him a gentle look. His gentle nature bore similarities to Kane Sama. Such handsomeness, he was too radiant to look closely on. Honestly speaking, anyone not above 17 years old would be out of my radar but I might change my mind with this level of beauty. N nice to meet you, my name is Alan Rainforest. Even Alan looked like he was dazzled in the presence of a royalty as he stiffly presented himself. Nice to meet you. I am Henry Castagas Fomtel. Do call me Henry. Your elder brother always attaches the summer when addressing me but I don't really mind either way. Just don't call me, Uncle Sama. 
he displayed his pearly white teeth when he finished. Yikes, what a kind looking smile, he might have been the criminal who bore the sin of standing out more than I did during the entrance ceremony but I wonder if I should acquit him of the crime because of his beyond expectations handsomeness. As I was thinking, our eyes met. Oh, I remember seeing you from somewhere. Dot 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 were you the representative for the normal students during the entrance ceremony? Er uh, what he remembers me? What should I do? Yes, to think that you actually remember me, I am honored. My name is Yu Ruby Fallen. I stood up and held the hem of my skirt as I greeted him. Alan, learn from your boss and do it properly. This is how the upper classes do it. After bowing, I lifted my face up and Henry got closer to me than I thought. Henry Sama bent his back to meet my gaze. Kaya, too close. Henry Sama, everyone is looking. Yikes. And then, he grabbed and scooped up a bunch of my blonde hair. Such pretty blonde hair, they are soft and cute like a small bird. I'll be in your care, Hiko-chan. R, huh. Hiko-chan, didn't I introduce myself earlier so why can't he just call me by name? I got all excited earlier but now I feel that his type doesn't match, giving me the goosebumps too. I didn't anticipate being called Hiko-chan and having these goosebumps in reaction. I broke into a completely faultless smile, and then, Kane Sama and Henry Sama left. Wow, Henry Sama was so gorgeous. Also, Alan Sama's elder brother was also quite attractive. Miss Charlotte passionately sent gazes in step with their backs. Yeah, that's right, they were just eye candies. That's right, that's right. I realigned my thoughts and just when I was about to continue with my meal happily, Alan suddenly appeared beside me. Your ability to creep up on others unknowingly is amazing huh? Alan abruptly grabbed my hair, that was the same portion of hair that Prince Henry held, and then he rubbed on the hair, up and down, a few times. Stop it, it's hurting my cuticles. Hey, Alan, what are you doing? I took a step back, and was rescued from the demonic hands of Alan, nothing really, there was some dirt on it so all I did was remove them. Alan explained sullenly and returned to his seat. A, hey, that can't be true, dirt? I felt the strands of hair and couldn't really find anything that fitted that description. Did Alan remove all of them earlier? Even if that was true, there was no need to rub them. In order to nurse my cuticles, I combed them gently with my hands. TSRV 2C10, Freshman Arc 10 Studying Magic Poll here to decide if I should drop honorifics. Previous. Chapter list. Next. Tensai Shu Ono Ryarikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com Trips to the library after classes increased as I had to tutor Miss Charlotte. The library was located 50 meters above the campus. Thus, walking up the staircase was difficult, but actually, there was an easy way to climb up with magic. There was a pumice stone with a radius of 2 meters readied near the library. If you supply it with magic, it would be able to ascend, like how an elevator would. I believe it descends instead, when a certain incantation is chanted. Incredible fun. Alan, a magician, specialized in earth magic. Oh henchman, thank you for your great sacrifices. In any case, today was also a day at the library with Charlotte, Alan, and Ritz. It was a seven-story cylindrical building and the first floor was the reception, while the third floor's bookshelves were crammed full with books to do with general education, such as history and geography, the fourth floor of the library was a cafe. This allows readers to select books they want from the first floor to the third floor and then, elegantly read while having tea. Chatting was allowed on this floor. I carried many books related to history which I had a personal interest to and took a seat at the usual table for four. That was when one Charlotte started apologizing. S sorry, I was a little late. Usually, we would meet up before the elevator and use it together to get to the library, but today, Charlotte was late. It's alright, in the time that we were waiting, I learned more about magic from Alan so time was spent meaningful. Anyways, you must be very busy too. In fact, since our meetings are always matched to my schedule, I am the one that should be apologetic. We met up on days when I had free time. Today, 
I'll be having dinner together with Mother Ku, and I'll be having a nice chat with her. On days when something like this is planned, we will not have a study session. We end up surprisingly late after our study sessions. Hence, I won't be able to have a meal at Mother Ku's place. No, no way, not troubling at all. Really? You are always of help. Recently, when I get called out to answer questions in lessons, I have no difficulties answering now. I don't stutter and chew on my words when reading so I am extremely grateful. She exclaimed with a cute smile. That smile, priceless. Then, that's good. I, too, am thankful for your knowledge in magic. I didn't expect that a non-mage student would be unable to read books related to magic, so, this arrangement benefits me too. Yep, my long-desired trips to the library have been extremely disappointing. The knowledge I sought for couldn't be found in the library. Still, it was so oh big, and it was the only library in the country. The books that I have access to, based on what course I took, contained mostly identical information, so I wasn't able to learn what I wanted to know. But, why would you want to learn magic? Even though, you cannot use magic? Alan, the only member among us who was a mage, asked in total disbelief. I really wanted to say, listen up, kid, just teach me the damn thing. But inside the library. Our positions are switched since he is my magic teacher and I was the quiet student. My inability to use magic was the very reason I want to know. Instead, I replied affectionately with, Oh oh ho, oh, it is very advisable not to ruin the mood of the teacher. Not to mention that Alan was the only magician among us. There are plenty of things I have to consult him on. In this world, mages are largely split between two different types, magicians and spirit users. Alan was a magician, whereas Charlotte and Ritz were spirit users. Being a magician, Alan was the only one who could operate the plate elevator. Hence, our meeting point was outside of the library. From what I have learned from Alan, magicians were good at increasing or decreasing the number of things, changing their shapes, selecting and filtering a bunch of things, and etc. On the other hand, Spirit users can be broadly said to be better at large-scale magic. Both magicians and spirit users are able to use magic that only magicians can use and magic that spirit users can use but there would be a gap in their abilities. Hence, mages readily admit that spirit users and magicians are two completely different classes. From my viewpoint, however, both spirit users and magicians are just fantastic human beings. Now then. Continuing on with Charlotte's reading and writing practice. Please ask away if there are any words you do not understand. And, please do teach me more about magic, Alan and Ritz. I believe we were talking about elements and incantations, right? We are limited in time. Simply because of this factor, I pestered teacher Alan and Ritz on magic. There aren't any books I can learn from. I mean, at least for the books that I am authorized to read. I have no choice but to rely on auditory learning. The concept of magic is very new to me since magic didn't exist in my previous lifetime. Like an honor student, I listened attentively and dropped in interjections from time to time while listening to Alan and Ritz. Today's lecture was about elements and incantations. For example, water magic and fire magic can be used to control water and fire respectively. There are many other types of elements in magic. Mages with weaknesses in an element would be completely unable to use magic of that element. Conversely, for elements that they are good in, mages would be able to memorize extremely difficult incantations for that particular magic. That's right. They need to memorize their incantations. For both magicians and spirit users, they are only able to use their magic only after memorizing their incantations. Though, for magic that they are weak in, they won't be able to memorize the incantations, no matter how many times they study the incantation. Even if they read the incantation from the text, they are still unable to put it into words. They get a sudden sensation of forgetting how to read, something akin to a gestalt breakdown. Stare into a word long enough and you'll go, what? This is the word? Really? It is a similar feeling from what I can gather. It is the kind of nausea you get from being cut sick. No matter how hard they try, mages eventually give up on the elements they are unable to read. In addition, even if they try to learn by ear, they would not be able to hear it clearly, 
and would be unable to memorize it by ear. In the past, when I fought with Mr. Ryuki, a mage, I could discern his incantations, but for the average person, that should not have been possible. Indeed, during the battle, Mr. Ryuki looked surprised. People who are cannot use magic, myself included, ought to be unable to comprehend the incantation even if they see or hear it. The only reason that Mr. Ryuki did not question how I managed to discern the incantation was because he was a fellow Tigasaku cult member and was told that I was a divine messenger from the heavens. Of course I would be understand the incantation. He must have wholly accepted some theory like this. And now, why would I be able to understand the incantation for magic? It is most likely because I have already memorized them by heart. Since, all the incantations of this world are from traditional tankers, and they are from the hundred poems too. I wonder why and how traditional Japanese poems made their way into this world. The largest mystery. Somehow, the incantations for magic in this world were the traditional poems I learnt in my past. In order to score for my tests, I memorized the classics by rote and was approximately at a level where you can call it my major. Not to mention that the incantations were exactly the same as how it is read in my previous world. Surely, it sounds nonsensical to the people in this world. It's too difficult to come to an understanding of how all this happened, even if I dwelled on it. I can put forth however many theories I want to, but in the end, whether I have a theory or not, well it is nearly impossible to conclude if any of them are right. Among all the theories I have formulated, the most convincing argument was that a person, like me, who retains knowledge of their previous world was reborn into this world and established the system of incantation. Incantations were introduced after the mythical era, sometime after the Pandra Empire fell so roughly 700 years back during Talapabtslet, BGVTGPTPBHGXWBWGHPATLPHKLVATKBUTGWITSLKSMILYLTZAPPHBGONLPALBUITSPFYALZRXHHGTIPLU BGVTGPTPBHGXMILYLLZBULPLYHULITSPVTGKLDXLW XHBPBX quite likely that around this period a reincarnated person who belonged to the same birthplace as me existed. This is all a conjecture though. By the way, when you recite the chant, do you understand the meaning behind the words? Do you feel as through the words feel like they are from ancient times? Meaning? Absolutely not. Incantations are just a chain of sounds that hold no meaning. Incantations are just incantations. It's not some ancient language that people used in the past. As I had expected, Alan and other mages, have no idea what the Japanese poems mean, perhaps then, this place is actually Japan of the future, and some people tried uttering the words of the old, however, this doesn't seem to be true. Still, there have been unnatural events in this country's history. Before the founding of Castel, the magical empire, Pandra, existed, however, there are no records of anything before that. Dot I thought I would be able to find information on the way of life before the magic empire was established by coming to this library, but I didn't find anything like that. The history as described by the books were all in the period after the magical empire of Pandra was founded. There was nothing written on how the country was made nor anything before that. Dot no, since it was called the mythical era, maybe the country wasn't stable though. It's true that mages from the Pandra Empire period were able to use magic without incantations right? Somehow, after the Pandra Empire fell into ruins, magic couldn't be used unless incantations were recited. At that point of time, the founding king of Castel brought along a book of incantations. Yes? Yes, rather than it being a book of incantation, it was known as Magical Index of Salvation. I saw it before entering school and it was quite beautiful. Incantations were written in each of the pages in that thick book. Alan replied ecstatically. It is called the magical index of salvation because when the mage equals God's era ended, the sudden appearance of this book saved the mages who could no longer use their magic. The magical index of salvation is the original script that recorded all incantations. Before entering the school, 
mages were not required to take a paper examination, but there was a mage aptitude test. After asking a few simple questions and confirming the person as a mage by displaying his or her magic, the student would be shown the magical index or salvation. This is to elucidate which incantations the mage can or cannot read, thus identifying the mage's favored element. If by any chance, the author was reincarnated, then it might be possible that something was hidden in the book to create this effect, and the book is being kept strictly on the highest level of the library too. I really want to look at it. Really, really wanted to look at it. Normal students, who cannot use magic, are restricted by a strange rule that disallows reading of magic related books. That's why I can't read the books on incantations. Bringing the book out is also disallowed so having Alan borrow the book for me is a no-go. What in the world is this? Why is it that as long as you are not a mage, you are not allowed to read them? I'm so sick of this. Since I cannot use magic, isn't fine to just let me read? I want to scream that in the middle of the campus. I tried secretly reciting the incantations Alan chanted at night, however, I could not activate any magic. I somewhat recalled pluff pubs palks till pabks melg bmtxt it pubs bog pat bmtxg hphgl ph spl df ubs ap tmtr bp zap bp ubs ap klk lvt dxl bmtx vat pubs bp xlvops tgw bp mtxg pfsl tool gtsa xhbs clear tss tgw xard pl kdp bp at gh li ilv ai bv xblu pp palu libs ap klt vlapt bk pub and ph tv bot blitz bsf xh bvolal pal slip x bwl he ea vlump ea ubs ap at tgw ulv pl he incantations in a middle school second year syndrome ish way that fail to dot according to alan when using magic you would be able to control the magic particles drifting around in air while chanting. To a magician's eye, the magic particles wafting around in air would appear as sparkling lights or something. For spirit users, they would be unable to observe magic particles but would be able to see the shapes of spirits. Spirit users can command spirits to do their bidding after chanting the incantations. So, what do spirits look like? Ritz was explaining the way spirit users apply their magic, but I became interested in the appearances of spirits. By the standards of my previous world, spirits would look something like half-naked little girls. There is diversity in the way spirits look. Some look like humans, others might look like birds, cows or even look like a plain square. Actually, right now. There is a spirit on my head that looks a girl from its upper half of the body while appearing like a bird from its lower half of the body. Wah! I scrutinized the top of Ritz's head from all angles but saw nothing. Unfortunately, I can't see it. Can Alan and Miss Charlotte see it? Of course I can't see it. I'm a magician after all. Said Alan as he stared unflinchingly on Ritz's head. Miss Charlotte was practicing her spelling when I called out to her. She raised her head to take a look at Ritz's head and shook her head softly. I can't see it too. I have low affinity to the wind spirits that Ritz specializes in. A. There are spirits that spirit users cannot see? Yes, in my case, I can observe air spirits, which all other spirit users can as well as spirits of the elements I have high affinity with. I am entirely unable to observe spirits of elements that I have low affinity with. Whoa. There are many other kinds of spirit users too. Oh, is that so? So there are elements that spirit users have high affinity and low affinity to? So Ritz is good with wind magic? Yep. However, my best element is fire. There aren't many uses for fire magic though. Vegetation spirit magic would have been much better. It's not that I cannot use vegetation magic, but I'm not good in it. Vegetation spirit magic can do things like grow crops. Wow. Vegetation spirit magic can help grow entire fields of crops right? Yes, there is a shortage of mages now, so my region has been facing difficulties. Earl Zagan is troubled by this so I hope to quickly come to age, become good at magic and be of help said Ritz as he chuckled. Such an innocent child. He has a charm whom the saucy Alan lacks. If I remember correctly, Ritz is the son of a magic hull who belongs to the Gold Endel territory northeast of here. 
He has the same standing as the middle-aged spirit user at Rainforest. I pray that his innocence remains untainted like the spirit users at Rainforest, who are worked to the bone by the black organization. Is Charlotte striving to master vegetation magic just like Ritz? Ah, uh, I, um, I am not that good with vegetation magic. Miss Charlotte shifted her eyes downwards in dejection. What? Why? I tried to seek encouragement from Alan but both Ritz and Alan, who were seated in front of me, gave a oh, you didn't have to go that far look. What? Did I do something I shouldn't have? Maybe because I stumbled on her weakness. E everyone has something they aren't good at. We just have to bring out our strengths. Isn't that so? My strengths. Miss Charlotte seemed like she was going to say something but she became even more depressed. What? Why? I looked at Alan and Ritz in a fluster but all they did was give me reproachful looks with this mood killer is hopeless. Written all over their faces. Huh. I looked at Miss Charlotte in a panic and her skirt came into my view. What? It's drenched in something? Stained by something? There was a stain was on her skirt. Ah, this can help change the topic. Miss Charlotte, it looks like there is some dirt over there. Let me help you wipe it off. I said and pulled out my handkerchief, Miss Charlotte reacted with alarm as I brushed off her skirt with the handkerchief. I'm a fine. Ah really? I was surprised at her strong reaction and stopped. Him. I don't think her skirt was stained earlier this afternoon. And from Miss Charlotte's stiffened expression, I can't really put it into words but it feels turbulent. Charlotte eyes reddened as she tried to clean the stain beneath her thighs to hide the stained area on her skirt. Alan who had been watching, called out to Charlotte in a rather low voice with a grim expression. Oi, what happened after the fifth period when Katrina called for you? Miss Charlotte's face became pale and she faced the floor again. Ritz appeared to be concerned. A, eh? what happened? Did something like that happen? Dot, 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 did something happen during magic lesson? TSRV 2C11. Freshman Arc 11 Undead Spirit Magic took a short break from translating and it was kinda productive. Read some books and learn new things. Back to the grind. I should be posting chapters every week now. Previous. Chapter list. Next. Tensai Shu Ono Rai Rikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yametranslations.com According to what I heard from Miss Charlotte, after the fifth lesson ended, she was called by Miss Katrina to the back of the girl's toilet. Others had already gathered there in advance to have a confrontation. During the meeting, she said something like, Aren't you getting too full of yourself by following us to the lessons recently? And she replied by saying, No, I wasn't like that, but one of her followers threw a raw egg at her and dirtied her skirt. A raw egg. This is a school for refined ladies yes? A school where various aristocrats are gathered right? Considering all that, it is surprising that these kind of things happened. What was strange was that they were targeting her, even though Charlotte Chan was a mage. Honestly. I feared and had the impression that people who were unable to use magic would be treated by the mages as though they were their servants. Regarding that point, I posed this question to Ritzkun and as a preface, he said he wasn't sure, but told me what he knew. To a mage, humans who cannot use magic were pathetic lamy like existence who should be given protection, therefore, publicly bullying them would be contrary to their pride. But for others who were mages, that kind of concept fades away. He thinks. There appears to be an implicit ranking among the mages, and basically, many people hold the view that magicians were above the spirit users. Kings were also traditionally selected among the royal magicians. Even the spirit users further categorize themselves between the superior and the inferior. Since it was popular for spirit users to be able to nurture crops, those who were unable to do so aptly would be given a treatment similar to that of a dropout. It would be acceptable if vegetation magic was the only one that she was bad in, but in truth, the real problem was how the attribute of the magic she was good was standing out conspicuously. Miss Charlotte specializes in undead spirit magic. It was a disconcerting magic that could control the flesh of dead people who didn't have hair, nails peeled off, or who were toothless. It was the magic that the necromancer witch, who went rampant near the end of the mythical era, specializes in. However, 
it wasn't a tremendous power that could control a corpse as freely as how the Witch of Darkness could, therefore, just like what the first few undead mages who were born in this era did, Miss Charlotte could do the processing of sheared will or the processing of the cocoons of silkworms. The really strong people with amazing ability could do something like regenerate dead flesh, so they could cut of the legs of a cow and regenerate it, before repeating the whole process of cutting and regenerating. Wouldn't that effectively increase meat supply? This is crazy scary. I doubly wouldn't want to that kind of meat. It's just some urban legend, right? The position of undead spirit mages who were able to do such frightening things were weak. Given that the Witch of Darkness, who was the biggest blemish in the history of mages as recorded on the textbooks, was greatly hated, it was easy for undead spirit users to be disliked since they had the same magic as the witch. I do not know how it was like for them when the Witch of Darkness was going strong but currently. Spirit users who specializes in undead spirit magic seem to be quite an unfortunate lot. Speaking of which, Miss Katrina did say earlier that she didn't care if I regret being on good terms with the Mage of Darkness later. So it was because of Charlotte Chan's attribute her. From the perspective of a lady from an aristocratic family, they must think of corpse controlling magic as filthy. However, for me, I think that magicians and spirit users are both fantastic human beings with no big difference. Miss Charlotte, who was an undead mage and who was originally a commoner, was feeling extremely down after being thrown at with eggs, but don't worry too much about it. I too, was a maid and had my origins from a pioneering settlement. Even after being thrown at with pepper bombs and being followed by a stalker, I am still not overly worried. Charlotte Sama. Please do not pay too much attention to it, the dirtied parts of the clothes can be easily cleaned. No matter what they say about you, Charlotte Sama's power is wonderful, it is not a power to be ashamed of, the silk or wool uniforms that we are wearing were most certainly the products of an undead spirit user, just like Charlotte Sama, isn't it? It is a wonderful thing. I offered words of consolation to a cheerless Charlotte Sama and patted on her back. Charlotte Sama looked back at me with eyes choked full of tears. Tears don't suit you, Kitty Chan. I remembered Prince Henry and in my heart, I quietly comforted her with those worlds as I smiled. You Sama, thank you for your kind words. Dot 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 though, recently, the spinning wool and the weaving loom have become widespread and I heard that these uniforms were made by people who use those tools. In the first place, spirit users are bad at delicate work and cannot do something as simple as use magic to increase the mass like how the magicians make their cotton products or plant products. So we are not suited for further processing of wool and silk. I heard the rumor that with the popularization of tools, that there is no longer work for undead spirit users. Ah, uh, um, that is, thanks to the spread of the spinning wheel and the weaving loom, their position in society have become more and more weaker. Damn it, who was it that introduced the spinning wheel or the loom to this world? Exclamation mark dot 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 it was me. So sorry, Miss Charlotte, I didn't hold any malice. Sorry, Miss Charlotte, that I intruded. I included various meaning and said, Miss Charlotte gave a, huh? Look and lowered her head. No, sorry. It was because of me, and Ryusama tried to encourage me to, but all I did was to reply with an idle complain. In a flash, she lifted her face and beamed. As Ryusama mentioned, I would try to not be bothered by it. Surely there must be something else I can do, because you heard me out. I have become clearer. It felt like she was only putting up a front, but in any case, she has opened up again so I was slightly relieved. Somehow, I feel like I can do something for Charlotte Chan, Miss Katrina him. For now, I will order Henchman Allen to guard Miss Charlotte until the sun sets. I would definitely get him to ensure that nothing happens during magic lesson from tomorrow onwards. Your ability to keep a lookout on others, the boss has recognized it, Allen. TSRV 2C12. Freshman Arc 12 shopping at the Capitals Market. I know more people polled to have honorifics remain but I want to give this one last try. Personally didn't like Mother Ku so I left it as Ku Oka Arsen. Comment again below and I'll decide whether to keep this style for future chapters. Previous. Chapter list. Next. 
Tensai Shu Ono Rai Rikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com Allen, who had been entrusted with the role of being Miss Charlotte's bodyguard, quickly executed his unique skill, stalker, likely to be at level 97, and demonstrated how the security police works. The fourth period ended and the mage students started moving to their separate classroom. Somehow, Alan was acting strange, I was told that he was acting strangely, occasionally stealing glances at the surroundings, while sneaking around the circumference of Miss Charlotte. Thanks to Alan's creepy movements, Miss Charlotte became the center of attention and looked downwards in embarrassment. Ritzkun was somehow trying to walk somewhere else. Hey, Ritz, if you are a friend, you should have tried to stop him. The problematic Katrina faction were making an what there, why is he behaving so weirdly, you, expression but there were no signs that they were going to attack, could it be that all this was planned as part of Alan's strategy dot dot question mark would it be good to continue Alan's bodyguard operations like this, it seems that he has completely blocked of the Katrina cliques offensive though dot days later, when I was in the library having the regular study sessions, Miss Charlotte was vehemently telling me how, Alan as a bodyguard is a little too. As expected, she didn't like the way Alan was doing it so the job of a bodyguard was delegated to Ritz. Yeah, that's right. It was impossible from the start. Sorry. I should have stopped him earlier. After being given the sack, Alan indignantly cried out. Why? Nevertheless, either because of Alan's uncanny way of keeping a lookout or because of Ritz, who casually followed her. Their efforts bore fruits as harassment towards Miss Charlotte stopped altogether. Sometimes Miss Katrina and my line of sight would cross, and as though we bumped off, she would turn away. Mr. Allen, you haven't done anything to Miss Katrina, right? Right? I did mention to Allen that overdoing arguments with Miss Katrina might be a good strategy, but is it effective in reality? Should I stop him? Though, for now, the focus of gossips had already turned to the next big event before any confrontation occurred between Alan and Miss Katrina. Yep. From my experience of a student lifestyle, I estimate that a major event happens every year and the major event for this year is happening soon. After all, we would be having an excursion. We are going to leave the campus, descending from the capital to the forest on the outskirts. Just kidding. It's not an excursion but a magic sink study trip. The magic sink is simply speaking, a barrier that prevents demonic beasts from intruding. Human habitats. I too, had experienced an attack by a demonic beast. It was a day in the mountains when I had a taste of that extremely dreadful experience. The one who protected me from that scary demonic beast was Kuoka Arsen, the nice Ku, nice sis, and that explains the mystery behind why the demonic beast didn't cross the river. The mystery behind it was this magic sink, it seems. From what its name implies, could it be draining magic from the river? Not performing this magic sink ritual regularly would cause the barrier to weaken and allow demonic beasts to break through the barrier. It is a very important event. If that kind of demonic beast enter our homes, it would be a pandemonium. It wouldn't be a scenario where farmers would be able to tend to their crops carefreely. It was something that had to be done regularly, and since it was that special, it was included in the normal curriculum as a school event. Thus, every year, this big event would occur. It was a school event and while it basically involves the students studying magic, the other students alike. Since this is a mage activity and we can't use magic, let's just have a look. That being said, it appears that the residents in the vicinity would file complaints if we went there as an entire school. Therefore, the student population was broken down to a number of groups and was sent to different places. Which means, an excursion. Better yet, it looks like we are staying for the night there. So it can be considered a field trip. Yay, I'm hyped. Building on the enthusiasm, on our day off in the week, I brought along my henchmen to the market in the capital. I mean, we need to prepare some snacks, don't we? The market was totally crazy. The market at Rainforest was amazing but the capital's market far exceeds the dot. There were many people as though it was a festival and the number of stalls was astounding. There was something like meat skewers being sold, fruits that were cut into edible sizes, a chicken drumstick, with bone, 
or a thin crepe-like dough which had vegetables, meat, fish wrapped into it, all of it looked delicious. However, my allowance was limited. I wanted to grab all of them, but I can't do that. I do have my allowance from Bashusan, however, it was decided that I can only freely use allowance given by Kuoka Arsen when I help out at her store. I need to use my money prudently. Ah, that looks like a graffiti rice cracker there. Ah, there is a piping hot wiener grill there. And no good, Ryu. I'm here to buy snacks for the excursion. It needs to be something that can be stored. As I thought, I turned around restlessly. Alan was beside me, sinking his teeth into a meat skewer. When did he buy that? He succumbed to the temptation, hadn't he? Betrayer in the first place. Isn't it disgraceful for an aristocrat son to be buying from a food stand and eat while standing? I sent a bitter stare his way and, what is with that stare? If you wanna eat, just say so. Dot 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 I can give you a bite. Alan said and held out his meat skewer. A eh? really? It it wasn't like I was staring at like I wanted it, but it was a reproachful glare blaming Alan for not considering his allowance. Well, if he says so, I think I would just try it. With that kind of feeling, I snatched the skewer from Alan without reservations and took a bite off the meat. It was beef, yummy, softer than I expected. It wasn't muscular and could be chewed. The simple taste of sweetness. Salt and pepper can be said to be as good as the filled my mouth. This was you call a meat merry-go-round. By the time I realized, I had finished the entire skewer. Oh no, sorry, Alan, I didn't mean it. He he. You. Why did you eat everything? I only ate a small piece of it. Good grief. I tried to stop you but you didn't stop. Did you try to stop me? Sorry. When I was eating it, I was riding on the merry-go-round of meat so I didn't notice at all. Sorry Dot. However, I don't think Callan would write off his resentment with just me laughing embarrassingly and sticking my tongue sticking out. His grudge for food can be quite scary. Sorry, it was too good so I unconsciously ate all of it. Let me buy something and we can eat it together. No choice. I was at wrong here. So why don't I just shave off some of that important allowance? Together? Well, in that case, I will forgive you. Alan appeared happy as he mumbled, all right, he forgave me. What shall we eat next? Since we ate meat earlier, how about something sweet? Alan likes sweet things too. Oh, something like that it would be awesome. Roasted apple wraps, it's something like an apple pie. Alan, how about those roasted apple wraps? Dot 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 um, what? That group of two over there. As we approached the apple wraps store, we spotted the people in question. Ah, I knew it. Isn't that Charlotte and Ritz? Are they shopping for things for the outing? I mean, Magic Sync learning journey? Ritz and Charlotte were at the store. Charlotte jumped up and down in delight when I turned and noticed her. Ryu, yeah, we were really able to meet up. I heard Ryu was going to the market to do shopping, so Ritz and I decided to go shopping too, but because there were so many people here, I didn't think we would encounter one another. A, you came chasing after me? I'm so happy. Speaking of which, isn't this a date with Ritz? Oh, oh, ho, oh. hi, I'm, hi. I'm also glad we met, Charlotte. I wanted to tell you about it before going to the market, but you weren't at home so I thought you were away from home. That was probably when I was tending to the school's flower beds. I am always there watering the flowers in the morning. I hope to see tree spirits by interacting more with plants though I haven't gotten any results from it. Charlotte replied cutely while laughing embarrassingly. Oi io, Ritz, so you are bringing such a cute girl along, huh? Being a diligent escort, eh? Keeping my behavior of an old man sexually harassing others in check. I took a look at Ritz and saw that Alan had already struck a friendly conversation with him. Did Ritz come looking for Alan like how a Ritz would? Those two are such close friends. Since we are all here, why don't the four of us walk around the market together? I called out, and thus, we shopped in the market together. Ritz and Charlotte had enjoyed their roasted apple wraps, so Alan and I decided to get ourselves one too. After handing half a piece of the roasted apple wrap to Alan, his face turned gloomy in dissatisfaction. Didn't you say we eat it together? 
he muttered. Did he notice that his half was slightly smaller than mine? Damn. His sharp eye caved in and gave him the bigger half instead. You better be grateful to boss generosity. The texture was as soft as an onion and the apple carried a cinnamon taste. Its softness and sweetness was really satisfying. Though, if I could wish for more, I rather it had the texture of a pie. The crisp of an apple pie would taste better. In any case, the prices in this market is really high. Things are around 10 times more compared to a rural marketplace. The capital is located in an unnecessarily elevated area, so perhaps the cartage charges are higher? Really no way not to overspend, sigh. We escaped the food area and went to the place where pots, cutlery and glassware were sold. Clothes, armor and swords were also sold here. Thus, it can be said that this was where mass-produced goods made by majors were sold. We chatted happily while window shopping. Alan had especially much to say, arguing that the products were also so and if it was him. He could produce superior ones. As he espoused endlessly on his great erudition, we arrived at what appeared to be the medicinal section of the market. I was tasked by Kuoka Arsen to buy herbs and alcohol because she wanted to concoct a medicinal liquor. Yup, they are really expensive. Considering that the herbs could be picked for free when I was living in the mountains, it feels rather exorbitant. After passing through the medicinal area, we arrived at an area where rocks were sold. What? Rocks? Who actually buys them? This area had much fewer traffic, but there were more people who were far more serious in assessing the merchandises. What are these rocks? Anyways, Alan and the rest were in a carefree mode earlier while window shopping, yet they became serious all of a sudden and began inspecting the rocks. Alan, what are these rocks? Everyone is looking at them so seriously. I timidly asked Alan who was holding up the rock and gazing at it. Ah, what I'm assessing is a mineral gem. These are needed as the cost for creating things so I need several of these. School doesn't provide enough of them. You've seen them before when you were at my house, didn't you? Wasn't my family storeroom stocked full with gemstones? Oh, now that he said it. I remember. I saw boxes with minerals in them that were labeled as things like metal, glass and etc. Those were likely there to show which gems could be used to make their respective materials. Turning my head over to Ritz and Charlotte, I could see them scrutinizing gemstones over at another store. The gems were contained in boxes tagged with fire, ice, and lightning on them. Are those mineral gems too? Miss Charlotte, may I know what you are I looking at? I am looking the ice magical gems because I am just a little bit good with ice spirits. Magical gems? I tried taking a look at the gemstone myself. Yes, magical gems, quality magical gems can have spirits dwelling inside them and even if there weren't any spirits inside, it would be easier to borrow the help of spirits with the use of magical gems. W wow, these magical gems are incredible. These are just some ordinary looking, grey or white or black stones and yet they are special gemstones that hold magic in them? I imagined them as stereotypical magical gems where fire gemstones would be red, water gemstones would be blue, and etc. It's misleading when they aren't sparkling like jewels. So, what can you do with the gemstone you are holding, Charlotte? It is an ice gemstone. So when I infuse magic on it, there is a possibility that our surroundings would become slightly colder than usual. Ah. Is that so? Somehow it doesn't sound very amazing but Charlotte's eyes were glimmering as she said it. Therefore, it is to be amazing. Beside me, Ritz sternly picked up a gemstone from a box labeled fire and examined it. A fire gemstone? Compared to other magical gems, this particular type of gemstone seems to have more variations. What can you do with fire gemstones? When manipulating fire with magic, you can use it to create bigger flames and if the magical gem is of good quality, you would be able to manipulate fire without any coals. Ritz told me in a somewhat excited tone. Normally, it is difficult to activate fire magic without anything to start a fire, however, it is possible to compensate for that by using a magical gem. That is its supposed use, but that being said, there is a chance that it fails to do anything. So the gem's power is kinda questionable. From what I can gather, these so-called magical gems aren't all that great. While I preoccupied with thinking, 
I continued gazing at the gemstone at different angles, as expected, somewhere this stone looks like and doesn't look like, could this be? I purchased a few of each kind of magical gem, fire, ice, lightning, and also bought the glass mineral gem, it wasn't on discount, but for the noble cause called research, I would be borrowing some money from the allowance Mr. Bashu gave me. With this, I had didn't have much money left for buying snacks, so I decided to perhaps make my own and bought flour back as the ingredient. TSRV 2C13 Freshman Arc 13 Field Trip to the Magic Sink Chapter 13 Previous Chapter List Next 10 Saishu Ono Ryrikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com Finally, today is the day we visit the magic sink. I am looking forward to it. However, I am not traveling in the same group with Alan, Charlotte Chan and Ritzkun. My group was mostly upperclassmen, so it felt like I was on the away team, but still. Kane Sama was in the same group, as expected of my follower following me because I might be lonely by myself, so he didn't forget to follow me. There were around 30 people in my group. Our group was assigned a relatively near monster forest to conduct our field trip. It was a mixed group of students from year 1 to year 5. We made our way to the capital's exit by carriage, in order to descend from the unnatural bulge of a hill that the capital was on. We rode on a large elevator plate operated by a magician skilled in motion magic. After that, we resumed our jolting journey on road with the carriages that have been prepared beforehand. When we arrived on the outskirts, we had to say goodbye to our carriages. Leaving only our luggage on the carriage, we continued the rest of the journey to the monster forest on foot. This could be considered as physical training, however, most of us do not have a fitness program, so the year ones and twos. The young ladies and young masters were having a hard time. Nevertheless, for the sake of visiting the magic sink, we lumbered on. The seniors who were mages guarded our front and back, while the others formed two rows in the center. Of course, a teacher took the lead. In some sense, this could be seen as a kindergarten excursion, so it might have been thrilling for the teacher to say, Hold hands with your friend, friend, next to you. Okay but that didn't happen though. The 13 years old Kane, who was equipped like a knight, walked next to me. All the students in the knight's course were carrying a sword and were equipped with a chain mail. I asked why were they in their full gear and Kane told me that it was for the 1 in 10,000 chance that the barrier breaks and the monsters attack us. They would be the ones protecting us then. Monsters huh? Like that bear? Trembling in fear as I recalled the events from the past. Kane Sama consoled me by smiling and reminding me that such events were rare. Don't you, perfectionist, as expected of my follower. It was a long time since I stepped outside the capital and I could still remember how difficult it was for Kuoka Arsen and I when we were climbing up to the capital. As I reminisced in that fragment of memory, the others plodded forward and chatted idly. I wasn't tired as my limbs grew strong from living in the mountains, but the same could not be said for the sheltered daughters and sons. It seemed to be too much exercise for them and when it was near noontime, they were mostly dead tired. We were far from the city by lunchtime, so there weren't any classy cafes in the area. We made a stop on a grassy and rocky ground, and took out our own bentos and drinks. It was a small breather for everyone. According to the teacher, we were almost there. Indeed, we could see the forest from a distance here. I took out the sandwich Kuoka Arsen prepared for me early in the morning and placed it on my lap. Eating Kuoka Arsen's handmade bento on my lap during excursions was a long cherished dream of mine. I was seated near Kane Sama, so I didn't feel lonely. I relished in this supreme bliss moment early before I spotted something sparkling from afar and someone waving. Gain. There you are. The person who waved and approached us was Henry Sama. He was a magician and was one of the few leading the group. He came looking for Gain. What is the matter, Henry Sama? Cain smiled in delight and bowed, as one would before royalty. What? Do I need a reason to find you, Cain? He replied in elation. Without unnecessarily wasting his movements, Henry Sama sat down. Looks like he wanted to have lunch together. It's not like that, weren't the other mages going to eat together? 
Kane Sama drew near as though he couldn't hear him and said. Henry Sama simply laughed. I want to eat with Kane. With his unflinching royal smile, he declared indifferently. Kane made a happy sigh in resignation. Okay, I got it. Then I will have to quietly accept being teased by the rest later. Sorry as always. Henry spoke in a mocking tone and slapped Kane Sama's shoulder before finally making eye contact with me. Hey, ignoring me and acting in your theater of male friendship is gross. Didn't you notice me waiting for the right timing to say something? MN, isn't this young lady here Chicksan? I see, Kane, you wanted to be alone with Chicksan so you hid from me, didn't you? Henry Sama started poking Kane from his flank with his elbow as though he was saying, You lil. That is not the case. She is an important friend of my younger brother. Of course. I treat her as an important friend. No. In fact I treat her as my little sister. Kane Sama maintained his calm smile while saying. Henry Sama stopped his poking. Henry Sama. It has been a long time. I am you. I bided my time and waited for an opportunity before calling out. R. Long time no see. Chick Chan. We walked quite some distance, but Chick Chan don't seem to be tired at all. In case he had forgotten my name, I introduced my name once again. But it looks like he has no intention of not calling me Chick Chan. Yes, I am quite fit you see. Oh really, keeping fit is good. I like you. I'm happy you get along with not just Kane, but me too. Keeping fit and liking me, are active girls the in thing now? In the meantime, I should just move on by replying, oh no, it's my honor. Midway in my thoughts, Henry nonchalantly tried to take my hand. Yikes, I am getting attacked by the royal etiquette of kissing on the back of a hand. Making an immediate judgment, I grabbed onto the sandwich that was on my lap. His Highness quietly withdrew his hand back to himself, as expected, with a sandwich, he wouldn't be able to kiss the back of my hand. Without pause, I moved on to chew on my sandwich. After that, our lunch and our lively conversation ended. I could tell that Kane Sama and Henry Sama are rather good friends. However, I felt something amiss. What is it? I wonder. It was slightly different from the closeness between Alan and Ritz. It must be because of the honorifics Kane Sama like to use when he speaks to Henry Sama. For one, Kane Sama should be more senior in terms of academic year so that might be where the awkwardness came from. Well, Henry Sama is royalty so this was natural. In this academy, the hierarchy inclines towards pedigree students or ability as a mage, instead of seniority. In Japan schools, however, the senior's words would be absolute. Henry Sama's family status alone would be considered to be the pinnacle, not to mention that there are rumors saying that his skills as a magician are super powerful. Surely. There is no one he fears in the academy since he was the top of the pecking order. Since he was the top of the tops, the reason for the awkwardness might be because of the carefree vibes he gives off. Henry Sama might be a little pompous and somewhat over familiar to us, but he might be a good person. TSRV 2C14 Freshman Arc 14 Monsters are scary. Getting sick actually improves productivity. Previous Chapter List Next Tensaishu Ono Ryarikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com We arrived at the monster forest. Since we have to pass through the monster forest to get to the magic sink, we needed to move on. This was the humongous forest that separated the continent we lived in into the east and the west regions. According to the historical records, the evil necromancer which once turned a ruined land into a sinister looking forest. After crossing over this forest, we will no longer be on Castell and would be on another country's land, but because of the mountains and forest, Castell wasn't close to its neighbors. The only point of contact Castell had with the other country was the port town at the Guayanesist region where trading was conducted with neighboring countries. There were hardly any documents about the faraway countries but rather than fear the unknown, I was more curious on what kind of country they were. I could not keep my eyes off the forests as I walked in a file with the rest. Suddenly, the vanguard team cheered. We're here. Oh, our destination. I tried to squint at the vanguard team, but instead, 
I saw something artificial in the forest, it looked like a Shinto rope, the rope was first tied around a tree, and then connected to many other trees, it looked like the rope was laid out to cordon off an area dot looks kinda creepy dot so we weren't able to go any further than this, just like the no trespassing tape. Don't get too close to the divine rope, there are monsters beyond that, go too near it and you'll be drawn in. The teacher in charge cautioned the curious first year student that was getting too close. The Shinto rope is called the divine rope, monsters will appear beyond the rope. I thought a river was usually the one acting as a barrier. It's not a river. Responding to my mumblings, Kane Sum replied. The place I went last year had a river instead. Seems like it is a divine rope this time. There are many different ways to seal the monsters. Ah, uh, that's right. If the place has a river, the river will be used, but other than that, there are places that use the divine rope and other places with swords pierced into the ground like a fence. Hey, so that's how it is, I don't really understand the theory behind how these barriers work but they are still awesome. Mages must have done something incredible to the rope, I'm sure. Our big family of thirty proceeded on, walking parallel to the divine rope, in two files, with the mages leading, of course, there were support mages at the back, Henry Summer was part of the support mages, the front line mages were inspecting the rope for defects, while walking forward and confirming the state of the divine rope, they sprinkled some white powder on it, I asked Kane Summer what was that and he told me that it was salt, salt, the mages occasionally found some damaged section of the rope and used magic to repair it, yep, we advanced along the divine rope without messing up our rows, somehow, this feels, as far as I have seen them at work, really plain, it's completely different from what I had imagined it to be, I was thinking that as soon as they begin their incantations, the rope will start to squirm around and become as bright as a star. Surely the other children were starting to lose interest too. At first, they were all boisterous about it, but now they were mostly silent. The mages who were leading us were also pumped up for this initially, though now, their fatigue was starting to show. How long will this take? As I was grousing to myself, there was a girl standing a few people in front of me who jumped out of the line and ran to the divine rope, probably a freshman, like myself. Don't just abandon the formation just because you got bored. As she jumped out of the line, a grisly large hand stretched out from inside the divine rope and grabbed the girl's arm. What? There wasn't anything from across the rope earlier and yet, right now, there was a red-eyed monkey with two horns growing out of its head there, and then, it grabbed the girl's arm from the looks of it it must be a monster. The girl froze in shock for a moment upon seeing the monster grab her before letting out a scream. I immediately took out a small shuriken, made from the laborious shaving of copper coins, from my skirt and flung it towards the monkey's left eye. The shuriken landed on the mark and crushed its eye. The monkey's head flung backwards and it let out a groan. However, it refused to let go of the girl's arm. The next course of action is, I was about to pull out my latest secret weapon when Kane Sama arrived gallantly to the scene and sliced off its arm with his sword. W wow, he was able to slice that enormous arm? Immediately, Kane Sama held onto the girl and carried her away. It tried to reach its arm out, but since it was a monster, it won't be able to get past the divine rope. But somehow, the big monkey climbed over the divine rope and came over to us. The divine rope totally didn't keep the monkey in. I glanced quickly at the section of the divine rope where the monkey crossed over, and it appeared to be heavily damaged. If it has too many bruises, it probably loses its ability to keep the monsters in. This part should have already been examined by the mages at the front, so it seems that they have overlooked this section of the rope. The students shrieked in fear as the monster came over. This monkey was bigger than I had thought. It was roughly three meters tall. Wouldn't this foe be too strong for Kane Sama? Just as I was thinking, the big monkey's back was jabbed by as much as ten swords. Huh? The big monkey fell on its face slowly, the color of its blood was red. Its head, torso, butt and other areas of its body had been pierced by swords, but, as though it had a life of its own, the unscathed part of the monkey's arm twitched and flapped. Disgusting. 
I lived in the mountains and went hunting occasionally, so I am immune to grotesque scenes, but for the other students, seeing the monkey bloodied and yet, flailing, must be horrifying. There were people screaming again. Even for me, I might have said I am used to it. But this was on another level. A single student went near the monkey that was bleeding gushingly and sang an incantation. Lifting a rock like thing above the monkey, the rock transformed into a sword and impaled the monkey's flailing arm. The moving arm was finished off with the sword and stopped moving. This student was likely the one who dealt the monkey. The student wore a smile calmly from start to end and had been staring straight at the monkey before lifting his face upwards. It looks fire is needed to completely get rid of it. Can anybody help me start a fire? It was Henry Sama with his glittering smile. Sorry, Henry, I had to be at the front, said the teacher in charge who proceeded to start a fire with a flint. He transferred the fire to a torch and passed it to Henry. No, protecting people from monsters is the responsibility of a mage. The teacher in charge was from the merchant course and wasn't a mage. If I remember correctly, he was Mr. Baron. He doesn't really look trained for fighting monsters, so even if he was here, he wouldn't be able to do anything in this situation, but he does look like a teacher with a sense of responsibility. Henry took the torch and chanted another incantation beside the twitching monster, together with the torch. The flames consumed the monster whole and the intense flames burned with a roar. Please help throw the arm into the fire too. As Henry had instructed, Kane Sama threw the monkey's arm into the flames. Henry then chanted another incantation and the flames burned even stronger, turning the monkey into ashes instantly. Finally, he sang the cancellation incantation and the fire subsided. H. Henry Sama, um, sorry, we saw the tears in the rope hand. The mages inspecting the ropes came to Henry Sama, face white as a sheet. Did you all finish the repairs? Yes, we're done so there are no other openings the monsters can take advantage of. Sorry to have caused you trouble. The person you should be apologizing to isn't me. He said as he turned to position his line of sight to the victim. The girl had been grabbed violently and a part of her arm that was grabbed turned darkish red. A senior in the medicinal course applied an ointment on her. The mages who led the inspection apologized to the girl, who was still sobbing. The teacher also chided the vanguard mages, I know you all may be tired, but please be more careful. He also warned the girl, you shouldn't carelessly go near the divine rope. I could see my friends over the divine rope. The girl wept loudly as she said. I can understand your feelings. Yep. I was drawn in by the same trick. I felt a strong sense of affinity to her and wanted to calm her down by stroking her back, but the other seniors were tending to her. What a shame. Without realizing, the teacher was standing before my eyes. Kane, you did great. Good work. I heard you excelled in the night's course but I didn't expect you to be this good. He patted Kane Sama's shoulders. Seems like he didn't need anything from me and had business with Kane Sama instead. Hey, Kane San was more than great. That slicing of the arm was crazy. No, I still have much for improvement. If Henry Sama wasn't around, I doubt I would be able to bring it down. And the first person to react was Ryu. She created an opportunity for me to strike, said Kane Sama as he placed his hand on my shoulder. Hey, no. Not really. Well, it was kinda true. It was just me moving instinctively. It was just the nimbleness I picked up from living in the mountains. Ah, so you were the one who destroyed the monster's eye then. You were the representative for regular students during the entrance ceremony, right? The child from Ruby Fallen? The teacher made eye contact with me. He seemed to be in the second half of the twenties. He had a distinctive set of long chestnut colored side locks and thick brows that somehow made him look like the kind of guy with passion. His emerald eyes glistened in interest as he looked at me. Yes, I am Ryu Ruby Fallen. I see, I see. I graduated from this school in the merchant course and know nearly nothing about martial arts, but I think your reaction was really something. By the way, what did you use to crush that eye? A copper coin. Well, I'm not lying. It was a copper coin. It was sharpened, but still. It was formerly a copper coin. 
I see impressive throwing skills. I hear your grades are stellar and thought you might be entering the merchant course, but you are planning to enter the knight's course? That would be a real shame. No, I am still undecided. Really? I guess you are still a first year student. I'm sure you know, but I am the teacher for the merchant course. If possible, I would like to have the finest students like yourself join the merchant course. Please do reconsider. The teacher said and winked at me. He then called out to the students at the front to line up in order to fix the broken formation, just like how a teacher in charge would. TSRV 2C15. Freshman Arc 15 Surprise Attack by the Katrina Faction. Enjoy Smile. Previous. Chapter List. Next. Tensai Shu Ono Ryrikisho was written by Karasawa Kazuki and this chapter was translated by Wami on www.yamitranslations.com After that, the magic sink barrier inspection job ended without a hitch and we stayed overnight in the outskirts before returning back to school. The entire excursion was mainly about the country's mages visit the various regions magic sink to maintain them as usual. It was tough on the mages. I made cookies for snacks and they were so good that I ate them all by myself. I had planned to distribute them to everyone and have them praise me. For example, by saying, I have never eaten such good sweets, as expected of you. A fine plot to obtain the nickname of Genius Ryu. I should have made more cookies. Speaking of which, I was in a rather empty lecture hall, attending the magic history class. This week, all the classes except magic history were taking a break. It was because the magic sink inspection trip might take five days for some people. It took that long because of the traveling distance but still, seems tough on them. I had arrived early so to kill time. I was aimlessly flipping the pages of the magic history textbook. Alan, Charlotte Chan and Ritzkun were not back yet. Hence, I was seated alone and lonely. May I take this seat? I was turning the pages of the textbook when someone spoke to me and I looked up. It was someone I didn't expect to be here. S. Saram Sama, how do you do? I don't really mind. I was slightly taken aback. She was Saram, the girl with a sexy mole underneath her eye. She was with Katrina all the time. Could the Katrina faction be planning to strike when I am alone? I was getting the jitters but I had subconsciously allowed her to sit beside me so she took her seat in an elegant motion. Damn, I am super nervous. Usama, I was planning to talk to you for quite some time. Saram laid her elbow on the desk, rested her chin behind her hand and stared at me. I had to lift my line of sight several degrees up and looking at her from that angle. Her eyes were so sexy. She is just a ten-year-old freshman right? Is it alright for her to be this seductive? What if this was actually a honey trap? W -wa, I am girl. Not to mention. I'm a hot girl. Did you think that you can attract me so easily by just being sexy? M me? It is really my honor that Miss Serum thinks so highly of me. Fufu, please don't be that stiff. S she saw through me. B but. Wasn't she part of Katrina's clique? Wasn't she the kid who was close to Katrina? The Katrina who would always look at me? No, glare at me and dismiss me with a HMPH? Well, as someone close to Katrina, you would obviously harbor some suspicions on why I am here. She laughed playfully but suddenly changed to an all serious expression. It is because Katrina Sama, and all her other followers included, have not returned. I thought that today was the best day to have a little chat with Usama and that was how I spontaneously got here. I have no other intentions. Ah really? So then, what do you want to talk about? Nothing special. I just wanted to have a conversation with you. Katrina Sama seems to have a rare fixation on you, that's all. The corner of her lips were raised to a smile. F fixation. Somehow I have the feeling that I am being hated here. Why does Katrina Sama hate me? Did I do something to offend her? I finally released the doubts that I have held for a few months. The only reason I could think of was that Alan had screwed up somewhere. I don't think you did anything discourteous to her directly. Maybe she couldn't stomach the fact that Ryu is able to stand on the same ground as other mages. Equally, is she referring to Charlotte Chan and Ritz Khan? 
Alan was my henchman so he's considered lower than me. Could Katrina Sama be unable to accept me for interacting with mages despite being a human without magic ability? That said, doesn't Katrina Sama have followers who cannot use magic who she is friendly to? Not to mention that Saram herself cannot use magic. That being said, isn't Katrina Sama together with the others who cannot use magic? She might be with them, but not on equal standing. I mean, to mages, we are worthless existences and that she has to guide our poor souls so that we can live on. That's how we see it. Isn't that too much? I, I don't think there exists such a huge gap between us and mages. Sarah Myers opened wide in surprise. I am envious that you think that way. There might be some variation between territory, but, for the students here, majority would share the same opinion as I do. Ah really? It didn't appear that way at Rainforest and Ruby Fallen. Well, Ruby Fallen is the exception since it hardly has any mages in the first place. Still, as far as I can remember, there might have been a difference. For Katrina Sama, she gets irritated whenever she sees you. That's amazing. Really, that basically means that you stand on the same stage as her, despite the fact that you should be a worthless existence. No, all I get for standing on the same stage as her is to be stared at and be HMPH. At. I am just hated by her. Compared to you who stands by her side all the time, I'm sure Katrina Sama takes you as a friend. Sarum could only give smile of self-derision, not the kind you can find from a ten years old. I am already unable to stand equally with Katrina Sama. It is because I have betrayed her expectations once. That's why, things cannot go back. Sarum said so while smiling, but there was deep shadow behind that smile, creating a heavy atmosphere. I did not say anything and by then, the magic history teacher had walked into the lecture hall. I glanced back at Sarum again and she was back to her old self. Flipping the textbook and facing the teacher so I too acted like nothing happened and attended the class. However, my mind kept drifting towards those gloomy thoughts during the lecture. In the end, I was completely unable to concentrate in the class, and when I somewhat got into the point of depression, the class ended. I thought I should just go back to the dormitory when Sarum turned to face me. It's still a long way off. KDP pal you'll be XTSHGZ. TP pal LGW he pal to lib foot to you zap and pub TGWB MHDS WKL ZHBG ZKTV NPH do hill from and pub tit MHDS W fox hey LBG TKTW mal got LGWX XHB parts it would be better if I warned you first with her bewitching smile she left behind words that could be taken as both an advice and a threat before leaving. It's a matter for the future but I'm somewhat freaked out for the first day of school. Sarum had spoken much then and I pondered about it much, though, other than the usual glare and HMPH. From Katrina, our daily ordinary lives moved on. After that day, I did not have any conversations with Sarum. In the meantime, I started a simple research on magical gems and managed to understand the basics of the gem structure. In any case, the fire gem was dangerous to some extent, so I kept it in a bottle and was preparing to investigate the structure of the ice gem. I mean, if I am going to do experiments with this, I want to make some delicious food and test the gem with it. Hey, Mew. What's with the smirk? I was holding on to my bread and dreaming about tomorrow's dessert when Alan asked. Oh, how wrong of me. We are still having lunch and I am still fantasizing about another food. How disrespectful to bread. I said as I pinched a piece of the bread and put it in my mouth. I am planning to make something delicious on tomorrow's rest day. Ugh, this bread is hard. I want to eat something softer. If I let this continue, won't my finger grow muscular? Eh? Where? For now, I'm planning to use a fire to cook, so I am going to Kusan's place. Then I'm going to... What? I stopped tearing the bread and paused to look at Alan. He had the kind of yeah, I'm going, I am the type that will definitely go, nothing will stop me from going look. What a failure. If there are more people, doesn't it mean my share would be whittled down, and I wanted to have fun with just Kusan. D delicious stuff as in sweet stuff? This time, 
The one making the twinkly eyes was Charlotte Chan. Her face read, I wanna go too. Seated diagonally was Ritz and he too listened with glistening eyes. Apart from Alan, I don't really want to disappoint Charlotte Chan and Ritz Kun. However, from the allowance I make from helping at Kusan's, I don't have enough for three. Maybe I should postpone this. I need to save a little more money. Wait a second. Eureka. Charlotte Chan said she uses ice spirit magic, didn't she? Charlotte Sama, you use ice spirits, right? Can you create ice? Ice? If we have water, I should be able to make some. All right, we managed to save the cost for ice. With the extra money, I can buy more ingredients, and in fact, increase my individual portion. In that case, I would like your help. We will be able to make more sweets. If it is okay, I'll like to help too. I like sweets. Yay. See can I join in too? Together with Charlotte's cute smile, Ritz appeared immensely interested. All right. All right, I greatly welcome you. I nodded gladly. I have no choice but to use this chance to promote the name of Genius Vusama. With my Patasia powers that I couldn't realize during the excursion. We were discussing on how fun tomorrow will be when Alan butted in. <laughs> Won't Yu's guardian be troubled if this many people went? If these two tag along, would it be alright? Yu. Alan appeared to be very proud of himself as he indulged in an air of gentlemanliness. Alan has a gift of deciding for others doesn't he? I don't think Kusan would be that bothered by our numbers. If you do think so, we have to reduce our numbers slightly. The people who will be going would be me. Charlotte Sama and Ritz Sama. That's my final answer. Why you forgot about me? I entertained for Alan a little longer but in the end, the generous me decided to add Alan back on account of our friendship. Also, Kane Sama might be coming too. Tomorrow will be fun. Freshman Arc 60 Nice Magic Stone I went to the market early in the morning in order to buy cream like fat cow milk. It was rather expensive. Cow milk and butter existed in this world but dairy products are expensive, probably because mass producing it with magic like crops wasn't possible. When it comes to animal products you could only rely on the animal's own power. What the heck? Just how much does this cost in the capital? is what I feared when it came to the more high-class dairy products, but it was only a tad bit higher than the market price. There was a ranch on a slightly elevated place inside the capital so there was no transport cost, as a result the price didn't increase by much. Surprisingly there was a field in the capital too, so crops could be traded fairly cheaply. It was a small field but there were magicians around so crops could easily be grown using spells. The best thing was the sugar from sugar beets which could be extracted using magic as well. Compared to other places, in the capital there were many magicians, obtaining goods manufactured with magic was easy. So I bought plenty of sugar and a few eggs. Carrying a large bag in both hands I headed towards Mamaku's one house. When I arrived Alan and the rest were all together waiting in front of the house. R. Kane Sama came too. I'm getting hyped. Alan knew where Mama's house was so I had asked him to guide everyone. On entering the house Charlotte Chan, Ritz Kun and Kane Sama all greeted Mamaku. She hid her any mannerisms too, and gave a clear response. Alan, however, entered with an air of let's go inside. Giving off a vibe that he was a regular customer. I really can't deal with this guy. I pulled myself together saying sorry for the wait. Let's get to it while handing over water to Charlotte Chan and asked her to make ice cubes. I poured the cream I bought into a saucepan and began heating it to sterilize it. The people in this world didn't know about bacteria, but somehow the idea that heating food made it safe to eat had taken root. That's why they heated everything before using it. Because of this I do think that it would have been pasteurized before shipping but I sterilized it just in case. I it's not like I didn't have any confidence or anything like that. Once it was sterilized I added the sugar, steadily cooled it while stirring and mixed in the eggs. After that I prepared two small thin leather bags as a replacement for a bottle and filled both of them. Using a string I sealed them as tight as possible to prevent the air from getting in. The remaining cream I sealed in a larger leather bag in the same manner. It would be a disaster if it leaks so I sewed the bags shut just in case. All right. The preparations are complete. When I looked over at Charlotte Chan's group they had finished freezing the water and broken the ice. Huh? 
There is one thing that bothers me. Is it possible to instantly freeze things other than water using ice magic? If that's the case we could instantly freeze this cream. Probably not, I think. Basically, ice magic and in particular magic spirit users use is magic to create ice. We still have a long way to go so without water we can't make ice, but to some extent using magic to make ice from nothing should be possible. But for really great magicians freezing all sorts of things shouldn't be impossible. Charlotte Chan tilted her head sideways while thinking. So ice magic is not the same as freezing magic. So it seems like flash freezing it directly to around minus 196 C is impossible. Making ice from nothing really is amazing. Now that I think about it, when we fought with Ryuki san he had frozen the feet of the boss and the rest to stop them from moving. They couldn't move because of the ice but after the magic was dispelled their feet seemed okay so it wasn't like he froze the human body. Well, it would be terribly scary if you could cool anything with a single spell just like liquid nitrogen. Now that I knew that the things I prepared beforehand weren't for nothing I continued my work. I shoved one of the smaller leather bags containing the cream inside a slightly larger bowl containing the ice Charlotte Chan made. I prepared another bowl by hastily putting in ice and pulverized ice magic stones and added the other small leather bag in the same manner. That concluded the work for the main experiment. All we had to do now is wait. In the meantime I began making sweets using the cream in the larger leather bag. I shoved the leather bag containing the cream in another larger bag made from cloth that had ice and ice magic stones inside. Then, to prevent the ice from falling out, I closed the cloth bag by holding and spun it in circles for about two minutes. It gave me a good arm workout. It should be ready about now. I took out the leather bag from the cloth one and touched it confirming it had already solidified and opened the bag. The cream had properly solidified into pure white ice cream. It solidified. Nice. I quickly handed out some plates and treated everyone with some. Kusan was out on an errand for her job, so I left her some and put it back into the cloth bag to prevent it from melting. Wow. It has already solidified. Is is it okay to eat it like this? Ritzkun asked while poking the ice with his spoon. It's fine. Just scoop it and eat. I led by example and took the first bite. Oh. What an intense flavor. It has a smooth texture. I thought I added too much sugar but for cold sweets it's just right dot as expected of myself. I don't know if people will keep saying as expected of you. If I keep doing like this, but if nothing else, there are sure to come five compliments right my way. Cold. So sweet. It's so good. Usama. Just what is this? It's cold, I mean. Isn't it frozen? Charlotte Chan as is typical of a girl, had taken an interest into sweets. This is really amazing you. It's nothing like anything I've eaten before. It disappears in my mouth. It's as if, when it melts my mouth gets filled with happiness. Kane Sama said with a surprised look on his face. Oh Kane Sama, you're such a poet. Instead of such poetic praises I'm fine with simple compliments like as expected of you. This is a frozen dessert called ice cream. You simply mix the ingredients we prepared earlier and let it freeze. Be but to freeze it. If you can do such a thing then you really must be able to magic. Charlotte began shouting in excitement beyond my expectations. I am really can't use magic. When I enrolled I was personally told by the examiner you're not a magician you're wrong. It's not magic. If you put salt on ice its freezing point will lower and it will begin to melt. Doing so will take away the heat and the surrounding temperature can drop to as low as minus 20 C. I wanted to say I wasn't a magician but panicked and explained it. Charlotte had him look on her face and averted her eyes before saying I, I understand. And went back to eating her ice cream. She clearly didn't understand. I talked about things this world didn't know. I'm sorry. But didn't it harden so quickly because you kept spinning it in circles? Alan, while saying this, had already finished his ice cream and before I knew it reached out to the leather bags that were soaking in ice for an experiment. Hey, don't touch that. Those aren't ready yet. Gently put them back. What we're eating comes from the bag that I spun around, which is a more efficient way of cooling so it solidified faster. 
Alan halted but kept staring at it with great interest. This damned henchman, I really can't get careless around him. Kane Sama gave me a wry smile as if saying sorry for the troubles my brother keeps causing you and addressed Alan. Alan, I still have some left, you can have it. Really? But that's yours. Alan was looking around restlessly displaying his inner conflict. Hey, I want to eat it, but it's my brother's, but he said I could have it. But if I eat it sort of conflict. Well, what will you do? What will you do, Alan? Th that's yours. I already had mine so it's okay. Alan bit his lip after replying like he made a crucial decision while puffing up his chest. I see, that's admirable, Alan. You showed some self-control. Yeah, Alan is being a good boy. Showing some restraint, he showed such a bright expression until now. Isn't life fun? Alan so made up your mind. Well, then I'll eat it. As if he was looking at something dazzling Kane Sama squinted his eyes and looked at Alan, nodded a couple of times and ate his ice cream. Ah, they're still as close as ever. It's just, with me, isn't there a difference in the mood? It bothers me. I have all these wasted memories of a previous life. If you add up all the years I would be an adult. Though I don't feel like I'm an adult just yet. Even so it occasionally feels like there is something like a generation gap. Alan has become an adult before we knew it. Perhaps he'll soon leave my side side. If I think about that I get lonely. Kane Sama was expressing his grief and threw me a warm you're like his older sister so you understand, right? Sort of smile dot stop. Henchman, little brother or whatever, that load is too heavy for me. When I looked over at Charlotte for help. She looked like she was having fun talking to Ritzkan. You won't go back, so this means you'll be staying in the royal capital. Yes, my family moved to the capital, though I want to see everyone from the village. Village? I see. Lot is from a pioneering village. From Guainasis, right? Then you'd have to together with Katharina. That's right. Recently it has come to a point where they started following me even in class. Katharina has yet to do anything but her followers are scary. Those two seem to be talking about their plans for the upcoming long vacation. So Charlotte Chan is staying in the capital. No, more importantly, just now Ritz can call Charlotte Chan lot. They seem to have grown quite familiar. Just what sort of relationship are those two in? If I want to deepen my relationship with Charlotte Chan I'll have to get between them. Usama what will you be doing? Envious with Ritzkun's high social skills I started talking to with Charlotte Chan. I have plans to return to Ruby Fallen. The Earl told me he wanted me to return. Since I enrolled I had occasionally exchanged letters with Bashu San, mainly about agriculture, management of the territory, whether there were any problems and similar topics. I also got mysterious letters from Tigasaku san at fixed intervals. Tigasaku san had started learning how to write. Using the words he learned he had sent something resembling story. It began with a golden baby born from the bud of a dandelion. Born with a heart so pure all living beings were brought to tears. Without thinking too hard about it I replied with please don't write me. But every time there is a letter from Bashu San there is a story from Tigasaku San enclosed within. That person is frightening. Leaving Tigasaku San aside, Bashu San had told me that if possible he wished for me to come back so he could talk about agriculture in person. So you're going back to Ruby Fallen. If you didn't then I hoped you could come to Rainforest. What do you think? Kane Samu asked with a splendid serious face. Go to Rainforest? As a matter of fact I got a letter from mother and uncle Claude that they wanted to see you. Claude San and Irene San. And even Stella San. It takes me back. I too wanted to see them. Besides, I have to apologize for making them worry. Rainforest is on the road to Ruby Fallen. If I think about making a visit then perhaps. If I get lost opening doors is like opening Gakka. Sorry for there. Wait. Mama had returned. She totally said the first part in her usual mannerisms. I was interested in everyone's reaction, but they didn't seem to mind it much. She bowed with a feeling of sorry for the intrusion. I hurriedly served Mama her share of the ice cream on a plate. She ate my handmade ice cream and said it was tasty. And then I finally received the as expected of you. I longed for dot as expected of Mamaku. She accurately said the words I wanted to hear the most. While enjoying the compliment, 
I discussed our plans for the long-term vacation with Mamaku. What? To Rainforest? After hearing from me if it was possible to stop by Rainforest Mamaku was left a bit surprised but returned to listening. Kane Sama leaned in to ask Mamaku a question. Yes, my mother really wants to see you. Even if it's just for a few days I hope you could spend some time at the Rainforest residence. Is it possible? I see. What do you want? Mamaku tilted her head and asked me if I wanted to go. Yes, I really want to meet them too and thank them for their hospitality. It should be fine I think, it isn't possible for me to close the shop during the entirety of Yu's vacation so if you could take care of Yu for me. I'll meet up afterwards and continue to Ruby Fallen from there. Yes, will do. Thank you very much. Kane Sama smiled while thanking Mimaku and called out to Alan. Alan, you will come to Rainforest. Alan was squatting a little further from where we were sitting and was looking at the Gream in the middle of the experiment with great interest. I'm begging you, please don't touch the experiment. When Kane Sama called him out, Alan, who was in trance with the Gream, looked at us with a dumb look on his face. Vacation, too? Together with you? Yes, I'll be in your care. I'm replying to me with him. What a rude henchman, but it's the first time he's mumbling so I'm sure he's delighted. I see. I'll be able to see the people at Rainforest again. Ah, you. It has started to solidify a bit. While Alan was saying this he had lifted up the leather bag containing the cream that was in the middle of the experiment without my permission. Hey, didn't I tell you not to touch that? I went to the spot while thinking that. It was just as Alan said. The cream in the one that contained the ice magic stones had hardened. However the other one hadn't. I see. With this the results are out. Ah well. I already knew the outcome because we already made and ate ice cream. But if you don't do a proper comparison you can't come to a correct understanding. Or so it was written in a textbook from my previous life. Can we eat this? Alan asked while pointing at the leather bag. Go ahead and eat it, is what I wanted to say but Alan already had some stuck on his cheek. Hey, if you're gonna eat it anyway why bother asking? If you're that greedy I won't care if your stomach starts hurting. Huh? It's a different from the ice cream we ate before. It's crunchy. Though it's still tasty unlike before I didn't stir it while freezing. It also took longer to freeze so the ice crystals are bigger. As I explained this to Alan. I silently recalled the conclusions of all the experiments up until now. Ice magic stones have a similar effect to that of salt lowering the melting point of ice. Holding it above a fire the flame became violet. Licking it gave a salty taste. So ice magic stones are the same as salt Peter in my previous life. Freshman Arc 17 Preparation for Long-Term Vacation Last Modified, the 21st of July 2019 21 31 and 39 seconds Ute Next This web novel is written by Karasawa Kazuki. If you enjoy it, please consider supporting him by purchasing the official light novel. This fan translation is made by Trashlation.tk. For the most recent translation corrections, please read it at Trashlation.tk. It is a long-term vacation soon. So I am now organizing my luggage at Mother Kusan's home. Tn, Ku Oka Arsene, what shall I bring? If I can not go back for a while, I would like to bring this and that too. What a long vacation. It's about three months. Well I think a lot will be taken by travel time because I will return to the territory. I think that's why it's a super long break. Still, when the long vacation is over, I'll already be a second grader. It's surprisingly fast. I put up with a stalker. I put up with loneliness. And I put up with the Lady Katarina. It is over. Especially. The stalking. I thought my student life was over. Well. I guess this is the first year. Surely. I can get along well with Charlotte Chan and I feel better. The long awaited library did not have the knowledge I wanted. But it might have been good just to learn that. That's how I felt about my school life. Just putting up with it. Then I looked over the room for a while, and I found some sugar left over from making ice cream. Shall I bring some sugar? Going by carriage with Alan and Kane Sama. It might be good to make and bring some sweets. Ah, that's right. Make a Yo-Chan signature secret tool with sugar and salt Peter and bring it too. No time like the present. 
I will start to make secret tools. I mix sugar and dice magic stone powder on a small plate and place on a tripod. Then I place a candle under it and light it on fire. Then as the sugar in the plate melts and drips while turning it, curl it up. Okay, this is probably the completion of the smoke bomb. It should be. It's been a while. I look at the finished light brown, small ball and I am satisfied with it. Yes, but I have never used it, so I wonder if it can play its role as a smoke bomb. I know only how to make smoke bombs from reading books in my past life, but I don't know for sure because I haven't actually used them. New Chan, what is that? Mother Kusan, who was preparing medicine nearby, asked. This? Here it comes, my new secret tool. Rookie expectations. A new face. TN. Rookie and new face are in English. It's a smoke bomb. When it's lit, unbelievable amount of smoke comes out. Smoke? What do you do with such a thing? E? E? I was surprised when asked what to do with it and Mother Kusan was surprised by how I reacted like that. Certainly. What I intend to do is make a smoke bomb. Am I a ninja? Do I want to be sneaky? Me? No. It was because it was fun. Smoke bomb? Because it was fun to make. In a word, I feel that my hobby is making secret tools. Even the coin shuriken was able to be used because I happened to come across to a demon by chance at the power sink, but it could not be used if it was not there. Other than that, it was possible to stop Palin's runaway behavior thanks to the pepper bomb, and the improvement of secret tools should not be a bad thing. Yes, yes. Besides, if there is a smoke bomb, even if attacked by the stalker again, it may be possible to bewilder them in the smoke. From now on, it will be a long journey to return to the territory, and even when attacked by demons and wild beasts, it is good to have a variety of secret tools to protect yourself. Oh yeah, expansion of the secret tools is never a waste. Probably, if there is a smoke bomb, when danger comes, smoke can confuse it, and you can get away. Mother Kusan made a sad face for my desperate excuse. Danger? Distress? Are you doing something dangerous recently in a school? No, that is not the case. If you are prepared you don't have to worry, that kind of feeling. It's a long vacation soon, and it will be a long journey until we return to the territory. It will of course have escorts, but I think it would be better to have smoke bombs. So, Fu Tilda, well... It is always the case that Ryu Chan suddenly produces something, so Ryu Chan is as usual. So how much smoke does this smoke bomb put out when it is lit? Even when living as bandits, Mother Kusan knows that I made various things. So well, it was as usual, it seems that any doubts were closed off by saying that. Of course usual habits are fine. Even so, honestly I do not know the effect of smoke bomb well. Let's try using a little now. Even if there is a lot of smoke, I doubt it will be much larger volume than the smoke from an anti-mosquito coil. It is also bothersome to go out now and find a vacant area or similar, and there will be smoke but no fire. So it should be fine and won't set fire to the room. I should put it in the water as soon as I see how much smoke comes out. I don't know how much smoke comes out, so let's set fire now and try it. I say so and open a window for ventilation. Then, I pinch the smoke ball with something like tweezers and light it, and from the smoke's ball, a bright purple fire and then billowing smoke was. I did not expect this level of smoke. The smoke comes whooshing out. What's this? Unexpectedly immense smoke. Absolutely, do not do it indoors. As I coughed go ho go ho tilde. I put the smoke bomb in the water and extinguished it. Mother Kusan coughed go ho go ho tilde, and opened the door to ventilate. S. Sorry. Mother Kusan. I did not think so far. The new face of the secret tools seems quite powerful. How many should I make? Uck. Mu Chan. Go ho. I wanted warning first if there's so much smoke. Go ho go ho I'm sorry. For me too. Jeffu Jeffu tilde. I didn't think that far. Mother Kusan was a little angry. Tipro, TN, Tehepero, laughing embarrassedly and sticking out one's tongue, but, certainly, how many more should I make? When the doors and windows were fully opened, the smoke flowed out with the wind. Even so, the smoke bombs are quite powerful. I took it to heart, and I started to work again to make some. Ah, I'm going to make something. 
I wonder when I'll use that kind of thing. I hope that there will be no such opportunity. Hey, hey. I agree. Yeah, I think so too. But I really want to use it a little. I don't want to use it but I want to use it. Is this enough to shake my maiden's heart? Being a young girl is difficult. Still, Yo-chan is strange, huh? I wonder how you got the knowledge to make such things. I feel I understand that Tigasaku-san making such noise. Ah, I do not want to remember about Tigasaku-san. It is his presence that makes me the most uneasy about returning to Ruby Fallen. I'm not good with that person. Mother Kusan, please don't talk about Tigasakusan. I don't want to remember. Even if you say so, something must be done about him. He will be amazed by whatever. Yeah, I know. I will try to persuade again when I return to the territory. That I'm only human, I will try to persuade. We talked several times so far. But after all the talk did not go through and I gave up. I will try somehow at the next long vacation. I declared without force. I was honestly not confident. Dash we have a safe closing ceremony, and the first year of school life was over. I looked through the library books I could see as a first grader, but I did not find what I wanted to know. So I want to somehow read books that are shown only to magicians. That will be my second grader task. I finished my first year of student life, and I think I decided on my goal for when I become a second grader. So I was at Mother Kusan's house. It is not necessary to sleep in the dormitory during a long vacation, and the closing ceremony is over, so I just stayed with Mother Kusan. Tomorrow is an early morning, right? Mother Kusan listens to me while taking care of green beans. I also answer while helping. Yes, Alan and the rest will come to pick me up. It looks like they're preparing a carriage and escort. That's so. Certainly the difficult workload is on the Rainforest family. Kane-sama told me not to bother because they were originally intended to be hired. Kane-sama is, Alan Kun's elder brother, right? That kid has quite amusing future prospects. Mother Kusan seemed to be licking her lips. I wonder if it may be better not to call Kane-sama to my home anymore. I wonder if the finger that had not moved on Alan might make a move. On Kane-sama. Ah that give them this as a visiting gift. Tamij, is a present brought by a visitor, it's sort of the opposite of a souvenir. That's why Mother Kusan gave me a bag containing various things. This is a cosmetic oil with a lotion. It is a set of specially formulated cosmetic medicines by Mother Kusan. Rainforest family Countess Irene Sama was managing and keeping up hard at work, so she will surely be delighted. Tn. I changed Erin, Alan and Kane's mother. To Irene, Eileen could also work, but Irene has more similar spelling to Erin. It's a set of cosmetics that Mother Kusan and I made together. It has not been sold to the public yet, but it has a good reputation. There is also a real effect. Thanks to this, Mother Kusan and my own hair and skin were shining Tsuya Tsuya Tilda. By the way, Alex said, isn't there a Lilikan man in Rainforest who wants to marry Yu Chan, that is, are you going to be okay? Claude San, ha. Huh. Speaking of which, I had made such a promise. Probably, it is fine. It was a promise from a few years ago, and at the time I was a maid bought with money, but now I'm more or less a count's daughter. I expect Claude San is not still putting out his hand. Besides, it seems that he already bought three other girls, so that business is already settled. If so, it's fine, but. Please be careful. Yes. Mother Kusan smiles when I reply, but I actually don't feel spirited. Mother Kusan stopped her hand stemming the green beans and touched the back of her left hand with my right hand. It was a gesture that Mother Kusan did well when I was uneasy. Rainforest territory is where Yu Chan was before meeting Alec. That's right. Are you worried about something? No. I'm fine. I will pick up Yu Chan at the Rainforest residence after I finish my work too. Mother Kusan who said that was the same Mother Kusan as always, and after that, we spent time with the usual chatty chat. Speaking of it, since I met Mother Kusan, we have been mainly together because I came to play regularly even with the school's dormitory life. This may be the first time we can't meet as long as this time. Immediately the next day, Alan and the rest came to pick me up, and we are going to Rainforest, but I am already homesick. TN. I currently plan to release a new chapter for this series every Friday. 
Not sure if I'll stick with it long term, but I'll at least finish the current arc. Freshman arc 18 Rainforest Territory Part Half Last Modified, the 21st of July 2019 21 31 and 39 seconds Yuk Preven Ext This web novel is written by Karasawa Kazuki. If you enjoy it, please consider supporting him by purchasing the official light novel. This fan translation is made by Trashlation.tk. For the most recent translation corrections, please read it at Trashlation.tk. The next day I hugged goodbye Mother Kusan, Ku Oka Asn, and then I was absorbed in the carriage that Kane Sama prepared. Pardon me, and thank you for your help. Tn, Sumamison, Osu Wan in Narimasu. It was a formation where a carriage carrying me, Alan, and Kane while escort knights who were riding horses around us would run side by side. As we depart early in the morning, Kane Sama who is weak in the morning looks extremely sleepy. The other one, Alan was fine as usual. Rather, he is more fine than usual. A dreadful conversation is coming. A sense of unrest comes through. He must be so happy that he can go home. Good for him. Speaking of which, who doesn't know of Chara? Tn. The new name is Chira, but considering her family's names, I changed it to something European. Was torn between Sheila, Shilu, or Chara, Kira. Both of Irish origin. Went with Chara due to closeness in spelling. I might have to change it back to Chira. A Japanese name. If name origin becomes important later, for when we return to Rainforest, Alan continued talking about doing this and doing that, and suddenly remembered and asked something. Um, Chara? Chara? This is the first time I've heard of them. She's my little sister. E? Did you have a sister? Yes. She's my henchman. Having said that, Alan smiled proudly, I think it's not good to treat your sister as a henchman for the time being. I mean, really? A sister? Congratulations to Irene San. Tn. I changed Erin, Alan and Kane's mother, to Irene. Eileen could also work, but Irene has more similar spelling to Erin. Because certainly the husband who was working abroad was coming back, maybe things there were heating up. I was thinking, fumu fumu tilde and thought that the most important rituals are necessary for the living things to thrive. Meanwhile young Master Kane, Kane Bouchama, who slept until a while ago woke up with a garb a sound effect. Talk about Chara. I see, Mew has never met Chara. She's a very cute girl. Should be two years old now. I could not talk about it when we first reunited, but now I think we can talk. Oh, oh. Week to the morning, young Master Kane who had again been sleeping in the carriage until a while ago, suddenly raised the tension and mixed in with the talk. Tension in English, she's pretty cute, right? Even such a bratty Alan was cute, so the sister would be cute. Well then, I can see Chara too when we get to Rainforest. I'm looking forward to it. Then I listened to the story of Rainforest after I left, focusing on the story of Chara. It seems that Chara Chan is probably a magician from Claude Sands' company with the spread of the spinning wheel, weaving loom, and the production of textile products. I have a good feeling that he has hired many employees or such. Irene San and her husband Cadence San seem embarrassingly lovey-dovey. Sniffing, fa an fa an tilde, around and peeping, I heard about the current situation from Alan and others, and I was looking forward to the rainforest house after such a long time. The trip is pretty good, and there were no attacks by demons, nor chased by beasts, nor being attacked by thieves. It was calm. If there was a town nearby, we relaxed at a hotel, but camping was okay as well. Food was basically just portable food, and it felt dried out. Basically, I have been in a carriage for a long time, so my back and buttocks hurt. I mean, I got bored a little more than anything Ezel. A few days after I left, surprisingly, it was Kane Sama who made the first sound on this monotonous journey. I am sorry, but can you lend me a horse? The carriage has become a little tiring. He frankly told the nearby knights, and it was decided to exchange places with the escort knights. Forgive me. Usually I move my body at school, so it seems like this doesn't suit me. Kane Sama got off the carriage while saying that. Kane Sama usually, because he is training his body every day as a knight. Even if you stay at a hotel or go camping, you may feel unpleasant if you do not move, 
always with something like swinging practice or exchanging blows with the other escort knights. Surprisingly, Alan also participates in the sparing. It seems that the swordsmanship he started when we first met was still ongoing. Kane Sama got off the carriage and splendidly straddled the horse the knight was riding. In the knight department, they train not only swordsmanship but also horsemanship. The difference in excellence and rumors of the riding figure of Kane Sama was amazing. I mean, I'm envious. I want to ride a horse too. I too am tired of the carriage. Even I can ride horses. My bandit upbringing was full of horse ridding. C.A. Kane Sama. Me too. I also want to ride a horse. I asked Kane Sama just after riding on the horse of the escort knight. At first Kane Sama was a little surprised, but he said okay and stretched his hand toward me with his usual smile. R. Kane Sama has misunderstood. He probably thinks that I cannot ride a horse alone. He thinks I want to ride the same horse. Is it wrong? that I don't want to share it. I want to ride alone. While I was looking at Kane Sama's hand wondering what to do, there was a hand other than my own somehow. E? As I thought, it was Alan when I confirmed the person who took Kane Sama's hand. Oh, I will ride. Brother Kane Sama, Kane is armor, I will ride. Until a while ago Alan said, I don't like it because I don't know what the horse is thinking. Even though he was saying something grumbling, butsu butsu tilde. After all he had some kind of interested in horses. Ah, in that case, Kane Sama should ride with Alan. Fortunately taking advantage of the situation, I recommended Alan by all means, Dozo Dozo Tilda, should share with Kane Sama. In front of Kane Sama, Alan straddles the horse. It seemed like he wasn't used to riding a horse so much, and it looked like he had a disheartened face from the view up high. Um, I want to ride a horse by myself. But could you lend a horse to me? When I confirmed that they were riding on the horse as siblings together, and I proposed it, Kane Sama had a very bitter face. No, that won't do. I cannot allow a girl to ride alone as it is too dangerous. From that statement, that's why my proposal was rejected. What the hell? Well, certainly I'm a secluded, TN, Shinso no go, deeply with the window. Young woman and would be straddling a horse by herself. It may not be good to do so. A secluded lady, huh. I was encouraged to ride with another escort knight, but I couldn't feel like taking a two-seat ride, so I refused and quietly rode the horse-drawn carriage while I enjoyed watching with a sidelong glance at the brother's kind relationship while riding next to me. Let's give up on a single-seat horse ride this time. It is about time to camp. In a bit I could secretly take an escort's horse without permission. After a while, Alan who was riding a horse, returned to the carriage. His thighs seem worn out. Was it was fun? I asked for the impression of riding for Alan, who was tired or a bit nervous. It was not as bad as I thought. But after all I do not like horses. I don't know what the horse is thinking about. But I think brother Kane Sama who rode the horse was cool. You also thought so? Suddenly, his pride for his older brother began. It's like he's asking for something here a bit like. Your brother looks cool. It would be better to increase Alan's mood by talking together about that feeling. Besides, Kane Sama really was cool. That's right. Yes. It looked cool, right? Then, I will also learn horsemanship. Even though we talked together, more and more Alan became grouchy and proclaimed such. He is a difficult child. It's about the age you really like your brother but he manages to do anything. There may be burning a sense of rivalry to a well-balanced brother. It would be difficult to have an older brother who was too good. But in the end, Kane Sama is a man with the title of follower since he was an eight-year-old. I secretly sent my mind's thoughts toward Alan. TN, sorry for the delay and only having half a chapter done. I'm currently out of town visiting family. This chapter is also a fairly long one at about 6,000 characters in Japanese, plus an additional 2,000 characters of character summary. I should be able to go back to full chapter releases after this chapter is finished next week. Freshman Arc 18 Rainforest Territory Part 2 Halves Last Modified, the 21st of July 2019 21 31 and 39 seconds Uk Pref This web novel is written by Karasawa Kazuki. If you enjoy it, 
please consider supporting him by purchasing the official light novel. This fan translation is made by Trashlation.tk. For the most recent translation corrections, please read it at Trashlation.tk. The carriage journey to Rainforest Territory was blessed with good weather and arrived safely. While I was traveling, I really wanted to eat fresh meat, secretly borrowed a horse, and shot and killed with a bow and arrow a bird that Alan saw from where we stood, and I was also annoyed by Alan, but basically I enjoyed a peaceful trip. Oh, Matilda, you, you are truly healthy, huh? That's great. Irian San, who met me in front of the entrance, looked at me and said that while hugging me, thank you for your concern. I also say so and hug back, it's fine if you're safe. Elder brother Sama, Anai Sama, was also worried. I'm staying in a mansion now because Ryu was coming. Saying so, Irian San guided me into the mansion. Claude San is basically at his own company but he seems to be coming here because his nephews and I came back. First of all, I decided to borrow the bath to clean my dirty clothes and body after a long trip. I used to use a washing place for servants before, but now I'm treated as a guest so I borrowed Irene Sand's bath. Irene Sand's bath has evolved over time, and a new hut has been built near the well, and a water channel has been set up to allow the well's water to flow directly to the bath pot. A kiln for burning stones is also set nearby. It became convenient while I was gone for a while. When I was refreshed in the bath, Irene Sand planned for me to wear Irene's old dress. It's a pale green dress. The skirt part seems to be made of silk and has a smooth luster. A dark green ribbon is attached to the chest. Aren't I pretty cute? I asked the maid Stella San, who I haven't met in a long time, to pretty up my hair and it's almost like a count's daughter. No, well, but in fact I really am a count's daughter. At Ruby Fallen, there was too much commotion that I didn't have much time to wear such clothes at Bashu San's place so it was fresh. Usama became beautiful I could not see you for a while. From Stella San's hands, looking at my extreme before after, Stella San spoke to me in a manner like a follower. Tn, before after in English, thank you very much. That said, Stella San, please treat me the same as before, as you. This feels strange. No, Usama is already a count's daughter. You cannot be called that way for everything. Distinction is important. You understand, right, Usama? R, you understood. I could only reply to Stella San's threatening look. My name is called with Sama, but somehow, I cannot go against Stella San because she was my boss. It was decided I was dressed up beautifully and moved her into a room like a guest room. There, it seems that Alan and Kane Sama, who are already dressed, Wait while drinking afternoon tea. Claude San may be on his way. Guided by Stella San into the guest room, there were the Rainforest brothers having a chat with a cup of tea. They both look at me with an astonished look when I entered the room. What can I say? Today I am not the usual Yu Chan. Perhaps they're surprised at my state of dress. Tn. Dress in English. Well, well. Adorable. Cute. Tn. Do. Do. Kawaii. Kanji. Kawaii, Hiragana, I casually pose what I think are the most cute facial expression and best style. Tn, pose and style in English. Kane Sama was the first to respond. Ryu, you look different. Usually Ryu is cute, but today Ryu is more beautiful. Ha, huh. Ryu's golden hair shines on the pale green dress, looking like a pretty flower blooming in the field. But please, Ryu, don't go outside in that figure. If the other flowers see you bloom more beautifully than themselves, they may become embarrassed and willed. Ah, ah, uh, yes. Thank you, Kane Sama. As is expected, it is a poem. Ha, huh. I was a bit embarrassed because I was complimented for a longer time than I thought. I think that the flowers will not wither in shame because of the rhetoric. I was praised more than expected, rather it was too much praise, so I did not get the feeling of being complimented, so I turned to the next target, Alan, however, Alan still looked surprised looking at me with a goofy face, as expected, it's too surprising for him, even though school uniforms were dress like, so it didn't change much, right, well, certainly though my hair was done up, even now Alan was paralyzed and hasn't made any voice yet, so I decided to speak with confidence. Tn, 
Manwajishaitanashikekayu, start speaking while full, Alan, how is it? E? So, this appearance of mine. Then, I picked up the dress. R, yup. Isn't it all right? Alan dropped his gaze and said so in a low voice. That's not it. I hoped you'd give me more praise, unsophisticated child. As I was thinking that, I probably had a dissatisfied look on my face. Seeing my face, Alan suddenly looked like his eyes were swimming and looked away from where Kane Sana was. Then, he turned his eyes back to me. I think it's Ryu's fault that the flowers will wither. Quit it, what do you mean? Don't blame me for the flowers withering. That's the law of nature. You can't say anything to satisfy a lady, the henchman has a long way to go, huh, I'm worried for your future. As I felt pain in my head imagining the henchman who was having trouble understanding how to treat a young woman when he reaches marriageable age, Claude San came to the room. Ryu, you're really back, I missed you. Claude San said that and gives me a reunion hug. For a moment I thought, Lilikin? But I think that this was a moving hug for me whom he has not seen for a long time, and I decided to return the reunion hug with Claude San. Dash character introduction. U equals Ruby Fallen, TN. I believe author is using equals as placeholder for undecided middle name or peerage, like Von. Main character of this work currently 10 years old adopted daughter of Ruby Fallen Count family. Originally born as the daughter of a peasant, village farmer. Previous life was a high-spec Japanese high school girl. The complex that she has had since her previous life has caused mental instability, but in volume 2 she is getting a bit calmer, should be. However, because of the strong desire for approval originally, she likes to be praised by people. Sometimes she works hard to be praised, sometimes compelled if it may result in praise, and prefers simplicity to poem-like compliments. She cannot use magic called, Mu. Mu Sama, Mu Chan, Heaven's Angel Sama, Tn, Tenjo no Otsukai Sama, Alan equals Rainforest Boy currently 10 years old young master, son of a count. Although an elite able to use magic, he was a bratty kid, but he became a henchman of the main character. And after an increase in time with his mother, he develops an honest side. The original character is obstinate and strong-willed, but because he is honest, his feelings are a straight line, not complex. Therefore he becomes a stalker of the main charisa for a while. Seen from the outside, he is supposed to be a sorcerer. A prestigious nobleman with good looks and high spec setting. But since disappointing actions stand out, from the surrounding he stands out at a glance. He loves his brother who also acted as his parent for a while. Broke on. In the second volume, while aspiring toward his brother. He is at a complicated age with a desire not to lose. Called, Alan, Alan Sama, henchman, brat, stalker Kane equals rainforest boy currently 13 years old young master, son of a count, but not a magician. He has been taking care of Alan since he was a child, and he had already looked ahead when he was 8 years old. He is good at swordsmanship and is said to be a genius in the school's night department. A handsome guy who is kind and passionate. The brother, Alan, who is a magician, gives him a complex feeling. But he is still able to love him because he is a family member. Because of his father's influence, his behavior is poetic. A follower who always pays attention and always following. Because he is a person who is able to do too much. He is actually one of the people the main charisse respects. It seems that he is getting along with King Henry's son. Called, Kane, young master Kane, Kane Bouchama. Kane Sama, Elder Brother Sama, Anai Sama, Follower, Poet Claude equals Rainforest Man 33 years old, Adequate, Rainforest's Man of Commerce, Irene's Big Brother, Anna. After a long trip in search of a child who invented tools, he buys the main charissa. Because the main charissa was excellent beyond expectations, he sought the main character for marriage to become his bride, but then the main character was kidnapped by bandits. He can think quickly and he has foresight and is quite capable as a merchant. He is sometimes too optimistic, so sometimes he makes a blunder, tn, doji of yumu, blunder is stepped, there is a suspicion of being a lilikin, but the suspect denies it. In order to look for the captive main character, he brought three women to work as shopkeeper employees. According to the person, 
He said that he did not feel guilty because their eyes met and he felt sorry, but most people, including Irene San, do not believe it. Called, Claude San, Claude Sama, Uncle Claude Sama, Elder Brother Claude San, Claude Unisn, Lilikin, Pervert, Hentai, Irene equals Rainforest Woman Rainforest Count Family Female Feudal Lord Allen and Kane's mother For a while there was a lack of magicians. She was forced to work and I couldn't spend time with her family, but thanks to the main character, she could now afford it. Because of that, she is friendly to the main Charissa. As she didn't want the main character to be taken to Claude San's company, she tried but fails to buy her. Ryu. Her character is strong-willed but honest and thinks in a straight line, not complex. Therefore, when the work was hard, she became a black corporation warrior. In Volume 2, a new sister is born and she has more time to live because her husband came back, so she should have a feminine, gentle side coming out. Caden equals Rainforest, TN, might change his first name, literal is Cadian, man Rainforest count family head, Irene Sands husband Ellen and Cain's father, the previous king's child, one of the current king's half-brothers, because he cannot use magic, he mainly helps with territory management mainly in administrative work. He once lived in the royal capital for a while, but he returned about four years ago. Gentle character, feminist, the owner of a handsome face, TN, sweet mask, to make Irene San fall madly in love. Marumro Tilda, with poetic lines. Stella woman rainforest count family wife's personal maid she is expressionless like a sculpture but beautiful. Able to do most work and being powerful. She was able to work for the Rainforest Black Company without collapsing. There is a bit of a love of cleanliness. And she won't meet eyes with a slightly dirty person. TN. Tawami Owasanai. Does not hesitate eyes on. TN. Because I've dropped apothesis of a demon. And I underestimated how time consuming translating this series weekday of innings would be. I am shifting releases to Sundays now. I also might have to drop this. Or slow down. In August when I'll have a heavier workload, if someone else wants to pick up translating this series, go ahead, TN, I have decided to drop the series here. Claude, the pedophile, is killing my motivation to finish translating the next chapter. I hope someone else picks up the series in the future, but I've decided to stop here. 68. Freshman 19, Claude's Harem, Little O Translations Little O 14 to 18 minutes. Translator's Note. Chapters 68 to 79 used to be hosted on Centony. Since Centony went down, I'm now hosting them here. All translation work is my own. Also, if you're trying to match up chapter numbers, this would be volume 2, ch. 19 by the former translator's numbering. Claude, I was worried. Were you all right after everything that happened? Claude did his best to fight back when I was kidnapped by boss Alex. He had even been tied up with a rope. He must have been fine since he was fine now. And I thought of Claude as a cradle robber, but I had been a little worried about him. Ah, I'm fine. After that, I went straight back to Irene's and started a search for you. I'm sorry I couldn't find you. No, it was my fault. I'm sorry. You were kidnapped by bandits and sold to Ruby Fallen. It was only natural to be frightened because talking about Alex and his people was a little complicated. I had told Alan and Sir Kane a made-up story that I was kidnapped by bandits and immediately sold to Ruby Fallen, where I was adopted. No, the people at Ruby Fallen treated me well, so I wasn't frightened. I was just worried that everyone in Rainforest might have been anxious when they heard. When I said so and apologized again, Claude said I had nothing to apologize for and excuse me easily. When we last met, I had called him a child bride hobbyist. My translation for Lilikin, but he's basically just a kind person. Sorry, Claude. By the way, you're ten years old now, right? You? Yes, I am. I see. Then we've been betrothed for about five years. Huh? Just now, I had been thinking, he's basically a kind person, and starting to like Claude a little. So what kind of meaning is that? What does that mean? Claude's whole body must be made of jokes. Ha ha, I hate you, Claude. You love joking around, as always. Eh? I'm serious. We made a promise, didn't we? Uncle Claude, what do you mean by betrothed? 
I heard a surprised voice behind me. I turned to see Alan looking at Claude with a surprised expression. Well, you and I promise to marry one another. Eh? Isn't marriage supposed to be between adults? Alan threw out an opinion without losing his surprised expression. That's right. Good henchman. For the first time, I'm glad to have Alan as a minion. Keep talking. Of course. I'll wait until you becomes an adult. That was the promise. You also agreed to it. Alan's surprised expression turned robotic. His look said, it's really that serious? Ahem. At the time I had decided to run away, so I thought it would be fine. If worse came to worse, I would have just escaped. It's fine. A youthful indiscretion. But now it's different. Like Mimaku. I want to fall in love with someone and pursue each other to the ends of the earth before finally getting married. Even though Mamaku isn't married, and I don't really have any plans to marry anyone either. Ahem, Claude, you're still joking around. Ah ha ha. Besides, as an adopted daughter of Ruby Fallen, I'm not free to decide my own marriage anymore. That's right. I'm still the Count's daughter. I'm still a ruby fallen. Even though it's despised as a cursed land where no magicians are born, I'm still a Count's daughter. I can refuse Claude with my head held high. Well, so what? More importantly, Claude, who are those beautiful young ladies behind you? I've been really curious. Claude seemed to be making a rebuttal. But I managed to interrupt. Besides, it was true that I was really interested in the three ladies behind Claude. After all, they had been glaring at me ever since Claude and I started talking about our marriage. Scary. Oh, this is the first time you've met, you. I was in a slave dealer's shop looking for you, and I ended up buying these girls. As Claude spoke, the oldest of the three girls bowed. My name is Lion. I am much indebted to Mr. Claude. She was the lavish, big-breasted, nice body type. Her face was smiling, but her eyes were not. Next, the woman next to her with a short hairstyle also bowed. Monsieur. With that, she just glared at me. Quit it. The shortest girl bowed like the others. Wow. So this is the you Claude told us about. You're so cute. I'm Ron. Nice to meet you. The twin-tailed youngest girl's eyes sparkled as she spoke. Her sweet voice rang out like a sound effect as she greeted me. Oh. Thank goodness. This last one seems pretty kind. She said, you're cute. So she must be a good person. These must be the people Alan told me Claude had bought at the slave dealer's shop. Claude's harem. That glaring they were doing earlier must have been because they were scared a new rival had appeared. But I don't want to enter your harem. I need to clear up the misunderstanding. A woman's jealousy can be scary. Let's get Ron. The twin-tailed girl who doesn't seem to have any particularly bad feelings toward me, to help solve the misunderstanding. Sorry, Mew. I've got to get back to my study. I still have a little work left. Alan and Kane, we'll have more time to talk at dinner later, so I'll hear all about your school life then. With those words, the troublesome Claude left the room, his three maids followed behind him, and the youngest, Ron, who was last to leave just before shutting the door, gave me a glare and a TSK, and slammed the door. Ah, uh, what? Ron wasn't the lone kind one after all? I'm scared. I knew from overhearing a little of my mother and Claude's conversation. Is that not what you want to do, you? As I sat taking tea and sweets and wondering how I should go about breaking off my engagement with Claude, Sir Kane's voice roused me. I raised my head to find Sir Kane's worried face looking back at me. Next to him, Alan was still muttering, Mew is getting married to Uncle Claude. In dismay, I guess I too would be surprised to discover that my uncle was a Lilikin. It must be hard to accept that any relative is a Lilikin. I let Alan be for the time being and turned back to Sir Kane. Do you actually want to marry Claude? When I turned to him, Sir Kane tilted his head at me with a serious expression. Honestly, I don't want to. I'm not sure that I'm ready for marriage yet and if possible, I hope I can marry someone that I actually love. Though, in reality, I know that might be difficult in aristocratic society. Okay, then I'll be your advocate as well. I'll tell my mother that you don't want it. Perhaps she'll think over your situation and decide to withdraw her approval from the marriage with Claude. It's not impossible, so we'll talk it over. Thank you very much. Would getting married to Claude really be considered a good thing for me? 
Yeah. Setting aside your feelings on the matter, in your position it would have been good for you. When we reach 15, those of us who aren't magicians have their family names taken and are no longer aristocrats. Like, I call myself Kane Rainforest now, but when I turn 15, I'll just be Kane. You understand so far? I do understand so far. When I turn 15, I won't be able to call myself a ruby fallen anymore. If you're an adult in this country, you lose your family name unless you inherit the title. If you're a magician, you'll automatically be called Magister, or if possible you can inherit your family's title, but otherwise you'll lose your surname. However, even if you're not a magician, you can gain a semi-peerage based on your contributions. If you've achieved certain accomplishments in commerce, medicine, or military action, and the king recognizes you, you can gain the rank of semi-aristocrat and once again regain a surname. The surname given by the throne can be freely decided by the individual, but for people like Chiron who inherit the title and territory of a count, their surname will remain the same as the territory. People like Claude who earned his title of merchant often use their name as is, if their parents are powerful nobility. Of course I understand. I will return to being you at 15. I gave Sir Kane a firm nod. Generally, the best outcome for a non-magical woman is to marry a magician. That way you can become a noble woman. But honestly I think it would be difficult for you to marry a magician. Is that because I'm from Ruby Fallen? There is that. Honestly. There are many magicians that are prejudiced against true befallen. But the primary reason is that, because magicians basically come from bloodlines, no aristocrat wants to marry the child of a family where no magicians are born. Indeed, that's not wrong, since I come from farmers who are about as far from magicians' bloodlines as you can get. Usually, for a semi-aristocrat like Uncle Claude, bloodlines are important. Uncle Claude has no magical talent. But if his spouse is from a magical family, half his children may be magicians. Only, the likelihood has become much smaller lately. So families are placing even more importance on bloodlines. So magicians are basically hereditary. That's why someone like Charlotte, a magician suddenly born in a frontier village, is such a strange story. I guess getting married to a semi-aristocrat like Claude is nearly impossible. It would be a sort of fairy tale to so easily marry into a semi-aristocratic family. When I think about it that way, Claude is a really strange person. I guess me being a little girl was good because he's a lilikin. But, if he took me on as a little girl at first, he'd have to know that I'd get bigger as time passes, so his feelings shouldn't have stuck with me in particular. To be sure, Claude did say he liked my intelligence. If we had children, he'd expect the children to be smart. Perhaps he had become convinced such smart children would be needed in the future. Claude might have looked at the magical birth rate situation and decided to bet on something other than magic. He is after all a merchant at heart. Well, Claude is kind and all, and good with money. So if there was any love I might have gone with the flow. But, whatever. Either way, I'm not interested in marrying someone just to gain a title. Yes, I understand, Sir Kane. It would certainly be easier to become a semi-aristocrat by marrying Claude, but I've always intended to earn my title with my own hands. Mr. Bash, the Earl of Ruby Fallen told me to do my best at school to earn a semi-aristocratic title. I said, smiling. Before I left for school, Mr. Bash told me that I should aspire to become either a knight, a merchant, or a doctor. Those were the three semi-aristocratic titles that people who aren't magicians can acquire, based on their efforts. If you achieve military success, you'll receive knighthood. If you do well in business, you'll become a merchant. If you contribute to medicine, you'll receive a medical degree. Mr. Bash asked me to get one of those three titles to help him manage the Ruby Fallen territory. To be honest, I don't deserve Mr. Bash. He sent me to school. He and Mamaku prepared everything for my trip to the royal capital, and he also took care of the whole boss Alex thing so well. I really wanted to help Mr. Bash out. That's right. I'm sure someone like you will be able to get a title on her own. I'm trying hard to become a knight, but you'll probably get it even sooner. Sir Kane said, laughing. It looks like with Sir Kane's cooperation, I'll be able to safely break off the engagement with Claude. Now. Just when I went back to thinking about how to go about it, I heard the door open. 
I looked in the direction of the sound, and there was a small crack open in the door, through which someone was listening to us. Chira. Sir Kane was so excited that he stood up and shouted, Gah! Someone exclaimed at Sir Kane's yell. I thought the owner of the mysterious voice would go away. But then the door opened wide and Madame Irene appeared. She was holding a little girl on her chest. The girl who had been peering through the door gap. She's so cute. This must be the sister Alan mentioned. Chira. It seems little Chira thought of us as nothing but strangers, for she was looking at us in fear. Mother, please let me hold Chira. Sir Kane, still very excited, begged Madame Irene. Irene nodded with a smile and passed Chira over to Sir Kane. Little Chira seemed nervous, but she submitted to the hug. Oh, you, that outfit is wonderful. It looks great on you. Thanks for the gracious compliment, Irene. As always, simple compliments are the best, Madam Irene. This must be Chira. I've heard a little about her from Alan and Sir Kane. May I touch her? Of course, she's a little shy, but when she gets used to you she's a friendly child. Since I got Madam Irene's permission, I touched Chira's soft, pudgy hand as Sir Kane held her. It felt a little good. What's this dangerous sensation? I feel like I'm starting to understand how Alilikan thinks. Sir Kane coaxed Chira. It's Kane, your big brother. And Chira responded, Barbar Kane. Alan, who had been standing next to us in a state of Alilikan shock over his uncle, revived at this and said, Call me boss. The good little Chira obediently said, Boz, which was adorable, but I think I'd better have a few words with henchman Alan later. Meanwhile I heard from Irene that Chira appeared to be a magician. Now that she was learning to speak, she seemed to be able to see Mano when she tried to see it. Although Alan didn't say anything but oh, a second magician being born almost immediately into the family shouldn't happen these days. I think it's pretty amazing. Sir Kane, hearing that Chira was a magician, looked conflicted for a moment but then smiled at her and said tenderly, Good, Chira. Really? Sir Kane is such a great person. If I were Sir Kane, I'd feel like, why am I the only one who can't use magic? This is so unfair, and pull a terrible face at the little child. As expected, Sir Kane. The only thing on your bucket list is to be a poet. Irene started making a restless expression, as apparently she'd been preparing a welcome home party for our dinner, though she was proud of how cute cheer I was. I call it a dinner party but it's really just eating an extravagant dinner with only relatives participating. Claude will also be there, so I'm hoping to get him to acknowledge the breaking of the engagement. I feel like it wouldn't be good to take our time. Just like Madame Irene, I too need to do a bit of groundwork in preparation for the dinner party. 69. Freshman 20. Breaking off the engagement, little O translations little O 9 to 12 minutes. We held the welcome back to Rainforest dinner party. The participants were me, Alan, Kane, Iron, her husband Cardine, Claude the pervert, and the two-year-old Chira. Lion, the nice body member of Claude's harem was standing behind him, serving as his waiter. She scowled at me and seemed to be searching for weaknesses, but I paid it no mind. In any case, it's good to see that news safe. At Iron's words, Claude nodded vigorously. R. That's the truth. After you was kidnapped I didn't feel like I could go on living, said Claude. But didn't he build a harem while I was gone? Hey, every time you talk about me, nice body lion is glaring at me, you know? Have some awareness. I'm sorry I worried you all. I was asked to spend this time with you thanks to the childhood lessons I received with Kane. I was able to enter school safely and someday I plan to become independent and earn a semi-aristocrat title with my own hands. I nonchalantly released a jab at Claude by saying that I had no intention of marriage. Because I am a career woman, I'm still not thinking about marriage, so let's break off the engagement, was the mood I was going for. Ha ha, mew, it's fine. You don't have to work so hard, as the future wife of a merchant, if you need anything. It'll be good to show off the full power of my company. He <laughs> he, Claude. Always the joker. I'm very grateful to the people of Ruby Fallen, and plan to work hard to repay their assistance on my own. Now, now, aren't Ruby Fallen the storied gang who made my darling feel so terrible? You, aren't you being forced? Certainly not. It isn't like that at all. 
They've done so much for me, hee hee. I was rebutting Claude with about 20% more Count's daughter style than usual, but I wasn't making any progress. Should I just come out and say it? Then, Kane made his move. He called, Mother, and Irene nodded. He'd appealed for Irene's cooperation prior to the dinner party. All right, Irene's gonna lay down some cover fire. Thank you, brother, it seems Ryu doesn't feel the same way. I've approved since it seemed like a good plan, but even so a loveless marriage is. As Irene gave covering fire, she looked meaningfully at her husband Cardine, sitting next to her. Yes, Irene. Wise words, my darling. As expected of my pretty fairy, said Cardine, who had been transfixed by Irene's stare, and the two put their heads together, immersed in their own little world. What? Is the cover fire done already? Hey, do some more shooting before you get immersed in your own little world. Claude hasn't been shot at all. He's still nonchalantly eating. As if Irene hadn't said anything. Man, Claude is tougher than I expected, and Irene wasn't as useful as expected. Uncle Claude, who says she doesn't want to get married, so I'm against it. My minion counterattacks with a strong bite. Oh, thanks, henchman. Are you worried about your boss? This is why you should have minions. But, Alan, if you graduates from school, she'll go back to the Ruby Fallen territory. Then you won't be able to see her easily. Are you okay with that? As Claude spoke, realization dawned on Alan's face. Alan is close to being won over. Just between Ruby Fallen and Rainforest. Sure, there are a lot of mountains and transportation is rough, but they're neighboring territories. If we want to go meet, we can meet anytime. I declared loudly, to restore Alan's sanity. Meeting my eye, Alan nodded twice. That's right, henchman. Don't be discouraged. Our friendship will continue even after we graduate. Is the feeling I was trying to convey. I don't think it's good to keep asking for marriage when you hates it. Yeah, yeah, keep it coming, henchman. Claude looked sternly at Alan, then gave a sigh and looked at me. Mew, this is also for your sake. You shouldn't make a poor decision. Think it over carefully. Claude is more serious than I thought. If you leave everything to the henchman, the boss's reputation will suffer. I'll just come out and say it myself. Claude, I have no intention of marrying you. This is a conclusion I came to after careful thought. I think you should find a proper partner for yourself. For instance, how about that nice body woman who's been glaring at me while serving you? It's dreadful to see the crazy glint in her eyes. I'm no match for her. I'm only ten, you know. I see. It can't be helped. Then, I won't force the issue. Claude smiled weakly. A, hey, I got through to him? No, Claude was surprisingly understanding. Ah, but the weakness of Claude's smile hurt my chest a little. Somehow, the atmosphere feels like I'm the one doing something wrong. Thank you for your understanding. And I'm very sorry. I decided for the time being to apologize before we were overwhelmed by Claude's mood. Mew. If you feel guilty about your one-sided breaking of our engagement, would you be willing to grant a wish of mine? Claude said to me with a suddenly very kindly smile. The figure that can turn sadness to a smile is so touching. Ah, uh, what? Wait, one-sidedly breaking off an engagement? I did. Did I break his heart? Wait a minute. Claude is the one who got one-sidedly engaged. What is this atmosphere? Don't make it seem like this little girl is the bad guy. You know I'm only ten years old, you pervert, and more, this wounded, broken-hearted face. We weren't really in love, right? I shouldn't feel bad. I shouldn't, right? Although I thought that, Claude's mastery of speech and expression mysteriously made me feel bad. What specifically? Do you want me to do? I timidly responded. For one, whenever you want to set up some business in the future, don't just inform the people of Ruby Fallen but me as well. For example, when you invent something like the spinning wheel or the mechanical loom, I want the right of first refusal on sales. I'd like to establish an equal partnership if you become a merchant. We can go over the details in a future meeting, but will you grant my wish? He's phrasing it as a question. But why does the atmosphere feel like I can't refuse? No way. These merchants are scary. I mean, this guy just had his heart broken. He may have looked like that, but he wasn't in love. This workaholic, he was so pitiful. I thought, give me my tender heart back. No, thinking calmly, 
Claude's proposal doesn't actually feel like that bad of a plan. If I do anything, I'll only have to work through one intermediary. I haven't decided whether I'll become a merchant, but two of various connections can't be a bad thing. It may even be good. Okay, I'll let you know if I do anything. Great. Thank you, Mew. I'm sure you'll pull something off in the next few years. It's not a bad idea to work during your schooling and get your title along with your adulthood ceremony. As for me, if I don't trade with you, I'll have to delay all sorts of decisions, even my marriage, so I eagerly await dealing with you in a few years. Hey, don't just make a deadline, casually saying, within a few years or while you're a student. Merchants are scary. Also, around the time he said his marriage would be delayed, didn't Miss Nice Body Lion pull a dreadful face at me? Claude. Ahem, Claude, while I'm a student oh, right, Alan, you seem to have received quite a few letters, have you read them yet? Claude suddenly interrupted my complaint to speak to Alan, so I couldn't finish it. Let's try again. While I'm studying that's right, Alan. It's fine. You can read through them later. They're about the girls selected to be your fiancé, which I think is a bit early for you. But it's a valuable opportunity. This time Mr. Cardine interrupted. Ah, I'm losing my chance to talk about it. Don't give up, one more time. Study what? A fiancé. This time it was my henchman. Lousy henchman. It's no good, I'll have to give up. The topic has completely changed. Anyway. I was already thinking of working during my education so I could get a title with my own hands when I became an adult. I guess it's fine. So, now, what was the new topic? A. Eh? A fiancé. Alan's fiancé. Isn't it too early? My henchman's still ten years old. That boy doesn't understand a woman's heart. Although I'm ten and I just broke off my own engagement, I've looked through a few of them, and they're all girls with strong bloodlines. You can choose freely between girls from under 3 up to 35. Claude winked at Alan. From 3 to 35. Amazing. Well, Alan is a magician, so he's very popular. A fiancé. What? How can I? I don't know anything about that. I won't look at them. Perhaps embarrassed by the talk about his fiancé, Alan turned away. He's still a child, after all. Hey hey. It's fine not to rush into it. I wasn't interested before I found Diane either. In fact, I thought men were disgusting. But Alan, you'll understand as soon as you meet the right one. Irene said, looking at Cardine with rosy cheeks. My sweet flower says such sweet things. But Irene, I was indeed a disgusting man before I met you. Will you forgive me? Oh, Diane. Oh, the couple was immersed in their own little world again. Stop that. There are children here. Stop. And so the welcome home dinner ended with an eye-locked couple and all the other participants trying not to look as they silently picked at their meals. 70. Freshman 21. Life in Ruby Fallen. Part 1. Little O Translations Little O 13 to 17 minutes. Author's note. Since we're going to Ruby Fallen, I'll be providing a character list at the end. Feel free to skip them if you don't need them. I broke off my engagement the first day I came to Rainforest, and after that I spent some time with Alan and Gain. Since Alan wanted to learn horseback riding, we went along with him to practice, going to market, to visit nearby waterfalls, etc. I never played around with friends like this in my previous life, so it was a lot of fun. Aragari village was in the rainforest territory. I wanted to go see the situation there, but it was a long way off, so I couldn't go. But I heard from an elementalist working in rainforest that they seemed to be doing well, so that had to suffice. I also talked to Claude about all the details of our future endeavors. While I was there, I asked him what had happened to the mysterious masked man who had been asking about me when I was a maid, but he said he hadn't appeared since then. I thought it might have been Jiro who had left the village, trying to find out about me, but ultimately I had no idea. The few days passed with such activities in the blink of an eye, and Mimaku came to pick me up. She came dashing over during a break in her work in the capital. After Irene and Mimaku had finished their official introductions, we set out. Just as we were about to go, Alan pulled an anxious face and tried to stop me from leaving. I told Alan that recently bandits hadn't been appearing frequently and we weren't packing anything valuable, so even if there were bandits they wouldn't target us. 
that calmed him enough to let us depart. Sorry, Alan. The way he stared after us with a pale face was painful to see. Apparently my kidnapping by bandits had been traumatic for Alan. Sorry, after a few days of travel, we arrived at the Ruby Fallen Mansion. Though not as big as rainforests, the Ruby Fallen Mansion was also splendid. Though it had grown a little mossy due to poor maintenance, it's not shabby. Some patina lends the building a rustic, dignified air. Welcome back. With a loud cry. The people who came to welcome me at the front door for some reason all got on their hands and knees and pressed their foreheads to ground. What? That's funny. I'm pretty sure the Doge's a greeting didn't exist in this world. What's wrong with everyone? For now, I turned my eyes to a prostrate Mr. Tugasaku. M. Mr. Tugasaku, what's this greeting? What in the world are you doing? For an instant I had considered letting it go, but I ventured the question anyway. You noticed. Mr. Tigasaku said, laughing at my question. Noticed. As expected, you was able to notice, was the feeling he was giving off, but who wouldn't notice that? This is an exclusive greeting for my lady alone. The light of my lady's renown is so dazzling that people cannot look straight at it. Oh, no, you can't do that. I'm not dazzling at all. Ooh, I think greeting me on your knees will be hard for everyone. Please just do it the ordinary way. But my lady, don't you think people will be blinded by your radiance? I don't. Do I look like I'm shining to Mr. Tagasaku? Eh? Am I glowing without knowing it? Do I have a tendency to do that? What wattage am I? Hey, what wattage? When I looked at Mimaku for help, she shook her head with a sympathetic look. It's fine, Ryu. You're not glowing. Oh, good. It was just Mr. Tigasaku's usual delusions that gave me goosebumps. I had imagined myself switching on like a fluorescent lamp. After that magnificent greeting, I was shown to a guest room. Mr. Bash was there to meet me. Mew, it's good you've returned. Ms. Ku seems better than ever. Did you have any trouble with life in the capital? I'm doing well, Bash. I'm having a great time at school. I've even made some friends. Yes, thanks to you. I'm having a good time. Well, good. Alex will be pleased. Oh, I was surprised to hear the boss's name come up so naturally. After all, I'd gotten the impression before that talking about boss Alex in front of Mr. Bash was taboo, so I'd been avoiding it until now, you know? Maybe he'd had some contact with the boss. I decided it was a good time to ask about it. Oh, did the boss contact you? No, he didn't contact me. There was no contact, however, Mr. Bash is the type who's naturally great at lying, he may be hiding it, however, since it's Alex, I'm sure he's secretly observing the situation. Mr. Bash gave a bitter smile as I stared at him. True Hilda, Alex is indeed good at looking after people. Since I'm coming back after such a long absence, he might be closer than I expect, he <laughs> he. Oh, you think so? Oh, how bashful. Don't you think the boss is the kind to make such a move? I swear I'll go see the boss when I graduate, but the problem is I'm waiting until I properly graduate because he might say something like, when was I angry, how about now? Yeesh, that's a scary thought, no, he doesn't seem to be making a move yet, perhaps right now, he's running around gathering swords, actually, I was originally expected to start producing swords to help Alex. Mr. Bash said, smiling helplessly, it seems like they were old friends who ended up quarreling or something complicated like that. Speaking of swords, is the boss still wanting to go to war against magicians? I thought I was reckless, but if boss is really going to fight the magicians going to school, I've learned a little about magicians, and honestly a war against them would be truly reckless. If it's a one-on-one -on -one duel like with me and Alan. I could use various hand strikes or something, but in a war with groups of people going against one another, people without magic would be at an overwhelming disadvantage. First, they couldn't mass produce swords or armor with magic, they might be able to use bows and arrows with stone arrowheads, but it seems like wind magic can defend against projectile weapons. Furthermore, magicians have large scale means of attack like flood or inferno. Yeah. I think there's no way they'd win. No, I don't believe he's planning a war. Rather, if a magician picks a fight, he wants to be able to resist. 
He wants to be prepared for that, but Alex's primary reason for getting weapons is to use against demons. One of the problems caused by the loss of magicians is the weakening of the barrier that seals the demons. Some of the demons can't be injured by magically created weapons, so we no longer have a means to oppose the demons, and we need to find a weapon that can harm them. Also, I've heard that those stationed at the demon barrier seal use handmade weapons. The only barrier I've seen was the one around the mana drain, an encircling cordon. When that boundary disappeared, the monkey-like demon came out. That was really dreadful. When the monkey demon appeared, Kane easily lopped off its arm. So a magically created weapon worked well there, but if it hadn't, I mean, what does it even mean for a weapon to be ineffective? Would it just bounce off? Either way, I don't think an unarmed human could win fighting against such a monster. If so, won't it be quite a while until boss does anything? Yes. Rudil, Guama and I learned something about sword making at school. In a minting class, we watched metal being melted. You can make a sword that way, but it's quite difficult. I think Alex will have a hard time. If so, the boss won't be doing anything for a while. Knock, knock. When he heard the knock at the door, Mr. Bash called out and Mr. Tagasaku came in. He came in and sat next to Mr. Bash, as though he hadn't been prostrating himself a few seconds ago. Hey, what was the meaning of that prostration a few seconds ago? Did it even have a meaning? He's just sitting and looking right at me as usual. Isn't he blinded by my brilliance? Actually, Mew. I had something to discuss so I called in Mr. Tugasaku. Bash told me casually, ignoring Mr. Tugasaku's eccentricities. He's totally doing it. I'll just follow Mr. Bash's example. Is it about agriculture? Mr. Tugasaku nodded deeply at my question. Yes. A pioneer village has asked for help. Apparently they're suffering damage from birds and beasts. When the crops ripen, wild boars and birds and other beasts come down from the hills and lay waste to them. We respectfully beg my lady's advice. As he said it, Tigasaku's eyes overflowed with expectation. He's begging my advice. First I need to find out why the requesting village is in this situation. Perhaps because the crops hadn't been grown properly until now. They hadn't had a problem with animals until they came and saw the field starting to ripen. What about a hedge of chili peppers? That's usually pretty effective. If there are a lot of beasts, they should make something like a hunter's guild to hunt them regularly. <laughs> Would scarecrows work for the bird damage? It's primitive, but it's so effective even modern day Japan uses them. Why don't you try using chili plants to make a hedge around the field? The spicy taste of chilies is effective on animals as well. Also, I think you should make scarecrows. You can make a simple humanoid figure of sticks and straw, and dress it up to look like a person. Then put them up here and there in your fields. Birds will think there are people there and be afraid to enter the fields. If there are still too many beasts causing damage, routine hunting may be necessary. Perhaps the only people who have chili plants are knights. Since only they have those plants, it might be better to teach the village youths how to hunt. Yeah, that's good. I'd like some knights to settle in the village if possible. The weird thing about pioneer villages is that they're just a random collection of people poorly thrown together without any knowledge. In this region, farmers can easily teach people how to grow crops and give them the tools. Fishermen can teach how to fish and give them tools. Miners can dig and provide their tools, with each person performing their specialty. Therefore, just telling everybody to do what they're told isn't a good way to deal with unforeseen circumstances. If just one person is good, we won't be able to have people with a variety of skills and leadership styles, and won't be able to deal with occasional problems. That's why my village was so impoverished when I was born and I was so thin I could barely do anything. If boss Alex hadn't come to Garagari village, I think we would have just wasted away and died. The knights working for Mr. Bash don't have a knighthood, but some had graduated from the knights college at school, and even those that didn't go to school mostly came from aristocratic or semi-aristocratic households where they received some training. They understood critical thinking, and were able to read and write. They should have the ability to deal with any problems that come up. Besides, I can secretly teach the villagers reading, writing, and arithmetic. The king had originally told me I shouldn't start up an academic institution, but that's not actually an academic institution. 
is it? It's just a bit of teaching, a bit of teaching is fine, uh huh, you can rest assured it will only be one person in the village. Well, if they don't want the knights. Speaking of which, Tagasaku has quite a few knights. If he loses his followers, Tagasaku might calm down, in fact, he might fade away entirely. Yeah, that's a good idea. I decided to set up a bird and beast damage control task force immediately with Mr. Tigasaku and Mr. Bash to discuss further issues. Character list kooky male, but with the heart of a maiden. Nicknames, Ku, Mamaku good looking, seen as a sexy woman while a student because she hid the part about being in drag. She was the bandit clan's healer when the protagonist was kidnapped but has now settled down as the protagonist's guardian. She's been friends with Alex since they were students, acts as the protagonist's mother. If the protagonist brings home a boyfriend, she'd probably sample him. Says she likes muscular men. Alan seems outside the range, but she says she's looking forward to Kane's future prospects. Alex, real name, Alexander, male nicknames, boss, Alex. Skinhead boss of the bandits who kidnapped the protagonist. A magician hating noble who sometimes teaches farmers how to hunt. He gives the impression of a gentleman thief. He looks like a scary skinhead, but is good at taking care of people, and many of his neighbors love him. His being so adored made the protagonist worry. Is that what this world thinks is a good looking face? Cookie's sweetheart. Fond of children. A decisive person who can take immediate action. Trying to do something to reform the magician supremacist country. Bash Ruby Fallen male nicknames, Bash, Mr. Head of the Ruby Fallen Countum. Since he can't do magic, he manages the territory with his magician wife. He also has children. Friends with Alex since their student days, and had partly cooperated with Alex's plan. But since the agricultural reform was going well, they're no longer working together. He is a fundamentally calm nature. But when the people of his territory were groaning in hunger, he worked passionately on things like cooperating with Alex and implementing agricultural reform on his own. Eldest son of the mayor in the impoverished village where the protagonist was born, has thinning hair. He was scouted by Mr. Bash when he heard rumors of the remarkable agricultural development in the poor village and taken to Ruby Fallen. He is the master of agricultural reform at Ruby Fallen, and very good at it for which Mr. Bash is quite grateful. He has become dangerously infatuated with the protagonist since her childhood, when she took action to avoid starvation. He believes the protagonist is an angel sent from heaven, and does everything he can to spread her teachings. He's studying his letters to better spread her teachings. 71. Freshman 22. Life in Ruby Fallen. Part 2. In the end. I centered my bird and beast countermeasure plan around Tagasaku's night followers and went to teach them about chili pepper hedges, scarecrows, and hunting techniques. Hee hee hee. I watched to see if Tagasaku was disheartened by his loss of followers, but he didn't seem particularly shocked. Hey, I'm ashamed I got so worked up. Well, it's fine. Let's just go with the flow. While I was spending time at the mansion. I realized that the number of Mr. Tagasaku's followers has increased a lot since last year. Because as soon as anyone sees me, they shove their foreheads into the floor. Scary. It seems the Tagasaku virus has spread nearly everywhere, including the servants working in the Ruby Fallen Mansion. Wait, even though I scattered Mr. Tagasaku's knights across the territory, I feel like his power isn't diminishing. Bash, please do something about Tigasaku's eccentricities yesterday. When I asked, he said, Ha ha, don't worry about it, that's just how Mr. Tigasaku is. And refused to discuss it. Bash is too lenient with Tigasaku. What's wrong, you? You've been moaning for a while now. As I was leaning against Mamaku's back cracking my brains over the Tagasaku religion while pretending to read, I heard Mamaku's worried voice. I guess the problem of Tagasaku's teachings was so serious I had been moaning unintentionally. Oh, nothing much. I was just a little worried about Mr. Tagasaku. Oh, in love? Of course not. I'm kidding. Mamaku laughed, then turned to face me fully, looking a little worried. Well. It's just Mr. Tukasaku. He's the same as always, just a little more. Mamaku is worried about the problem of Tukasaku's teachings just like me. If it's Mamaku, I know she'll understand me. That's the thing. 
Whenever I see someone, they rub their foreheads on the floor, and last night I heard a voice saying Lady Ryu, Lady Ryu, out of nowhere, and the other day when I washed my hands before a meal, one of the mansion's servants collected and bottled the water I used. What did they do with it? I'm scared. With Mamaku's sympathy, I let out all the feelings I'd accumulated until now. Ryu, let's get rid of Tigasaku before we leave. I have to say that Baldi is just useless. I'm on your side. Mamaku, actually, I'm going to have a talk with Mr. Tigasaku today. It would be encouraging if you come with me. I stared at Mamaku with excitement. I knew you would understand. With Mamaku on my side, there's nothing to be afraid of. To get my head back in a good place, I hugged Mamaku like a koala. I'm only 10 years old, so it's fine to be spoiled. I'm sure I've made it to safety. And since I've been so scared by Mr. Tigasaku's mysterious behavior recently, surely it's fine to seek this much healing. So I'm not particularly ashamed of it. I'm still safe. I'm desperate, so even though I used to be a high school girl, it's fine to be a spoiled child, right? It's fine, right? As I was giving myself excuses for the relaxation, Mamaku spoke in a voice that seemed a little depressed. Mew, did you have more fun at Rainforest? Your friends are there, too. Wondering what happened, I looked up at Mamaku's face, but she still didn't look happy. Rainforest was pretty fun. But then Mr. Tigasaku wasn't there. I had fun at Rainforest. But it's also fun to help Mr. Bash here, isn't it? When I answered her with a cocked head, she said, okay, but didn't seem to feel better. And with Mamaku here, I can relax and feel safe. I haven't spent much time in the Ruby Fallen Mansion, but this feels like home. I think it's because you're here? Hee hee hee. When I looked at her with such a cute upturned face, Mamaku couldn't stand it anymore. She just hugged me and patted my head. Oh no, how cute can my baby be, as expected of mine and Alex's child? If boss Alex heard that, he'd probably say, I don't remember having a child with you. Or some retort like that. Ha ha, I'm glad Mamaku is feeling better. I'm satisfied with this after such a long time. I was a little worried. I thought you might want to start being a child of the rainforest household. Absolutely not. Really, she has no need to worry about that. My old foster father was from rainforest, to be sure, but I just broke off my engagement a few days ago. Anyway, Mamaku is amazing. Just like always, when I'm sad, she's sad with me, and when I'm in trouble, she knows I'm in trouble. When I want her to tell me I'm cute, she'll say I'm cute. Mamaku knows everything about me. This has been a really fun year. I made friends. I made a friend out of a stalker. I got in duels and reconciled. I was able to study with my friends, have lunch, study and talk after school, and have crazy fun sleepovers. And it's all thanks to Mamaku. I think no matter what happens, Mamaku will always understand. Hey, Mamaku, do you think the boss will settle down like Mr. Bash said? It doesn't seem like he'd be satisfied just making swords. I feel like the boss won't be satisfied just making swords. I think he would take immediate, reckless action. I'm not sure if Bash didn't know, or knew and just said that to me. Yeah. Mamaku muttered, looking a little lonely and far off. She's probably thinking about the boss. Mamaku sometimes makes that kind of face. Well, if something happens to the boss, Mamaku. Don't worry about me. Please just go to him. You? I'm really glad that you left the boss to come with me. But I thought I might be tying you down after all. Besides, I have my friends and school is a lot of fun, so I'm fine. I heard a drawn breath above me. Frightened, I kept my face buried in Mamaku's chest. I couldn't convincingly say, I'm fine. You? As I've said before. I like being with you. I don't think I'm being tied down. Even so, if you ever want to go back to the boss, I'm fine with it, because boss might die without Mamaku, and I'll be okay. Mew, do you really not want to be with me that much? It's not like that. I took my head off Mamaku's chest and corrected her loudly, since she joked like that. Hee <laughs> hee. I'm joking, but I'm going to stay with you. Forgive me. Also, Thank you for being concerned for Alex. Saying that, 
Minma could pulled my head with her hand, and I obediently put my head back on her chest. Knock knock, there was a knocking sound. Maybe it's Tukasaku wanting to talk to him. I'd asked him to come when he was free that morning. Even so, to come during a family moment. Tukasaku's got bad timing as usual. I left my position clinging to Mizku, straightened my back like a count's daughter, and called to the door. It opened, and Tugasaku came crawling into the room. Seidako. Hey, is that Seidako? Did you come from a well? But since Tugasaku's hair is so thin, I can't really say he's like Seidako, can I? My lady, I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. What would you like to discuss? Tugasaku said, genuflecting, when he got all the way into the room. Before that, I need to ask. What are you doing? Moving like that? I decided earlier that this is how I should walk in front of my lady. Ah, isn't it hard to move? I mean, is that even walking? It is indeed harder than I imagined. I apologize, my lady, but would you permit me to walk normally when I approach you? No, 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 I never told you to walk that way. Why does it seem like I'm the one who told you to walk Seidako style? Next to me, Minmaku shook her head in surprise, as if to say, she didn't say that, she didn't say it. She also nodded as if to say, I get it. Mr. Tigasaku, please just act normal. I didn't especially want you to do that, did I? When I said that, Tigasaku stood excitedly for some reason. His forehead was red, he had been rubbing his forehead against the floor. I asked the now standing Tigasaku to sit, and sat down opposite him. At last, the main subject, Mr. Tigasaku. Please stay calm and listen to me. I've told you this several times, but I am not an angel from heaven. I am a human being, nor did I spring from the bud of a dandelion. Therefore, I want you to stop using my name to tell lies and spread weird stories. I tried to tell him I am a human being, just like always, but since it's Tigasaku, I'm sure he'll try to divert the conversation by saying something that makes no sense but today will be different. Mamaku is next to me, and I think I can respond to any pattern. My lady, that is certainly true. Directly speaking the sacred name of you. I had also suspected that might be wrong. Eh? That's a different reaction than usual. Well, really, did finally get it? Although I'm a little worried about the sacred name of you, it seems like he's properly reflecting on it. Yes, I want things to be normal. Normal. You don't need to press your head against the floor like you just did. I'm just a human being. Yes, I've gone too far. It should be a more refined gesture. A refined gesture? Well, since I'm the daughter of an aristocratic, isn't that a reasonable response? Goodness, Tigasaku. What's this? You can speak properly. Whatever's been said so far, I haven't heard anything inconvenient. I'm so glad. I'm very happy that you understand, Mr. Tigasaku. I'd appreciate it if you could rescind the delusions you've spread so far, as much as possible. Yes, of course, we'll get those corrected immediately. I apologize, I'll correct them immediately, Tigasaku said, and left the room. What a special day. Today is the day I was able to communicate with Tigasaku for the first time, although I'm a little uneasy at how quickly he understood, but it's fine. Tigasaku understood my feelings, for sure. It's been a few days since Tigasaku and I understood each other, but so far there's been no visible change in his followers. Some of the people in the mansion are still Tigasaku's followers, and they kneel and press their forehead against the floor if they happen to see me. Maybe Tigasaku's correction hasn't sunk in yet. Mr. Tigasaku also seems the same as usual. He no longer calls out, Lady Ryu, Lady Ryu, so I guess it's fine. Oh. Did we actually understand each other that time? Meanwhile, I had to leave Ruby Fallen soon. I'll be late for the new semester. When I left Ruby Fallen, all the followers were still pressing their foreheads on the ground and saying, farewell. Hey, weren't you going to stop that behavior? Isn't that so? Didn't you promise? Next time I come home, that kind of thing will be gone, right? I left Truby Fallen with a bit of anxiety. Character list Charlotte the first female friend the protagonist has ever made. A spiritualist girl. Her primary magic is necromancy, an element that isn't welcomed among magicians. Not from a noble family, but from a pioneer village. 
she was recognized as a magician and admitted to the school. Katerina Genesis a female sorcerer, the daughter of the Earl who governs the Genesis territory, which is currently the most powerful, unsociable and domineering. She treats Charlotte harshly and glares at the protagonist, the boss of the first year student's largest female faction. Salomon's daughter of a knight's household, a girl who is not a magician, an entourage member of Katerina, who is the boss of the first year female students, always by her side, like an aide. She told the protagonist that she'd better be prepared after the vacation. Ritz a spiritualist boy, Alan's friend. He's got a simple aura. But because of that he gives off a friendly impression and can get along well with everyone. Henry Castigas Fontal a boy sorcerer. Younger half-brother of the current king. A magician. A royal. And a beauty. But has a friendly atmosphere. He gets along well with Cain and they're often together. Although he seems like a good person. He calls the protagonist Chicky and is a little prone to pretentious airs. 72. Extra Chapter 1, Salome Muntz Please be aware that it is not the protagonist narrating. I was born the eldest daughter of the Muntz Knight family in Genesis. Since the Count of Genesis had a girl my age named Katerina, my family decided to move to the mansion's premises to raise me as a knight of the same age as her. I first met Miss Katerina when I was four years old. I still remember it. Miss Katerina was a soft, sugar-white girl who looked younger than me. At the time, I didn't understand what service meant, so I thought my father had brought me a playmate. There were no girls my age around, so I thought of how fun it would be every day to make friends with a such a cute, sweet girl. Fortunately, Miss Katerina seemed to feel the same way, and we soon became good friends. Every day we played together as long as we could. The grounds of Miss Katerina's mansion were very large, with a forest-like grove of trees and a little pond so it was a nice place to play. We played in the dirt, chased each other through the forest, and wove flowers. Miss Katerina was born a few months after me, so I was taller by about a hand, and faster and more talkative. I think I probably grew up faster than other children. So in those days I thought of Miss Katerina more like a younger sister who wouldn't leave her elder sister's side than a friend of the same age. Miss Katerina also looked up to me like an elder sister, and followed me with a smile wherever I went and whatever I did. For a time, we were engrossed in playing princesses. When playing princesses, we'd always pretend to be sister princesses. I was the elder sister and Miss Katerina was the younger sister. Thinking back, I don't know what was so fun about it, but we loved playing princesses every day. Partly because of that, I would proudly call her simply Katerina and Miss Katerina would at the time call me Sister Salome. Every day was fun in those days. I feel like Miss Katerina and I had a ridiculously fun time together, but when we were having fun together I wasn't afraid of anything and felt like I could do anything. At four, Miss Katerina already knew a little magic and could create a breeze. I thought it was amazing she could use magic, and I was envious, but it didn't bother me much because I was faster and stronger than Miss Katerina. I didn't think magicians were special just because they could make a wind I could make with any fan, but one day when I was playing by the pond, Miss Katerina, who had followed me, slipped and fell in. She didn't drown. The pond was shallow, but she rubbed her leg and started crying. It didn't seem like a major injury, but I decided we should go home just in case. We went home and I treated it easily since it wasn't a big wound. Katerina had already stopped crying, so I said we should change our clothes and go out to play again. But my mother saw what state we were in. When she saw Miss Katerina soaked, wounded, and covered in mud, she was furious. You got Miss Katerina injured. What were you doing? That girl is a magician. And the next countess, she's different from you. How can you get her injured like that? I think it was something like that. Actually she was more abusive and foul-mouthed, but I was seven and didn't understand it, so I don't remember exactly. That day I was separated from Katerina and fed my mother's lectures, and my father came home at night and talked to me about various things. They told me a lot, but I can't remember it all because there was so much of it. Only these words my father said have stuck strangely in my mind. You and Miss Katerina are different. She's a special person who can use magic. 
Don't think of yourself as her equal. Speaking Miss Katerina's name without an honorific is unthinkable. At the time, I still didn't care what my parents were saying. Miss Katerina came to see me again the next day, as she missed me. So I kept calling her Katerina, without an honorific. And she still called me Sister Salome. However, since my parents were watching, we couldn't go out. So basically, Miss Katerina came to stay and play at my house. Miss Katerina's parents, the Genesis family, were extremely strict and apparently forced Miss Katerina to do difficult tasks in those days. Miss Katerina, who couldn't handle her strict parents, came to my house to escape. The way Miss Katerina depended on me was cute, and I comforted and spoiled my little sister. I have to admit, Miss Katerina might have seen her strict relationship with her parents as strange because she saw how gentle I was with her. We enjoyed playing at home at first but after a while we got tired of it and Miss Katerina began to say, I want to go outside. My parents wouldn't let me leave, but I also wanted to go outside. So when Miss Katerina asked we stole away from my parents and snuck out. After all, even if we were playing outside it was still on the mansion's premises. I'd never been in danger before and thought my parents were overprotective. So I must have just been really unlucky that day. We were in the depths of the woods on the premises, playing and making wreaths, when we heard something like a beast roaring. When I turned toward the source of the sound, I immediately saw a slavering wild dog. My first thought when I saw the wild dog was to ask why it was in such a place. However, I thought I'd better do something about the situation fast and got on guard. I looked around for anything I could use as a weapon and found a thick branch a little ways away. I got Miss Katerina up and put her behind me, then moved toward the branch. I was really scared, but Miss Katerina was a sweet little girl, so I really thought that if I didn't do my best she'd be eaten. My fear was secondary to my burning sense of purpose as the only one who could protect this child. As we slowly backed away, the wild dog ready to bite, rushed to close the distance. I distracted the dog with a surprise attack, hitting it with the wreath I was holding, and picked up the fallen stick. Then, before I knew it, the wild dog was upon me, so I swung the branch as best I could at its mouth. The branch lodged directly in the dog's mouth and prevented it from biting me, but a sharp claw on its forefoot scratched my arm but I knew I'd lose my weapon and the wild dog would attack me with its fangs if I released my hand in pain, so I just swung it with all my willpower. I have never been happier to have learned swordsmanship than that day. When I swung the branch, the wild dog was thrown some distance away. However, the attack didn't do much as the dog landed cleanly. Still, it gave a guttural roar and turned toward me with a resentful eye. Then, a whirlwind of petals blew in the dog's face, and it shut its eyes, irritated, and scratched at the air with a front paw. As soon as I realized Miss Katerina was using her magic, I made use of the brake to strike at the dog's snout while it was struggling not to keep its eyes closed. The wild dog gave a pitiful yelp, immediately jumped back, and ran away. Although I had been hurt by the wild dog and my arm was covered in blood, my excitement was stronger than my pain. The fact that Miss Katerina and I were able to drive off a wild dog was a grand adventure to me. Miss Katerina and I had survived the hardship of a special event, and I felt more and more strongly that she and I were friends joined by a special bond. It seemed like Miss Katerina felt the same way, and although she took one look at my bloody arm and turned pale with anxiety, we regaled each other about our adventure with excitement as we hurried home to treat my injury. Looking back on it, all I'd done was drive away one stray dog, but at the time it felt to me like I had defeated a mighty monster. After Miss Katerina and I got back from our adventure, my mother scolded me harshly while treating my arm. It was bleeding, but it wasn't a big wound. But that night I got a fever. It's said that you can get a fever occasionally when you get injured, so I probably got the fever from the wild dog's scratch. Apparently that day the adults killed the wild dog who had been our opponent on Katrina's and my first big adventure. It was a beast that had come in through a small gap in the hedge that surrounded the place, and though at the time it had looked very large, it was actually a very small creature. As I lay feverish and nightmare laden from the little beast, 
my mother yelled at everyone, magician and aristocrat alike, who couldn't help me, but I didn't remember it well, since my consciousness was going in and out from the fever. At the time it seemed like she was angry at me for selfishly taking Miss Katerina outside, and my father scolded me, too. My father seemed angry that I still considered Miss Katerina my friend. My father's words, think of her as someone from a different world, echoed forcefully in me as I was weakened by the fever. After all, my mother was more anxious about Miss Katerina than about her own daughter, even when she's suffering from a fever. That's surely because Miss Katerina is a magician. Magicians are special, I thought obediently in my fever dream. The fever subsided in a few days, but I stopped meeting with Miss Katerina. The time I had spent playing with Miss Katerina was spent studying. In a few years, I had to take the school entrance exam, so I studied little by little. However, after the day of my adventure, I started studying the history of magic. My mother taught me. I was very eager, how wonderful magicians are, how lucky we were to follow magicians, and how we ourselves came from magicians. My mother was an enthusiastic devotee of magicians, and when my mother's magic history class had progressed somewhat, I finally got to meet Miss Katerina. Until then we weren't allowed to meet in case she caught my fever. After such a long time, Miss Katerina still looked like a candy sweet girl. But although she was cute, I just couldn't see her as my special friend or younger sister anymore. After all, I finally understood that she was a magician and I wasn't. Miss Katerina looked at me with a bright smile and called, Sister Salome, bowing politely at me. Miss Katerina, it's been a while. Let's refrain from playing outside until we enter school. We can study together instead. I spoke slowly and deliberately, in a soft tone, to flatter her. Miss Katerina's eyes widened when she heard me, and she spoke with an uneasy voice, Call me like you usually do, she said. I didn't want to say her name informally like usual. Seeing her nervous face and voice, I felt a little childish joy. I might have been glad that Miss Katerina was upset by my words. Miss Katerina was a magician, but I couldn't give up wanting her to think of me as special, too. I couldn't get my parents' words, magicians are special and different from us, out of my head. One day Miss Katerina would understand that, and would only see me as an ordinary human. No matter how much I wanted to live seeing eye to eye with Miss Katerina, she might throw me away. If so, I'd rather it be like this, I thought. As I looked at Miss Katerina's anxious face, although I would have liked to say without much thought, I'm sorry, that was a lie, Katerina. Let's go play. I was no longer a child who could say such a carefree thing because I already knew I had to stand on the same stage as Miss Katerina. I can't be her special friend. So I put a perfect smile on my face and spoke with a flattering voice. Miss Katerina is a magician. I am my lady's knight. Please forgive me for my former rudeness. For that matter, please call me simply Salome. When I said that, Miss Katerina gave me an incredulous look betrayed, disappointed. Even though my words were a result of my stance, I still remember that look on Miss Katerina's face. Then I stopped looking at her when I thought of what kind of look she was giving me. I was so scared I couldn't look at her anymore. After that, Miss Katerina stopped coming out to play with me and apparently received a strict home education from her harsh parents to become a magician. Then she would beat the servants harshly for doing a poor job and fly into the rage when a magician in the territory made a small mistake. The sweet girl I knew has gone away, and the relationship between Miss Katerina and I is simply that of a master and servant. We didn't especially avoid one another, but we didn't especially talk to one another either. I was just an ornament for a magician to bear, but that's the natural relationship. Because I'm not a magician and Miss Katerina is, I continued training to become Miss Katerina's knight managed to pass the school entrance exam, and somehow followed the path of a knight, always walking a step behind Miss Katerina. As my parents wanted, Miss Katerina remained the same at school, getting irritated by Miss Charlotte's failings and being strict with her. Miss Katerina is severe on herself and strives for perfection, and she extends that characteristic to everyone around her. She overlooks people who can't use magic, but she's tough on aristocrats and magicians like herself. 
As for the problem with Charlotte, she fell in with an unusual little girl named Ryu, and her poor performance disappeared. Apparently, Miss Ryu was teaching her after school. She saw Miss Katerina clashing with Miss Charlotte and separated them. Miss Katerina seemed worried about the unusual Miss Ryu. She would watch Miss Ryu and pretend to be concerned about Miss Charlotte. Miss Ryu was an unusual young lady. First, she had a mysterious origin, according to rumors. She was from a pioneer village and had been adopted by the Count of Ruby Fallen for some reason, even though she wasn't a magician. It's such an incredible story that few people believed it. I didn't believe it either. Miss Ryu was always surrounded by magical friends the son of Count Train Forest, as well as Miss Charlotte, of course, was a magician, they called each other by nicknames, and their friendly relationship was certainly astonishing, because Miss Mew wasn't a magician, no matter how you think about it, you can't be equal to magicians, Miss Katerina seemed to be irritated by Miss Mew's behavior, and glared at her, however, I sometimes wonder when I see Miss Katerina like that, whether the gaze that she points at Miss Ryu might be turned toward me, that it might be resentment toward me from that time I built a wall against Miss Katerina, if so, I wonder if Miss Katerina still wants a relationship with me where we can play together and go on adventures, regardless of whether she is or isn't a magician, but I'm sure that's just my own desire. It's a wall I built myself, so I'm disgusted at myself for expecting Miss Katerina to tear it down. Since that day, I hate myself for being afraid to look Miss Katerina in the eye. I don't know what Miss Katerina is thinking when she looks at Miss Ryu. But when I look at Miss Ryu, my chest hurts. Maybe if I'd told Miss Katerina, I'm sorry, that was a lie, Katerina, let's go play together. Then I could have been like Miss Ryu. 73. Student Activities 1, Shining Second Year My juniors have also arrived. I wonder if someday I will be called a big sister. What should I do? I tried to be excited and enjoy the new term, but in the corner of my eye, there was a sharp glare. Lady Katerina, her piercing glare had intensified since we were freshmen. Come to think of it, one of her entourage Miss Salem had specifically said, be prepared after the vacation. Somehow, Miss Katerina seems overbearing. Why? Be prepared, she said. For what? Well, whatever. She's just staring. Compared to Alan's stalking incident when we were first admitted, it's totally cute. I pretended not to notice Miss Katerina for the time being and went alone after school to the faculty building where the teachers were. My target was the head of the school, the principal. Mr. Principal, is now a good time? With the document side secretly prepared clutched in one hand, I spoke to the silver fox. I had staked out the principal's office, and as he was rushing out, the principal turned to me in surprise. Oh, what is it? What a gentle voice. The principal seems to be a kind man. If so, this will be a smooth discussion. Actually, I have a favor I'd like to ask you. I gave him the hair toss and puppy dog eyes attack. I'm a cute little girl. This silver fox will love me, too. I'm sure of it. A favor? Yes, um, please accept this document. I handed it over like a girl handing over a love letter, and the principal cautiously accepted the document and looked it over. This is a petition. Open the magical books library to general students. After reading part of the text aloud, the principal continued reading silently and earnestly. I wonder what his reaction will be. I think it's going pretty well, he seems kind, I had finished reading all the books in the library as a first year student and wanted to read books related to magic, so I went straight to the principal, if my request is accepted, I'll also be able to see the original book of all spells that rests in the depths of the library, Grimo Eye of Salvation, if I can see that book, I might get some hints about why spells aren't anchor poems and my theory that the person who wrote the Grimo Eye might have been Japanese. Furthermore, if we can deepen our understanding of magic, we may be able to find a means for it to be used by everyone, not just magicians. If we can, this world will surely be more stable. It's unstable because there are so few magicians. It would help to increase the number of magic users and solve any problem with magic. The pioneer villages wouldn't have to starve, and boss Alex wouldn't be burdened with the farmers. Well, to be honest, I think it would be hard to get everyone to use magic. If it could be done, 
someone would have already researched it, but there may be something that only my knowledge can unlock, since the spells are all Japanese literature. In addition to reading magic books, the document also requests other things to reduce inequalities like reducing magic history classes and changing the location of the library. Well, the main part is the release of the magic books, so the other petitions are more like supports. Wonderful. Did you think of this? You're the one who did the freshman representative greeting last year, right? It was so impressive I still remember it. Oh. That's a better reaction than I expected. I'm glad I did the freshman representative greeting. Thank you very much for remembering. I fervently hope you will accept this document's proposals. Right. I can't make a decision on these matters without speaking with the king. Are you the only one involved in this? Any other collaborators? Is that so? Is the king the one who actually manages this school? I expected the principal to be the head of the academic world but I can't even ask him for a little favor. A little change to the system. I thought I'd made my attack, but, after all, I'll have to get through the king and the magicians. I'd heard that the principal was from the royal family but wasn't a magician, so I thought it would work. I haven't recruited any collaborators. How many do I need? You can't take just a single student's suggestion to the king. Maybe I need a signature gathering event. The more people there are, the better. But rather than numbers, High-ranking magicians would make the best collaborators. I see. I don't have many friends. Look, I'm the type who makes a few deep relationships. You know, I could be popular if I wanted to. It's just my policy not to. As I was comforting my heart over my few friends, the principal put his hand on my shoulder in concern. Don't feel bad. Personally, I think you've really thought this through. I've been looking for something like this. For some reason he's looking at me hopefully. No, wouldn't it be faster for the principal to take action rather than expecting some child to do it? Aren't you the head of the academic world? I wonder if his position in the academic world isn't as high as I thought, even though he's the principal. Well, after that, I gave a casual goodbye and left the principal's office. A signing event. Later, in the ordinary library, I made a signature sheet and asked Talon, Charlotte, and writes to sign it. Everyone reads and studies differently, but usually people gather in groups of four at the library. At that opportunity, I put the signature sheet down in front of them. They already knew I wanted to read magic books, and they were happy to see fewer magic history lessons, so they signed it willingly. I don't think there will be more free time just because there are no magic history lessons, it'll just be some other lesson. I kept that to myself. Yep. However, as I thought, I got three magicians' signatures immediately, I'm expecting Sir Kane's as well. And thus ends the signature event. Because I'm that type of person, the type who interacts deeply but narrowly. Quality over quantity. Sir Kane is now a fifth year student, and the other three are magicians. Furthermore, Alan is a Count's son and magician. I think that's good. Let's go to the principal's office with these members. If that's no good. We might need to make a demonstration with placards like, resist, or freedom, or I'm human, let me read magical books. In that case, it seems like I'd better strengthen my influence. I have a Count's family name, but when I turn 15, the value of that name will disappear. Not just for me, everyone thinks that, no matter your efforts, only those who have graduated can get a title. But while students aren't given titles, if they are active enough they can earn one at the same time as they graduate and attract the attention of others. The easiest title to obtain as a student is that of merchant. You just have to produce results in some kind of business. Regardless of the demonstrations, I was already thinking of getting a merchant title. It's just a matter of whether I should start working to get a merchant title right now. R. Claude's grinning face came to my mind just now. Bah. It's not because Claude told me to gain a title while I was a student, it's my own volition. I put all my effort into my delusions and decided on an immediate goal. Set up a stall in the capital city's market. For now, in order to become a merchant, I think it's reasonable to open some kind of stall in the market first. It's close to school. Since it's the custom to sell products by laying them on a sheet in the market, initial costs shouldn't be too high. However, 
I believe there's a stall registration fee required to do business. Since it's an amount I wouldn't be able to pay just by working, I wonder if Mamaku will help me earn some pocket money before I open my market stall. That said, I still haven't decided what I would sell even if I did open a stall. What could I do? You? What's with the long face? You've been reading the same page for a while now. Alan asked me with a worried face as I was staring at my book and thinking. I'm just thinking a little. Nothing's wrong. Is that so? That's good. But if you have any problems, you can talk to me. Oh, is my minion taking care of me now? Alan's gotten in the habit of worrying about his boss. Alan settled down more ever since we returned to school after the vacation. Maybe the trauma of my being attacked by bandits has been lightened a little. Come to think of it, while I was talking, he sat and listened to me. The Alan of a year ago would have turned his back and given no indication he was listening. When I think about it, Alan has grown up. Thank you very much. I want to open a stall in the market, but I was thinking about what to sell. You. You're going to open a stall in the market? Miss Charlotte came and sat next to me with sparkling eyes and jumped into the conversation. Yes, I believe so. It would be great to have your own shop. Hee <laughs> hee, thank you. It's not that big a deal, but when people say it's my own shop, it makes me nervous. So then, my own shop. Thinking back to my previous life, many girls said that their future dream was a cake shop. A cake shop would be delicious for a product to sell in the market, wouldn't the ice cream you made before be good? It was delicious. Yeah, I think that's good too. The ice cream tasted really good. Miss Charlotte agreed with Alan's suggestion, and Ritz also nodded. Well, ice cream is certainly a curiosity, but it might sell. But I don't think I can deal with ice cream. It's hard to store, and honestly it takes a lot of time and effort, if possible. I want something that can be made in large quantities and stored. I want to mass produce something and make a killing by running out of stock. Although the ice cream shop is also a dream, it's delicious ice cream. All you can eat leftovers. Oh, I'm wavering a little. Then, what about medicine? Cause a drugstore, doesn't she? Why not sell that medicine? I hummed and nodded at Ritz's new proposal. I thought of that, too. Mamaku's medicine is amazing. In particular, the cosmetics have been selling very well recently, and even now the shop is prosperous just by word of mouth. However, medicine requires expensive raw materials to make. I didn't think I could make a big profit on it, so I set it aside. But it might be better to deal with goods I'm already familiar with. It is the first time I've ever started a business. Yeah, that's it. Let's think along those lines. In any case, I'll be helping Ka in order to earn the market fee, so let's consider that for a while. Hee <laughs> hee. It seems fun to open a shop, anyway. I want to do what I can to help. Charlotte said with a flowery smile. Thank you. I'm so happy. Come and help out. I'll have a lot of support. Alan, too. I'm expecting security for my big factory from Alan. 74. Student activities, too. The personal referral site. Or so I decided. But for now I had to earn some pocket money. I couldn't ask Charlotte to help with that, so I got a part-time job on my own. I call it a part-time job, but I'm just helping Mamaku. Claude might lend me some money, but I won't do that because I'm afraid of the consequences. I don't want Bash to do anything more than sending me here. Because it feels like they're a little poor there. I usually help Mamaku by keeping the shop, but today we're going to go on a business trip together. It's also a day off at school, which is why I can go on the business trip. The destination surprised me. It was a personal referral place. In other words, a slave shop. It's my first time going to one. Recently, Mamaka has been working with cosmetics rather than drugs, and sometimes aristocrats secretly visit the store. Apparently the business with the personal referral site was introduced by those means. Obviously. The products of the personal referral site are people. People, women are their best selling items, and children. Sadly, they're evaluated and priced by appearance, age, and virginity. This kind of thing makes me a little sick. In order to maximize sales, they need the products to look beautiful, so they've requested Mamaku's cosmetic skills. Fashionable hairstylists also do this kind of work. At first, 
Minmaku was worried and said, should you really be coming with me? But I wanted to see the personal referral site with my own eyes. And I also needed the pocket money, so we agreed I should come help. The personal referral site was in the middle of the capital city. It's set proudly in such a central place. I guess it's not an illegal business in this country. So they don't crack down on it. Ah. It hurts my heart to think of all the children sold. I've gone through it myself. When I see three silver coins, I get pissed off and want to just grab them and throw them away. I was sure the place would be dingy and unsanitary. And the girls would be locked up. With swollen red eyes. But the personal referral site was actually cleaner than I thought. It's a brazen little building. The hall has white porcelain walls and a thick carpet. There are also some stylishly carved pillars. It's audacious. No, I won't be fooled. The room where they sell the girls is sure to look like a pigsty. Or so I thought. But the waiting room where the girls were gathered was clean after all. Or rather, it was cleaner than my dorm room, I guess. The system seems to be that the girls are gathered in one room and meet with prospective buyers, who call over the person in charge if they want to make a purchase. However, there are exceptions, and apparently private rooms are set aside for the children who are extremely expensive. And, how should I put it, the girls in question seem to be shining rather than grieving. I'd never been to a co-ed mixer in my past life, but I thought this atmosphere might be like when girls got together before a mixer. As I listened to the older girls chat while helping Mamaku work, it sounded more like a work placement agency than a slave service. They were a group of ambitious girls who wanted to be more beautiful than anyone else and be noticed by the highest ranking nobles. Some said they were sold by their husbands, or their parents, or were orphaned by a disease. But others were willingly selling themselves because they couldn't find a job, and all of them were very blasé about it. I wonder if the three maids Claude bought were like this. Mew, we're going to a lady in a private room now. Minmaku told me when she'd finished the makeup on the women in the big room. A woman in a private room is a featured product. Yes ma'am. Is the one in the private room an important person? I hear she's the daughter of a long established merchant in the capital. But his business failed, and he sold off his daughter to pay his debts. The girls in the big room were cheerful but this one might be depressed. As we spoke about it, we knocked at the private room and entered, where we found a prim and proper lady. She was about sixteen, and was a beautiful lady with chestnut hair down to her shoulders. However, I could tell she was depressed. Her face was pale and she had dark circles under her eyes, but that fragile impression only made her look more beautiful. Is this what they call a weeping willow? Her name seemed to be Millie's. I'm Kuki. I'll take care of your hair and face now. This child is my assistant, Ryu. The melancholy beauty gazed down at Mamaku as she introduced herself. You're doing my makeup? Then there is someone who wants to buy me. Makeup is only done when meeting with potential buyers. So putting on makeup meant she was about to have an appointment. This one, unlike the dazzling women I talked to earlier, doesn't want to be here. That's right, she's being sold. It reminded me of my past and my chest ached. Yes, I heard from the receptionist that it's someone who's known you for a while. His name is Joshua. Hearing Minmaku speak without her usual overly feminine tone, I smirked and looked at Meliz. Meliz's eyes widened. Joshua? Really? Joshua. Oh, it's Joshua. Meliz exclaimed, and burst into heartfelt tears. It threw Mamaku into a panic. Oh, dear. It's good that your mood has improved. But won't this just make your poor eyes swell even more? Mamaku went back to big sister mode and rushed frantically to finish her makeup. Even though Mamaku had returned to big sister mode, Meliz didn't seem to care much. She got excited and said, more, more, make me beautiful. Oh, why is my skin so rough? Although Mamaku had already put on plenty of makeup. We heard from Meliz that Joshua was a childhood friend who had promised to marry her when they were little. However, she had despaired of the broken dream since she had been sold. But a man named Joshua had come for her. Ultimately, he came to pick her up to be with him. That's a pretty good story. Being picked up. I'm not averse to that kind of story. Ku had finished her makeup, and when the usher went to call Joshua, only a few seconds passed before the door crashed open and a man appeared. Hey. 
be more gentle when you enter a lady's room. Before I made my retort, Joshua had already embraced Millie's, who returned the hug. Ah, you're messing up the hairstyle that Mamaku so carefully arranged. However, Mamaku and I had already finished our jobs and were back against the wall in standby mode. Some security guards were also waiting in the room. Sorry that we're observing you too, Millie's. How are you? Has anything terrible happened? I'm sorry I'm so late. Your father never told me where you were. Oh, I'm fine, Joshua. I'm just glad you've come. As they whispered sweet nothings to each other, they noticed us on the sidelines, and the time of whispered love was over. Sorry, we disturbed you, Millie's. I wish I could take you away right now. Sorry, I don't have enough money to buy you. I'll definitely get you back so please wait and believe in me. I asked the shopkeeper to reserve you for two weeks. I'm sure I can gather the money by them. Oh, Joshua, I'm so sorry. All the money you've been working to earn. How much do I cost? Aren't you overworking yourself? It's not an impossible amount. I'm overjoyed to do it to get you. So, Millis, don't worry about the amount, and I'm very happy for one reason your price is so high. One reason? Yes, you, you're a virgin. S-H-H, Joshua. That's embarrassing, isn't that obvious? We are as Millie's blushed and seemed about to say something even more embarrassing. Mamaku covered my ears. I guess it's something children shouldn't hear. It seems the couple saw the exchange between Mamaku and me and renewed their embarrassment in the presence of others, because their already bright red faces got even redder. It's okay if you don't say anything. It's hard for two people in love if they're already shy and self-conscious. Joshua, who had been struggling to whisper his love for a while, finally left the room. I felt a bit relieved that the two people, who called each other's names multiple times when they parted, really liked one another. She's lonely apart from Joshua, but Millie's seems far more energetic compared to when we first met her. The makeup was over, the visit was over, and the security was over. But when we packed up our cosmetic gear to leave, the door opened. Did Joshua return? Really? You're not careful enough when entering a lady's room. I didn't actually say that. Looking at the door, I thought, is that a woman in a deep hood? No, it's someone who looks like a boy standing in the doorway. I can't see the whole face, but from the part I can see, below the nose, they seem to have a pretty face. Or rather, I feel like I've seen it before. A fat man appeared beside the mysterious hooded one. He must be the owner of this store. Okay, this woman is currently our featured product. She looks good and because she's a merchant's daughter she can read, write, and calculate. And above all, she's young. And a virgin. The fat man emphasized the virgin bit, giving the hooded man an oily, ingratiating smile. Are you trying to sell Melis? But I'm sure Joshua said. Joshua told me. I heard you promised to give me to the man who was just here. Millis threw the owner a desperate look. Yes, that's definitely what Joshua said. He had reserved her for two weeks. What are you saying? I didn't make any promise with that man. That's just a verbal agreement. Besides, this person is special. You'll be happier if he buys you than that poor man. What? You tricked Joshua. With an unconcerned air. The hooded man approached the enraged Millers and opened his mouth. I actually secretly overheard the conversation with a man just now. I think he's very nice and wonderful. I'm weak to that kind of story. So I thought like this. If I buy you before that man does, what would his face look like? Aren't you interested, too? He had already come close to Millers, as if it were natural. Millers seemed to have lost Tyre in her puzzlement over the mysterious man, and held still. Even though it should have been creepy, his overwhelming power felt irresistible. I'd heard that voice before, somewhere. He put his hand on Millers's shoulder and cast a spell. As the morning light dispels the Uja River's feeble mist, wicker work traps emerge on the banks. When the spell finished, Millers's clothes began to crumble. That spell is one that dispels magic. Millers's clothes, which were fine and sheer, were woven from magically spun thread. They're about to fall off. I heard that spinning wheels are in widespread use, and this was decreasing, but it's not completely gone. Threads spun by magic are held together by magic. 
though I don't understand the principle behind it. When spinning yarn from cotton, magic increases the yield, as I was surprised to learn when working as a maid at rainforest. When the magic is dispelled, the extra material will disappear and the clothes will fall to pieces and become rags. Therefore, the aristocrats of this country have a custom of dressing in wool and silk. Unlike cotton, apparently animal fibers can't be increased by magic, so their clothes can't be destroyed with a single spell. When the hooded man tapped Meles on the shoulder, the impact caused her clothes to fall off. Since Meles's clothes fell off so completely, she was of course naked. But she wasn't ashamed and stared with a pale face back at the hooded man. I think she was surprised to find out that he was a magician. Indeed, disappearing clothes are a spectacular trick for a sexual harasser. This is a rule violation. As I waited for Mamaku and the security guards to stop him, the owner put up his hand and shook his head, as if to say we can't touch this person. Owner, that's power harassment. As I was getting angry, the hooded man spoke. As you can see, only magic can make clothes break down, but unfortunately this one isn't to my taste. I prefer those stronger and more energetic. But I do want to see that guy's face. Taking off his hood, he put his hand to his chin as though he were thinking. It was a terribly beautiful face. Ah, I definitely remember that face. I've seen it so many times, but that face is impossible. Hey, Sir Henry? When I called out to confirm. Sir Henry slowly turned to face us, and when he saw my face, after a little while, he smiled in remembrance. You're the chicky who's friends with Gain. Never thought I'd see you at a place like this. He always has a refreshing smile, he's a magician, but not pretentious, though he's annoying sometimes. The king's younger brother, Henry, didn't seem to be troubled, and brushed his long hair back over his ear. 75. Student Activities 3 there might be twins. After all, Henry went home without buying Millie's, and because he didn't buy her, that fat toner blamed me, and Mamaku and I were kicked out. It seems I shut down one of Mamaku's jobs just by calling out, but Mamaku said, although it's profitable, it wasn't a very pleasant job, and it was really more like a favor to the one who introduced us. If the other party rejects it, I'm rather grateful. That may be true. But I'm still sorry, because I was so surprised that I didn't think things through, because Henry, he was pretentious, but I thought he had the makings of a good person. Ah, I'm depressed. Because my day off is over, I have to go back to school. When I go to school, I'll probably see that bastard Henry. He better not give me an innocent look. He said he wouldn't buy Miller's and went home right away. But I'm not sure, with him. I mean... I'm concerned that Sir Kane seems to be getting on well with that bastard Henry. Does Sir Kane even know? To be honest, I had expected a little help from Henry when I did the signing event, so this shocked me more than I imagined. When I nervously entered the auditorium, Henry wasn't there. Oh, okay. I steadied myself and sat down next to Charlotte as usual to attend the magic history lesson. Anyway, it's worthless to be afraid, or rather it's silly to be so afraid. Hey. Chicky. I looked back at the sound to see Henry with his usual refreshing smile. He'd apparently just arrived, and that bastard walked all the way from the entrance to stand beside me. He had fair blonde hair, amethyst eyes, and a gentle smile. Would you give me some time at lunch today? Is he gonna shut me up? Well, I doubly won't give in. Ah, uh, I don't have anything to say. I just wanted to chat with you a little. Will you come have lunch with me? He said. Though there was an edge of force hiding in his voice. I'm not confident in a verbal promise from that bastard Henry. <laughs> Henry's silent presence is so scary I don't think I can refuse the invitation. His face is smiling, but I don't know what he'd do if I declined. For now, I'll listen to what he has to say. I accept. Then, I'll come pick you up at lunchtime. Oh really, you're picking me up? If it wasn't for yesterday. I might have been excited about being picked up by a handsome guy, uh-huh, and Henry left as suddenly as he had appeared. Refreshing. Even now he's genuinely refreshing. I'm not open-minded enough to say that. Sorry. You? Are you doing something with Prince Henry? Alan, who always sat behind me, said suspiciously. When you say something, there was something, but I can't talk about it. 
If I said it, I don't know what that bastard Henry will do to Alan and me. No, there's nothing between us. But he just invited to lunch. Ah, well, that's true. I had also talked to Henry about getting his signature, maybe that's it. Then I'll go with you. No, that's a little. Ah, the teacher's here. Alan, we have to stop talking. Class is starting. Thanks to the teacher's good timing coming in, I managed to avoid Alan's investigation. I felt a really cranky aura from Alan sitting behind me. Sorry, Alan. Forgive your lying boss. But this is also because I don't want to involve my minion. I managed to evade Alan's questions and finally, during lunch break, that bastard Henry came as promised. I left the auditorium with Henry smartly escorting me. All the ladies looked at me with envious eyes, but it's not enviable at all. I didn't know what kind of development was waiting for me now. So with a cold sweat I checked my weapons through my skirt fabric and did mental simulations so that I could respond in an emergency. Compared to my pale face, Henry looked refreshing as always. What? Could it be possible the person from yesterday was someone else? Because he's so refreshing. Could they possibly be twins? And one of the twins is evil, and the one yesterday was the evil one. Something like that. Seeing how refreshing Sir Henry was, I formed the twin theory. Sir Henry possibly the good twin, led me out of the school building and over to a place with a big waterfall. There was such a waterfall on campus. Thinking about that, I let myself be guided to a cave behind the waterfall. It's kind of exciting, like a secret base. There are no light spirits here, and because of the waterfall, dry wind magic can't be used to amplify voices. It's a good place for a confidential talk. Sir Henry said with a pure smile like a boy introducing his secret base. Ah, they have to be twins. A person who can laugh so innocently couldn't say such a nasty thing as, if I buy you before that man, what would his face look like? I'm sure the royal family has a taboo about twins being born. It's common. I get it, Sir Henry. I understand. They're twins. You don't need to tell me about your twin. Instead, It'd be great if you could just help me with the signature event. Just to get this out there. Don't misunderstand about yesterday. Yeah, I know, you've got a twin. You're identical, right? It's hard being part of the royal family. Just because I like someone, doesn't mean they're special to me. I like cows, pigs, goats, and chickens just as much. Huh? What's this all of a sudden? What are you talking about? Cows and pigs. W.H. What about your twin? I must have had a shocked look on my face. Sir Henry looked at it and chuckled before continuing. Since you happened to be there yesterday, I didn't want you to think I was giving that person special treatment. I like people. Just like I like livestock. Rather, I love them. I just wanted to convey that. No. I don't understand the point he's talking about. What are you saying? Huh? Your twin? What happened to your twin? I... I don't really understand what you mean. Seeing that I didn't understand his meaning, Sir Henry tilted his head to the side. What do you not understand? Ah, I must have been too abrupt. You see, in the past, a female got the wrong idea that I liked her, and got all aroused. I managed to put her off. But it surprised me. I decided to make sure no one misunderstood me in the future. Sir Henry gave a refreshing, ha ha ha, but I still haven't caught up with him. A female aroused. You were attacked by a woman and are now afraid of women. Therefore you don't want to be thought of as a womanizer just because you were in that store? No, I still don't understand. What was that about pigs and cows? If you're not good with women, what's the point of going to that store? Could this person be? Sir Henry, do you think of people who can't use magic as cows, pigs, and chickens? Do you think they're livestock or something? He made a surprised look as if to say, what were you hearing just now? Ha ha, that's not what I was thinking, but actually yeah? He answered with his usual refreshing smile. He called me out a day not to try to silence me over his buying a woman, but so that I couldn't misunderstand her as special, since people are the same as livestock, do some magicians, do the royal family think of everyone who can't use magic as livestock, no, but it's common for a magician to marry someone who can't use magic, nobody would think of their spouse that way, probably, no, 
Am I a dreamer? At least with the magicians I've seen. Irene loved her husband Cardine. Is it only the magicians of the royal family who think like that? Or just that bastard Henry? Magicians and people who can't use magic are both people. There may be some differences in ability, but that's it. Being able or unable to use magic is just a small part of someone's personality. Shoot. I was so disgusted I stuck my neck out without thinking. I had originally meant not to resist no matter what he said. I understand that using magic is not a small advantage, but if you say it like that, even I, who's known for having a calm mind, will get angry. Yeah, the shock may be bigger than I expected. Just now, I was hoping he'd cooperate with the signature event. Henry knit his brows a little, but he seemed to recover his temper at once and the corners of his mouth lifted in a funny way. Do you know the kind of beef and pork we buy in this country? What's this all of a sudden? I know. The cattle are brown cows, called the Kajek breed, that are disease resistant and produce a lot of milk. And pigs are raised to get fat eating anything. I learned about them studying livestock in Ruby Fallen. Yes, you understand. Kajek cattle are by far the most numerous compared to the other breeds of wild cattle. That's why we keep them. Likewise with pigs and chickens, the species we keep thrive in a wider range than the other wild breeds. You understand that we raise cows and pigs, you know that being more delicious and giving more milk results in our raising them, and the flourishing of their species. Therefore they aspire every day to become better food for us. Humans are the same, they can prosper by being more obedient and devoted to magicians. Magicians can make the best use of humans. In that sense, wouldn't you say humans are livestock kept by us magicians? Right, he asked with his usual refreshing smile. Somehow, I started seeing red. You call yourself a farmer. Ultimately you throw up your hands and make things like pioneer villages and let them starve to death. If you're going to call yourself a farmer and us your livestock, why don't you say that after you've taken good care of us? Ha ha ha, you're quite lively. You've hit a sore spot, but weren't they abandoned not because we were negligent, but because our efforts were exhausted? Ho ho, it's fine though. You're interesting after all. I prefer obedient livestock, but it might be nice to tame a horse like this. You have glossy hair and a good complexion. And you're clean and beautiful. You're healthy and strong. I'm so happy it hurts. Will you give me some time on our next day off? I'll take you to my farm. That bastard Henry doesn't seem chastened, he gave me such an excellent proposal, smiling so wide at me, I mean, stop praising me like you're at an animal fair, no way, I'm not going on a farm date with that sleazebag, I'm surprised, you're the first one to decline my invitation, but that's a problem, I really want to go to my farm with you, it would make such a picture, you playing with the pigs and the cows, right, chicky, didn't you have a request for the school? The principal asked me in a roundabout way to cooperate with you. If you go out with me, I'll think about cooperating. A, eh, principal, what are you asking without my permissions? He must have thought, I'll do my best. And moved in the shadows. That's too much. No, thank you. Having said that, I don't even want to breathe the same air as him anymore, so I started walking briskly away. Now, now, don't say that. If you don't come, I might interfere rather than cooperate, right? Th this guy. This damn bastard, don't think I'll forgive you just because your face is so cool. I turned round and stared at the sleazebag. He was looking at me warmly as if to say, better cheer up. The really scary thing about that bastard Henry is that he has nothing like malice. When he talked about humans as livestock, there was no trace of shame. He takes it for granted and doesn't think it's rude. He was smiling purely, refreshingly, the whole time he was talking to me. 76. Student Activities 4, Farm Date Advisory. As soon as he found me, he rushed toward me, shouting, You. Alan, you're sweating a lot. Were you looking for me? Alan, what is it? You looked different from usual somehow, so I came looking for you. I, I didn't follow you. I just got worried halfway through and went out looking. He's sensitive about whether he was following me because I got angry at him for being a stalker before. I'm suspicious about how desperately he's trying to explain, but if he were really following me he wouldn't have lost sight of me. 
because Alan is the best stalker. So I'm sure he really did get worried part way through and come looking for me. Thank you, Alan. When I gave him my sincere thanks, Alan grew suspicious, as I thought. You don't look so good, your complexion is off. Are you okay? I still hadn't recovered from my shock over Henry, so Alan's words of concern made me happy, but Henry's sleazy proposal must have dazzled and clouded my mind. We serve the magicians. Hey, Alan. What do you think of me? Eh, hey, that's so sudden. Alan hurried to speak. Ah, I'm stupid. Since Henry thought that way, maybe other magicians think that way, too. I lost my trust. Alan, I'm sorry. You're my friend. I know you feel the same way. I know because we've been together so long. Rather, it's rude to doubt him. No, I'm sorry. You're my dear friend, Alan. Yes, he doesn't think of me as livestock or anything. Henry is an exception. Maybe this kingdom has a sleazy kingdom inside it, and Henry must be the prince of that place. I shouldn't think of him as the basis for magicians. Alan, I'm sorry I doubted your friendship even a little. I thought, looking at Alan, but he seemed kind of dissatisfied. What's the matter? We are friends, but, it's a little. He's struggling to say something. Oh, I see, Alan and I. That's true, Alan. You and I are more like a boss and henchman relationship. No, that's not. Well, it is. But, in that case, I'd rather be friends. Alan was barking, embarrassed, but he knows who his boss is. This natural henchman constitution. He'd love watching mobster movies. Ah, that's good. I felt a little better talking to Alan. I have to recover my mental fortitude, because soon I have to go on a date to that bastard Henry's farm. On our next day off, Henry brought me to the royal farm. If this were with anyone other than Henry, I would have made a fuss, saying a farm date, awesome. The other day, I raised my voice a little in front of that pervert, but I can't get too wild this time. It wouldn't be good to make enemies of the royal family. I'll just take it easy. Setting Henry aside, the cows and pigs on this farm look very cute, with sparkling, happy eyes. Well, even cows and pigs can be cute. I'm an animal lover, so I know the feeling. But can the farmer who's feeding the animals stop looking at them with such loving eyes? This was vulgar Prince Henry's favorite farm, and he was familiar with the farmer. We were admitted on site to the farm and even allowed to pet the caged animals. It's become a petting zoo. Oh, but the piglets are really cute. In my previous life, I went on a field trip to a farm. The milking experience was very interesting. While I was stroking an adorable piglet, I felt a warm gaze. No, it's good after all. Seeing you playing with the animals, like I said. The vulgar prince was watching me and the piglet. Stop it. Stop putting me in the same box as the animals. Of course piglets are cute. They're cute. But I'm going to keep going. I'm going to stay calm today. Slee. I mean, Sir Henry. You went to the personal referral site the other day. But do you go there often? Oh. If I have the time I'll go check it out. I often come to the farm as well. Hey. Will you stop talking about the farm and the personal referral site as though they're on the same level? Have you ever brought someone there? Yes, isn't that what the store is for? Well, that's true. What do you do with them when you buy them? The people do manual labor. I often use them as servants. I guess I have a habit of collecting things. And when I find something good, I want to put it where I can show it off. Stop, don't tell me your weird habits. But using them as servants is fairly normal, though I don't know what kind of work they're doing. Well, like last time, I'll sometimes buy one if they look interesting, even if they don't fit my hobby. Ah, I wonder if I should have bought her after all. I wanted to see what kind of face that guy who wanted her would make. This vulgar prince has bad taste after all. That's despicable. Didn't you say you loved both humans and animals? Ha ha, that's why I love you. You've got a little mischief in you. Isn't it fun? Pigs become delicious meat, and humans become fun toys. That's division of roles for you, the vulgar prince said, looking between me and the piglet. What division of roles? Stop it. Don't compare me to a pig. I think that's bad taste. Don't go back and buy that woman after all. No, even if I went back there now, I'm sure that male already bought her. That male? Oh, Joshua. 
He said he was going to save up some money and pick her up, but that guy didn't seem to have any money, and didn't seem like he was making much either. His mood felt like he was almost at his breaking point. Henry kept talking, as if noticing that I was thinking about it, because that female was being promoted as a virgin. If I were in that male's position, I would take the female's virginity and leave a scar. Then the next day, I'd casually go to the store, complain to the managers, and buy her at a discount. Isn't that the surest way? Please stop saying such filth with an innocent smile. Do you know the meaning of surest? Also, stop calling them male and female. Really? Quit it. End of block one.